Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, the first day of the first ever Sweden Innovation Days. We meet digitally for obvious reasons, though the solutions to our challenges ahead are not as obvious. We have embarked on a colossal transformation, financially, socially, technically, and not the least, planetary. Our journey ahead is tough, and the stakes are high, but make no mistake, doing nothing is not an option. We are fighting for our survival. The next three days are dedicated to innovation and honest and constructive collaboration. Because the good news is that Sweden is the home to exciting innovation underpinned by a genuine ambition to solve the challenges of our time. Sweden Innovation Days are hosted by AI Sweden, the Swedish Energy Agency, Energimyndigheten, Ignite Sweden, SISP, Swedish Incubators and Science Parks, and Vinova, Sweden's innovation agency. My name is Aurora Belfrag. I'm a technology investor and a senior advisor at AI Sweden, and I have the honor of guiding us through today's agenda. With me, I have the brilliant Peter Kurzweli to join us. Thank you so much, Aurora. And we are so thrilled that we're finally here. This has been an event we've been planning for it's six months now, I think. Uh, and we have three days with a full agenda where we'll, we'll go through everything from startup and corporate collaborationships. We will hear startup pitches. And on Thursday, it's the big matchmaking event. But we will start with the first day, really going and having a deep dive into the Swedish AI ecosystem. And joining us will be some global thought leader speakers as well. So I'm really looking forward to this. And for all the practical information, we have to start with that. Uh, if there's any problem or you have any questions, reach out to us either on Twitter, you'll reach us at AI Sweden, or in the chat during in the hop-in event. So we will be moderating from there. Uh, and just if there's anything, let us know. But otherwise, we hope you will enjoy the program. And the uh, participants can talk to each other, right? Yes, exactly. Good point. Uh, so there's a networking function in Hopin. So please use that. Either you will be randomized to uh, another participant where you can chat about innovation or AI, or you can send them a direct message that you really want to talk to them. So please use the networking function because this is not about us only broadcasting. It's also about you engaging with each other and interacting with each other. And you might be able to ask questions to the speakers. Yes, you will. You will facilitate that, Peter? I will, I will. So I will jump into the broadcast if there's any good questions. So, and I, sure, I, I'm sure there will be. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Because though the challenges we are addressing are grave, you can expect an inspiring, fun-filled, fact-filled day. A smorgasbord of speakers, thinkers and talks. Don't expect long presentations. The aim of today is to give you a flavor of many of the different initiatives and ongoing innovation projects. Six tracks, AI national strategy, AI for industry, transforming healthcare, AI and fighting climate change, tomorrow's mobility, and our future democracy. Before I introduce the first speaker, Sweden's Minister for Business, Industry and Innovation, I'd like to quote Dag Hammarskjöld the brave Swedish diplomat who understood the power of mindset when tackling challenges under extreme pressure. Let us be inspired as we are about to adopt innovation to secure the survival of civilization. Hammarskjöld said, never look down to test the ground before taking your next step. Only she who keeps her eyes fixed on the far horizon will find the right road. So without further ado, welcome Minister Bailan. Please share your thoughts with us today and set the compass for today's conference. Hello, my name is Ibrahim Bailan. I'm uh, the Minister for Business, Industry and Innovation of Sweden. Now Sweden aims to be one of the world's first fossil-free welfare societies. The climate, globalization and digitalization require rapid change. Climate change is laying the foundation for tomorrow's jobs and welfare, and we can only succeed if we do, do it together with our industry. Sweden is one of the world's most innovative countries. Our focus on co-creation between businesses, academia and the public sector makes, makes it possible to find solutions to our societal challenges and increase our competitiveness. The government's innovation partnership programs, not the least digital transformation of industry, are key to this. 
The goal of the Swedish government is to make Sweden a leader in harnessing the opportunities that the use of AI can offer. Our aim is to strengthen Sweden's welfare and competitiveness. Four key conditions are identified. Education and training, research, innovation and use and framework and infrastructure. In this country we are well educated and also technology friendly. We are open to change and new innovations. We encourage long life learning so our for workforce can take the, the new jobs being created. Working together and finding solutions across sectors and across technological fields is a key to success in our country. Now, to keep Sweden's innovation leadership, the strategic bilateral innovation partnerships that we have with India, Germany and France are valuable tools. Thus, it is especially rewarding to see that an important outcome from the innovation partnerships will be launched at the Sweden Innovation Days. The joint AI startup landscape for Sweden, Germany and France. The effort started off within the framework of the Swedish-German Innovation Partnership and has now also connected with the Swedish-French Innovation Partnerships. This is a, a, a great beginning and I think it will add not only to make us stronger in our innovation but also to solve a lot of the challenges we have ahead of us. Have a very nice day and thank you for listening. Thank you, Minister Bailan, for wise words and a clear direction for Sweden in general and for this conference in particular. Because the name of the game is Together. Governments together with industry, together with startups, together with academia. And let's not forget Sweden, together with like minded nations striving to build a fossil free welfare state. The following track, a national strategy, will give you a feel for Sweden's strategy and progress, as well as international inspiration. We will learn from the best. Which is a great segue onto the track's first speaker. She is definitely one of the best. Sweden's Director General of our Innovation Agency, Vinova, Daya Sexon. Many of us follow her work and thinking, and when I lose drive and direction and energy, her words ring in my ear. We are the last generation with a window of opportunity to make a difference. Thank you, Daria, for leading us. And please tell us about transformational innovation. Hello, uh, I'm really honored to be here. And I, I believe that everybody uh, joined us today already have a good sense of why we're here together. Um, but to, to say a few words then, I believe that there's much to learn from the pandemic that we're currently living through. Perhaps the most important lesson is acknowledging that the times we are living now, the challenges we face are global, complex and urgent. It is clear to us all that we have serious vulnerabilities in anything from how we set up global value chains to how we manage resources, not least planetary resources, like food and related to biodiversity. We know we need to transform into something sustainable and we are already in, as we heard, what the climate scientists call the decisive de decade make it or break it decade. This decade is our window of opportunity to set human society on a path that will allow our children to prosper in a society that's better than ours. The alternative is abysmal. Now the Swedish government, as we heard, have said that Sweden will be the fo first fossil free welfare nation in the world. There is a strong commitment to this goal in many of our multinational industries as well as our startup sector. It's driven by an acknowledgement of the fact that being a leader in this massive transformation is what makes an offer to the world viable. Solutions that drive the transformation we so urgently need also represent the biggest opportunities for value creation since the first industrial revolution. Now, luckily, much of the technology we need is available to use, if not yet mature enough to make the impact that we need, nor necessarily applied in a way that provides us with the societal outcomes that we also strive for. But that's why we need applied research and innovation with a shared directionality towards solving societal challenges. We need to work towards common missions. Now, take the development and application of AI, for instance. 
It clearly drives and enables so much of the information innovation ahead of us, be it optimizing batteries or whole energy grids and mobility systems, or enabling early detection and innovations in advanced therapies that will save people from cancer or the next pandemic. Or let's say just enabling people to more effectively match with the right opportunities to learn and to make use of their talents in a global work market. To many of you listening today, I believe that you may see, see that Sweden is a small country. With only 10 million people, we may see as but a city from a global context. But we do have a proven track record of being an international innovation leader. We have multinational leaders in connectivity, cybersecurity, as well as a wide range of sectors, ranging from transport and life science to fintech and creative industries. We have a world-class startup ecosystem and strong research environments in all parts of our country. More importantly, we have the ability to work together in environments fueled by trust and appreciation of the strength that comes with multidisciplinarity and diversity in concrete co-creation. These are strengths that we apply within the field of AI as well. We understand that we must build general capability broadly and secure excellent research at the same time. And we will do so by working according to principle of making local strength be national resources for international impact and co-creation, or as the awesome people at AI Sweden put it, invest together, share with all. For instance, through building common capabilities, such as data factory capabilities and infrastructure across traditional industries and sectors. We will build knowledge broadly in society, among leaders and within academia, but we also offer a global talent pool access to our entire ecosystem, which you will see here today. We will keep investing in joint projects. I'm already quite proud of the portfolio in the Swedish ecosystem, not least AI Sweden, but we need to keep investing together in areas where many can benefit. For instance, reusable models for decentralized AI, but with a strong focus on real user needs. And we need to be even more ambitious. In the Prime Minister's Innovation Council, as well as the national innovation programs mentioned by our minister now, private and public leaders now are working on common prioritizations, exploring how we can take the next step, addressing joint missions. That could be about transforming industrial value chains related to or related to goals in health and well-being. So, I believe that these two days will hear plenty of the opportunities for industries, startups, academia, and public sectors in innovating together. You will see represented the strength in the Swedish ecosystem. From a Vinova perspective, there's been remarkable progress in the last few years. We will celebrate what has already been achieved, but we will focus on finding new opportunities ahead with a global community represented with us here today. And we will remain humble and acknowledge that we have much to learn from others. We will look forward to the program today, I do believe, knowing that we will keep building these capabilities together. So I would like to summarize by saying this is only the beginning. I hope we'll look back on these two days within a year or two, saying that these two days took place in a strange, strange year of individual, organizational and global change in a crisis that was in many ways also an opportunity. An opportunity that we in hindsight see that we grasped, made the best of, Invest, invested wisely together. So I would like to summarize by saying thank you so much for being here, exploring these opportunities together with us today. Thank you, Daria. Well, you set the ambition level high with an undertone of humble, but also tangible and concrete with the stuff that we need to do. And I think the baton goes uh, on to rise to give us further insights into the AI strategy of Sweden. Daniel Lilblad is here to join us. You are the co-director of AI Sweden as well as the director of AI research at Rise. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, and thank you, Adaria, for a great introduction to the Swedish landscape at the moment. So, as a co-director of AI Sweden and driving uh, AI research at RISE, of course, we need to look at a strategic agenda for applying AI in Sweden. So, let's talk a little bit about how that might look in the next five to ten years. Well, First of all, AI Sweden has a mission to really accelerate the use of AI in all of society, connecting research to applications to actual real use in systems, in healthcare, in industry. So we really need to get the results out there. And this really aligns with the message from the government for the direction of AI in Sweden. We should be the best at utilizing AI in all sectors of society, basically. So if we take that as a starting point, what do we need to develop together? Well, 
If you look at the Swedish AI landscape today and how it's been developing the last few years, we really do come from a bit of a fragmented background. We have had lots of competence, but it's been spread out in, let's say, smaller groups and smaller islands that are now starting to come together. One of the really critical things that happened in Sweden in the last few years is really what Sara Masur will be talking about later today, about the huge effort of bringing in excellent AI basic research and education on a PhD and master's level. And this will be absolutely crucial for us to deliver AI into society. So we come from a little bit of a fragmented background. A lot of the efforts so far have been rather bottom up. It has started at companies, it has started at different government agencies and so on. And perhaps harnessing all the good work out there, but with the potential to sometimes lose results in sharing and developing them further. So from AI Sweden, what do we see when we look at the Swedish AI landscape today? Well, first of all, we see that we need even stronger capabilities in applying AI. We need more people that can take on this challenge. Second, we don't really see that there is one single entity that can take care of all of this for Sweden. So thirdly, how do we see this going forward? Well, basically, we need for applied AI and innovation and to getting things out there, we need to focus on really concrete areas and arenas for collaboration. This will also help us in vision, in leadership and bringing results together so that we can keep on building on each other's results. So we are working with two different types of arenas right now in our strategy. First of all, we have strategic areas for Sweden, which are supposedly important for applying AI at a broad scale in Sweden. Addressing other blockers are really opportunities for all of Sweden. Not only should they address these things, but they should also provide a really broad area of collaboration, an opportunity to collaborate with lots of different actors. Finally, in the best of worlds, these areas should also somewhat contribute to, let's call it Swedish AI sovereignty, a way for Sweden to stand on its own internationally for critical areas. So let me give you two examples. The first one is focused on the AI in ecosystem in Sweden, and that is developing models for the Swedish language. Everyone needs it, not everyone needs to do it again and again. The second example is what Daria already mentioned. We can be world leaders with telecommunications background, industry background in Sweden, on decentralized AI, moving things out to the edge, out to devices, and building new types of services. And finally, the final part of our collaboration efforts is what we typically call major impact initiatives. These address the bigger societal issues, like AI for climate and reducing carbon dioxide emissions, or building the next generation healthcare system. We already see that so many actors in Sweden are willing to step up and build and contribute to these systems. So, in summary, areas for collaboration, arenas for collaboration, and bringing people and actors together on common projects in a common strategy. Thank, Thank you. you, Daniel. I heard collaboration, yes. national sovereignty, more people. Yes. We're on our way and the, the goal is set. Yes, we're getting there. Thank you. I look forward to hearing more about that in the panel uh, following. Thank you. And our next speaker preaches act beyond borders, think extreme and fast track deployment. And one of the silver linings of COVID-19 is the dissolvement of boundaries and borders as we're able to online share wisdoms and inspirations from around the world. So it's with a great honor th to introduce Professor Hiroaki Kitano, the CEO of Sony Computer Science Laboratories. He's joining us from Japan to talk to us about Japan's moonshots and how far they've come.
Please, floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, good afternoon, I guess. And uh, so this side, it's almost uh, midnight in Japan. Uh, you know, I'm very pleased to be uh, on the uh, this panel on the national strategy uh, for the uh, uh, Sweden AI meeting. And I'm in charge of the uh, Japanese AI strategy as well as the Moonshot program, which is very uh, interesting, uh, a new kind of uh, trial for the Japanese uh, government funding program. Uh, let me start with the Japanese uh, AI strategy, which I uh, uh, getting involved uh, in the uh, overall design. Uh, in an AI strategy for Japan, we have uh, four major pillars. You know, the first part, which I think is very important, is the human resource. How we're going to get like a more AI researchers, people who's uh, knowledgeable in AI, and how we're going to do the educations, AI, information science, and the mathematics, uh, or the broader in the STEM education as well. So we set the goal of creating a quarter million students, you know, for the uh, AI who's, who's AI competent, or be like a, a AI oriented researchers and engineers. So what we are uh, doing at this moment is the uh, really reshuffling, the uh, redesigning the whole course from the uh, uh, you know the junior high school, high school, undergrad, and the graduate school educations. And particularly, we are uh, having like a really big uh, change in the uh, you know college education as well as the high school education, which is uh, really the key. So we have like a quite substantial, strong math information science program and uh, data science and AI program as well. So this will be implemented uh, next year and in, uh, over the next uh, two, three years as well. So that will really change the, our educational scenery uh, in Japan. So this is really the big push. And then we're going to have like a, a model course. We're going to have like a new kind of uh, new way to have like a course sharing and then all the degree program and things like that. So like, uh, you know, we're working on detail as well uh, at this moment, but we have like a really, uh, you know, dramatic change in uh, Japanese education uh, thing as well. And second, we have like a stronger R&D program. And to support that, uh, we're going, we have like a set up a really uh, big computing system. Uh, one is the ABCI, which is the uh, GPGPU cluster at the uh, ICE, which is a uh, Sansok and uh, under the MEDI, but the other industrial research uh, center. And the other one is Fugaku, uh, which is like uh, top notch uh, high performance computing. I think uh, uh, today we got a news that uh, Fugaku is number one uh, supercomputing system in the world for uh, you know four different categories. And then uh, you know we will continue to uh, you know uh, reinforce the capability of the Fugaku. And uh, Hugaku is very interesting. It's not only for the AI, but it's going to be really strong in numerical computing as well. And uh, you know, one of the best use of Hugaku in decent day is to try to uh, simulate the uh, aerosol and droplet uh, dispersion in the COVID-19. So I'm also in, uh, in charge of the uh, government program for the AI simulation uh, fight against the COVID-19, where we're going to use extensive uh, HPC data science and AI to fight against the uh, coronavirus. Okay. Now, the third section is the industry applications. Like, uh, we actually going for the older uh, industry, try to see how the uh, industry application can be done, and also we're focusing on international uh, collaboration as well. Now, so that's like a, a big chunk of the AI program, and we started the AI R&D Network uh, Japan, our AI, uh, AI Japan, which you have a website, just like uh, you have like a Sweden AI, and uh, we have a consortia of the uh, national uh, research centers and all the universities, and uh, uh, we're adding a uh, private sector as well. So I uh, try to coordinate efforts and who's doing what, and then uh, you know, help each other in a Japanese, uh, you know, AI scenery. And uh, let me uh, move to the moonshot, which is not necessarily a part of the uh, AI uh, strategy, but it's uh, seriously interlinked. And also, uh, I'm in uh, sub charge in designing the moonshot program. Okay, if you look at the uh, research, we have like uh, you know. Basic research, which is more the curiosity driven. The other end is the moonshot, which you have like a set of all the uh, you know audacious goal and a big goal like a grand challenge, and uh, make effort to actually achieve that and uh, technology develop uh, uh, in a way to achieve that goal. Uh, going to uh, spread into the uh, uh, industry wise, and then also the technology can be applied for the basic research, uh, which you feel in the future. And uh, after uh, quite extensive discussion. That we come up with like uh, three major fields in the moonshot, which is the uh, very serious problem in Japan, the aging society. How we're going to resolve 
uh, the aging society and overcome the, uh, you know, better quality of life and then a further uh, economic growth. And second one is the uh, environmental sustainability issues. How are we going to uh, control the climate issues? How are we going to uh, reduce the resource demand? How are we going to resolve the waste problem or the plastic problem or that? Uh, that's a big sector. We have like, a, we choose like a few uh, specific goals to achieve that. And third, sector is more the science, like more biomedical science and quantum computing and all that. And one of the, uh, you know, it's a, it's a broad one, and we have like a quite number of programs about study. I like to focus on the one thing, which is uh, very interesting. One of the flagship projects among the moonshot uh, turned out to be uh, Avatar, uh, Cybernetic Avatar uh, Challenge, which is the, to create the uh, Avatar system, which uh, is, uh, could be a robotics and a telepresence and in uh, interfacing with the uh, biological interface as well, like a brain machine interface as well, and uh, to be able to free us from the uh, constraints of location, physical capability, and the perception, and then uh, enable you to work at anywhere you want, and uh, a single individual may be able to control the hundreds of avatars, so you can actually have like a exercise the uh, a quite substantial complex uh, work uh, by yourself and the other side of the planet as well. So we have uh, chosen uh, three uh, researchers to be the uh, lead for the Abada program. One of them is the uh, uh, Professor Ishiguro at Osaka University. He's very famous on the uh, creating a robotic system, Minik himself. Uh, you know, and uh, we have a lot of interesting uh, program going on. So the like, uh, challenge of this uh, cybernetic Abada challenge is to enable you to have your proxy anywhere and with that delay, so we need 5G, we need to work on the uh, NEC system and Ericsson system and all that. Uh, that's where uh, we can collaborate as well. Like uh, we need a really fast network and then to be able to communicate. And we have like a really uh, good uh, mechanical engineering and robotic system and a material science as well. And a sensor systems and an artificial intelligence, obviously to be able to understand and then the coordinates. So like it's necessarily remote control, but like avatar itself will be able to interact with the human and they interact with the other avatars and interact with the avatar and the human in a large scale. And we have been doing like a, you know, telepresence in a small number, like one person controlling another, uh, you know, avatar in the other part. But what we're talking about is like a many against many, it's like a, a num hundreds of people or more are controlling the avatar, the other side, for example, uh, anywhere. And then uh, avatar is, uh, you know, ab you know, the collaboration in between avatar and in between avatar and the humans in a different mode. You might actually have the mouse and joystick. You might have like a, you know, just the brain machine interface that you need. And then some of them have a higher level of autonomy, like a really fully autonomous uh, AI, or we have like a, you know, a remote control. You just be the uh, proxy to yourself. So like uh, all the spectrum of that. So like, uh, you know, the goal is by 2050, we're gonna have, we, we really flee from the location free from the uh, physical capability, so even the handicapped person will be able to do whatever they want. And of course, like uh, there are maybe uh, some scientific or uh, uh, physiological limitations, but uh, we will try to overcome. And then uh, you might want to have like uh, uh, something you do it in Sweden for like a uh, teaching course in Sweden, uh, you know, one hour, and then switch back to like uh, Hawaii, and then uh, do other thing in Hawaii, and then go to like uh, Japan. As so not only the video conference, but you do the physical thing as well. And then that's what we're trying to achieve there. So like uh, combined with like a Japanese AI strategy and the moonshot strategy, uh, we're looking into really audacious uh, grand challenge, and I hope like uh, we're gonna be successful. And then of course like uh, you know there are other uh, grand challenges as well. Like uh, one of the thing which I met is uh, trying to come up with like an AI system to. Uh, uh, have like a major scientific discovery, for example, like a winner of a prize, for example, and so uh, that'd be another uh, grand challenge uh, which we are working on uh, at this moment, which is outside the moon, uh, moonshot challenge, but like uh, uh, that's a growing interest as well. So like uh, we're doing a lot of uh, uh, research uh, on the moonshot, and that's really uh, now we're getting into more systematic phase uh, to be able to push that. I think like uh, uh, that would be the uh, you know first uh, summary of uh, what's going on in Japan. And then uh, also like uh, we are uh, putting a more, lot of computing power and AI to fight against the COVID and uh, I'm in charge of that program as well. Thank you very much. Much fascinating. Clearly, the minutes we gave you were not enough, but luckily we have the panel to discuss some of this uh, in further depth because these moonshots are important for uh, survival of the planet. Thank you. And from one AI superpower to the other, let's hear it from Canada because the Director General of Innovation, Science and Economic Development is here to join us. Um, 
Jed, uh, Jordan Z, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much and good afternoon, colleagues and friends uh, from around the world. It's a great pleasure to join you. Um, I've been working in this job for the last three years and with every year that's passed, increasingly uh, the focus has turned to transformative technologies and what governments can do in collaboration with others inside and outside of government, really in a multi-stakeholder manner to advance um, a culture of innovation and, and hopefully leverage the uh, and unlock the incredible opportunities and potential that AI offers while at the same time mitigating some of those risks. We're in a very interesting and exciting period. Um, and I can share a little bit about the Canadian experience, how ultimately um, the approach was, was started um, with respect to AI and where we've come over the last several years. One thing I should share though, before diving into it, and I know our, our time is short, um, is that when we speak about this, uh, there are two elements that I think underpin so much of our work in this space, um, both with respect to the government in its role as a convener and um, you know, in, in how we engage our partners um, outside of, of government. That is, um, whatever we do really is anchored in a sense of maintaining and growing public trust. So that really is a foundational element. And then the second piece is that whatever we're doing that the fruits of our labor, that the, that the opportunities are uh, shared as broadly as possible. So that really the lens through which we're conducting our work is one of inclusion. And so my minister, Minister Navdeep Baines, um, anchors much of um, our work and our focus and our objective in, in those uh, two ways. In Canada, it was quite interesting because um, we started really um, in the space of research um, in 2017, and we announced the creation of our Pan-Canadian Artificial Intelligence Strategy, supported over nine years by $125 million of investment. And what I will say is it was interesting because its primary aim was to uh, attract talent in, in Canada in, in three particular institutes. So in the Canadian system, in Toronto and Montreal, and in Edmonton, and to really focus on key areas of research. And, and uh, machine learning is well, one element that I think those research centers have become quite well known for, deep learning and reinforcement learning as well. And we've partnered through the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research to um, establish these hubs in different parts of Canada to um, build this national program of research chair positions in artificial intelligence uh, with the objective of attracting and retaining world leading experts to three national institutes as I've indicated. So I think one of the key things that really was helpful in the Canadian context was a sense of certainty and a longer term, uh, longer a time horizon for funding. Uh, so that it wasn't just a sense of one, two, or even three years, but rather a longer period in which um, those chairs could really begin to develop depth and expertise and really a school that allowed them to grow um, their research in their respective fields. Building on that, um, we have also, I think, another key pillar to, to, to reflect upon in the Canadian context is recently established our AI um, Council of Advisors. And that really has um, helped shape and guide um, our own policy direction over the last couple of years. In particular, we've tried to draw on expertise both uh, from um, startups to um, those much more established institutes and everything in between civil society, uh, philosophers, it really is a multi-stakeholder table that allows us in many ways to see the collision of ideas and perspectives um, and try to navigate the space, especially around the responsible use and development of AI in, in a thoughtful way, and then bring those ideas back in a consistent way uh, to the government of Canada, to the minister that I serve, but also to the government writ large so that we're doing it in a way that is as informed as possible by what's happening on the ground, the most recent research. Um, and and that, that's worked quite effectively. It's been a, a flexible tool. And then perhaps the last piece that I'll focus on 
um, is the recent establishment of what we've called the Global Partnership on Artificial Intelligence. What we've aimed to do in the creation of that um, is essentially um, draw together uh, global expertise in five areas. So the five areas that, that were prioritized include responsible ethical AI, um, AI and pandemic response, data governance, um, uh, uh, innovation commercialization, and uh, finally, the future of work. And so far, 15 countries have joined this international initiative. The first uh, uh, plenary will take place just in a couple of weeks at the beginning of December. I've listened very closely to um, the remarks at the outset of today. I'm very excited about the prospect to potentially of, of collaborating with Sweden and other partners to um, really build best practices that can be then shared with a broader international audience to help inform and guide and shape our thinking as an international community uh, going forward. So we're very excited about this project and hopefully there'll be opportunities to share more about the fruits of the labor of those five tables as they meet uh, this coming uh, December. So perhaps I'll leave it there, but very much look forward to our discussion um, and answering any questions you might have. Thanks very much. Thank you, Jordan. And yes, we look forward to your comments and the panel following uh, this. But our la last speaker for today for this track um, underpins the need for the fundaments of, of success, because it's all well and good to talk about an AI strategy and declare it, but you need the important building blocks for it to work. And WASP is a national initiative uh, to, strategically, to support strategically motivated basic research, uh, recruitment and education, and recruitment for faculty. Um, and it's uh, become one of the key pillar stones of the Swedish strategy. And it's an honor for me to introduce uh, Sarah Masur, one of the dedicated heavyweights within AI in Sweden, as well as the director for strategic research, as well as the chair of WASP. Sarah, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much for the very nice introduction. Um, it's a pleasure for me to be uh, here at this fine conference today to talk about uh, the Wallenberg Foundation and our strategic initiative and how that fits into the national uh, strategy in AI for Sweden. So uh, our journey with the Wallenberg Foundation actually started six years ago, late 2014, when we started to think about how can we in, could we invest in research that would be for the benefit of Sweden and for Swedish industry. And the reason that we wanted to do this was because uh, we thought it was extremely important to have a long term competence build up for Sweden in areas that were very important for Swedish industry. We also wanted to bring our different universities together to build a strong international competitive research environment that would make it possible for us to attract world leading competence in these essential areas. And we wanted to do this together with Swedish industry in a joint force with them. And that was then the beginning of the VASP program that was started in 2015. The VASP program uh, today has a budget of 5.5 billion Swedish crowns, and it's by far the largest uh, individual research program in Sweden ever. And it stands for the Wallenberg AI Autonomous Systems and Software Program. It is uh, out of those 5.5 billion Swedish crowns, uh, over 4 billion comes from the Wallenberg Foundations. And why we're doing this is because we want to conduct excellent research and competence build up in AI, autonomous systems and software for the benefit of Swedish industry. And we are doing it by building a world leading platform that will interact with leading Swedish companies in Sweden to develop knowledge and competence for the future. So what we're doing in more concrete terms is that we're running a national research program with the best researchers that we have in the field in Sweden. We're also doing massive recruitment campaigns where we do international recruitments of both uh, young and leading researchers. We, will, uh, we are aiming at building 80 to 100 new research groups in Sweden. And out of those, we already have 37 in place. And I, can also, I would also like to mention that out of those, 
we have managed to recruit nine top-level world-leading AI researchers to Sweden. We are running a graduate school in close interaction with Swedish industry, where we will have at least 600 PhD students uh, until 2030. And out of those, at least 100 should be industrial PhDs. And currently we have 300 PhD students in the graduate school. And we are running arenas together with Swedish industry, where we demonstrate technology and oh, where industry contributes state-of-the-art technology and opens up for our academic researchers to do research on that. Today we have four, uh, 40 uh, Swedish companies as, as partners in the VAS program, and we're also working with international corporations uh, together with Stanford, Berkeley and NTU in Singapore. So after the VAST program was started, uh, since then we have also started a number of other initiatives that connects to the VAST program. And one is the VAST HS program, and HS here stands for Humanities and Society. Here we are investing in research in humanities and social sciences in relation to the introduction of autonomous systems and AI. So key areas for this program are ethics, economic consequences, legal aspects, social consequences of introducing autonomous systems and AI, including uh, impact on the labor market, and also improved information systems. This program was started in 2019, and in this year, 2020, we have launched our new program on data-driven life science that brings together our investment in VASP in AI together with our investment in life science. And this is a new program uh, with a budget of 3.5 billion Swedish crowns that will also run for uh, 10 years ahead in time. With all of these huge investments in research, it's also very important for us to uh, ensure that we capture the innovation that comes out of our basic research investments. So therefore, we have started something that we call the Wallen by Launchpad, uh, and the Wallen by Launchpad, VALP, is a program where, we, where researchers can apply for funding for taking the research from just ideas into proof of concepts or research validation. And that is then also something that we support from the Wallen by Foundation. And finally, to make the most out of all of these investments that we're doing in research, we realized that we also have to invest in computational infrastructure. So therefore, we have invested 70 million uh, Swedish crowns in uh, the SNIC infrastructure for the Swedish universities. And on top of that, we have recently donated 300 million Swedish crowns to Linköping University and the National Supercomputer Center to build Sweden's fastest supercomputer supercomputer for machine learning and AI. And uh, it's called Berzelius. It will be uh, started in the beginning of next year. And it's a supercomputer based on 60 NVIDIA DGX A100 servers. And it's by far uh, the most powerful uh, supercomputer in Sweden with a capacity of over 300 petaflops. And it's then uh, to be used for AI. So to summarize, uh, we from the Wallenberg Foundation, we invest uh, around 10 billion Swedish crowns in strategic research programs in the areas of AI and digitalization technologies. All of these programs are long-term programs, which means that they run for uh, 10 to 15 years, and they will continue until 2030. We started in 2015 with the VASP program, but that was the beginning. Since then, we have launched the VASP AGES program and also our program on data-driven life science. And what we do is that we support excellent research at Swedish universities, but we also run extensive graduate schools where we will have almost 1,000 PhD students. And we have started the Wallenberg Launchpad to support innovation that comes out of our research. And finally, we have also invested in computational infrastructure for AI uh, with 70 plus 300 million Swedish grants. So that is how our part and our strategic research investments fit into the Swedish uh, national agenda. Thank you.
Thank you, Sarah. Uh, both very impressive and very important for Sweden. And now let's move to a panel discussion, uh, which we've broadly named why AI strategies matter. Because there is a reason why we're discussing national AI strategies. Beyond the headlines, we see a clear undercurrent of competition versus collaboration. It's fair to say that many nations aspire to be the world leading AI something or another. But to mirror Minister Bailan's opening remarks, the real challenges are global and ours to solve together. So I thought we would take a few minutes together as a panel to discuss why and where a national uh, AI strategy matters. And as always, it's good to start with an introspection. Daria, I look at you. Why is it important to have an AI strategy? Well, I mean, I would say that the short answer is that the things we need will not just happen by themselves. Um, I'd like to just acknowledge that it's clear that the Wallenberg Foundation has been key for investments in research and securing strategic knowledge and creating op important opportunities for talented researchers from all over the world through the WASP effort, as well as providing crucial infrastructure. Now, as a country, we need to increase our investments uh, in applied research and innovation in AI, as well as other technologies and capabilities related to digitalization. And we, I do believe we have a great opportunity for that in the upcoming research and innovation bill this year, as well as in investment prioritizations uh, made uh, in following the pandemic. Now, in order to build the capabilities, the strengths that we need, uh, we need to work together. We need to excel at synergies and cross-sector collaboration. So I think that we're in a good position to do so right now. There have been excellent opportunities provided by the WASP building our fun foundation. Uh, we're seeing great progress in the AI Sweden effort. Um, and I also know that actors, uh, both public and private, are finding common prioritizations right now on what we uh, need to do further. In order to secure the infrastructure, we need computational power, uh, opportunities for all the talent that comes out of the WASP effort, and more importantly, really enabling uh, the cross-industry uh, collaborations that can really make a difference. So. Well, strategies are needed to create directionality, common goals, and pulling towards uh, them together. And I think that's what we're doing right now. Can I take it from your perspective? You clearly wear the, the hat of Swedish industry. Um, what's your take on goals in a clear direction that Daya was mentioning, but at the same time, the, the challenge between collaboration versus competition in order to achieve uh, our goals? Sarah? Oh, sorry. Uh, well, I didn't hear that the question was for me. Yes. Sarah, it's for uh, you. First of all, yes, first of all, I would like to say that uh, AI is one of the most important transformative technologies, both for industry and for society. So it's crucial for Sweden to stay in the forefront to ensure that we have a competitive industry and also that we have an efficient public sector. Uh, when it comes to competition versus cooperation, uh, for me, it is important that we cooperate within Sweden uh, because we are a small uh, country. We, don't, we only have 10 million inhabitants in Sweden, but we have world leading industries. We have a well developed public sector. If we can join forces and cooperate and do our best together, that is how we can be competitive on the world uh, scene. So to me, competition is uh, not competition within Sweden. In Sweden, it's cooperation, but it's to make Sweden competitive on the world market. So let's talk to the world market. Canada, Jordan, what's your take on this from your perspective? You've also built national AI strategies. Um, what, have, what are your learnings? You were mentioning building a, a longer time horizon, which I assume allows people to take risk and, uh, and have a bit of uh, patience and stamina when building an AI strategy. What's your take? Yes, absolutely. I agree very much with what my colleagues have said on the panel. A couple of points that I would add to this. So really, I mean, it goes without saying that there's incredible economic opportunity to be gained. So that really can help drive the development and establishment of important AI strategies. But as was alluded to at the outset, I thought very eloquently, um, the social benefits could be very significant as well think about how we together could solve the biggest challenges of our time, including climate change, 
how we move about in our communities more effectively, more smoothly, how we address the biggest health challenges of our time, including uh, the, the, the pandemic in, in, in helping us diagnose and respond and treat. And so I think in many ways, governments can seize the opportunity to shape and, and direct some of the, 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 the power that they have to convene to, um, uh, towards some of these um, huge uh, problems that we face collectively. And of course, these are collective challenges. They're not Canadian challenges or Swedish challenges or Japanese challenges alone. They're challenges we face collectively. When I was at a G20 uh, meeting last year, I remember one of my Japanese colleagues saying, you know, in, in many respects, um, there, are, there are twin challenges of our time. One, um, uh, navigating and responding as effectively as we can to the challenge of climate change. And two, navigating this digital economy in which we find ourselves as responsibly and thoughtfully as possible. And so I think in many respects, coming together in these kinds of form can help us uh, understand where are the guardrails? Where are the opportunities? How can we iterate effectively and innovate uh, in a way that, um, that, that uh, spurs a sense of forward motion, but also at the same time potentially responds to some of the, the collective uh, challenges that we're facing. So definitely uh, significant economic drivers, but social ones as well. Jordan, we're going to speak later today about climate change specifically, but also uh, the risk to democracy. But just uh, uh, on the back of what you've said, do we have the right institutions to go from talk? Because it's easy for us to hear, say, bombastically, together and collaborate. It's all uh, nice words. But how do, we, how do we do that in practice? The council you were mentioning, is that functioning well? Do you see positively on, on that type of collaboration? So the short and I think honest answer to your question is no, we don't have the governance yet in place or the institutions. I think part of the reason these kinds of discussions are so important is to try to navigate what are the elements that we need to put in place so that we can connect across governments, across um, um, uh, stakeholders in different places so that we are more effective. The global partnership on AI that I referenced when I spoke a few moments ago is one example in which we are seeking to make those connections very concretely. And I think the important element that I would raise in that context is that it really is about trying things in an applied way. So applied AI projects, iterating, experimenting in a safe space so that we can learn from those projects, learn from those initiatives and bring it back to a broader audience and share those lessons learned. I think um, one of the challenges in governments is a reticence uh, to, to um, uh, proceed toward projects of higher risk. So how do we build in those spaces of, of, of greater risk tolerance so that we can actually learn from those experiences and then uh, uh, bring them back as effectively as possible. So we're we're not there yet, but I think some very good ideas emerging in an increasingly complex AI ecosystem. So navigating that ecosystem and trying to piece it together, I think is our opportunity collectively. Because if we look at risk, just as you say, uh, um, Professor Kitano, you were talking about the moonshots initiatives that, that Japan has set. Obviously, there's a huge amount of risk connected to those. And those moonshot initiatives aren't nice to haves. We need to succeed with the moonshot initiatives that you've initiated. How do you guys talk about risks uh, and the bottlenecks that you've seen in learnings? Well, I mean, uh, risk in you know, several aspects. One is like uh, we are exposed to the uh, risk already on the Japanese society for the aging society that we're already facing the uh, uh, shortage of labor force. And then uh, because of that, we're going to have like a, a lot of, uh, you know, of, uh, you know, um, manufacturing and the service industry are suffering at uh, this moment. And now we are dependent on foreign laborers at this moment. At the same time, because of the COVID, like a border is shut down. So we are having a really serious problem uh, with that. Uh, uh, so, like, uh, you know, there's a risk in the uh, ongoing structure, structural change in the society, and uh, you know, also the climate change as well. And then our moonshot is actually uh, challenging 
to uh, abbreviate the risk or like, uh, you know, uh, getting that new opportunity, uh, taking advantage of the risk. So like, uh, uh, you know, because of labor shortage in Japan, we don't have any problem about like uh, against like uh, automation, against AI, because like uh, there's a uh, consensus in, uh, in Japanese society that we need AI, we need robotics, because like uh, otherwise we have a serious labor shortage, you know, you know things like that. So like uh, that, that's one thing. Uh, the other thing is the interesting. The moonshot is a risky program in a way because we set a you know big goal and then, uh, how we're gonna actually uh, concentrate the effort and according to effort is a new challenge. You know, it's not like a, a conventional. Basic research and curiosity driven or focus driven like conventional research. I mean, it's more like a you know, goals oriented, a large scale problem. And frankly speaking, uh, we organized like a few moonshot goal. And when you implement that, this, this is a lesson everyone should learn, you know, uh, implement that. Uh, that was actually transferred to JSD, the funding agency, and not all the funding agency manager really understand the speed of the moonshot. Mm -hmm. And I was involved in the moonshot goal number one, and so I found the other challenge, so we actually steer uh, that sector of the challenge in the uh, really the moonshot way. But the other sector, like a minute ago, they just took it like a big, you know, a big budget regular science program. So like, uh, I think they will come up with the interesting results. They choose a good scientist and an uh, important area, but it's not designed as a moonshot at all at this moment. So like, uh, you know, you know, all other sector is like a simply like a big, you know, well-financed government, pro, you know, basic research project rather than a moonshot. So it's, uh, you know, if you come up with like a new kind of a research program, it's very important to be consistent, important the uh, split of the design and the funding program to be kept, and then uh, partly successful, partly failing already. So uh, I think you need to like, uh, this is like a lesson, how you, uh, you know, design the uh, high risk program like a moonshot, because you have to be consistent, you have to have like a very strong leadership, and then a funding agency and a government agency have to respect the leadership and then the split of the original design of the program. Well said, thank you. And finally, Daniel, um, taking all this into account, how do we measure success? How do we know if we've succeeded or not? How do we know that we've hit the milestones along the way? Or is that irrelevant? Is it just important to set a direction? I think it's most important to set a direction, absolutely. And I think we need to talk about speed and acceleration because the sooner we can get these things in real use, the sooner we will reap the benefits, basically. So let's move forwards quickly. So measuring success, well, in a very general t sense, of course, it's uh, on the level of uh, how much carbon dioxide are we emitting, how, much, how efficient are our transportation systems and so on. But those are very difficult things to measure. I think that we need to look at the general competence base. How many people are talking about AI? How many people are using AI and leveraging AI continuously in their work, in new products, in new services, all along? And to do that, a national strategy would absolutely be of benefit to really work together and build on each other's results. Thank you, Daniel. And today we've talked about the big picture and the broad uh, strategies and, um, and goals that we need to achieve to solve the big problems of our time. And I think it's always worth looking at the corner of the patchwork somewhere else to find a bit of energy and goosebumps. And I'm glad to say that we have a bit of a coincidence here at the Sweden Innovation Days, because we have two speakers that knew each other and haven't spoken for decades until they saw the program. Jordan and Amy, tell us, how did you guys meet in this circus of AI? Yeah, well, maybe I could start first. I want to say hi, Jordan. It's been a long time, 23 years or so since we've seen each other. Um, and uh, we went to high school together and uh, we were in the same class. And I think after high school, uh, we all we each went our separate ways. Uh, and I ended up in Sweden, of all places. And uh, we lost, uh, lost track. Uh, and then I saw that there was your name on the program for Sweden Innovation Days. And I thought, is this, is this Jordan? And it was just absolutely uh, you know, so unlikely that, uh, that our paths would cross in this way. Uh, it's really nice to see you. It's wonderful to see you in this context. I think it just reinforces, you know, what a what a small global community in which we find ourselves. I hope that we'll get a chance to, you know, work together on this and also see each other through this work. Um, it's pretty exciting um, stuff. 
to, to, to see people in different parts of the world um, collaborating in this space now. And uh, Amy, just wonderful to see you. And what a great um, additional surprise and uh, 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 opportunity to kind of connect through this whole platform. Because as we said, we need each other. It's all about relationships and networks and the personal glue uh, to make AI happen to solve our big problems. And the five of you, or the six of you, uh, now have proof that you know each other and we will be able to collaborate in the future. And we will keep tabs. Thank you very much for this panel. Thank you. So. Introducing the theme for uh, AI and industry. Because tech is changing uh, the game for many companies, but also for industries. With the rising era of AI, enterprises and industrial companies are making use of machine learning and other technologies within the field to transform their operations. AI has the potential to, to transform the industrial world, and this track will give you an insight to thought leaders in the field and what they're doing um, and how they are adapting and innovating to get the job done. So if I say Sweden, industrial backbone, AI, connectivity, and international heavyweight, you say Ericsson. And yes, the only place to start a discussion about AI for the industry is with Professor Ilena Fashman, Director of Artificial Intelligence at Research uh, at Ericsson, and Ulrika Jäger, Head of AI and ML Strategy Execution. Ladies, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. Do you hear me well? Yes. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, indeed, we love AI at Ericsson, and we've been working with AI for more than 15 years. And I'd like to share a couple of slides with you. Uh, just a second, to give you a quick teaser of what we are doing uh, in research. And Ulrika will talk about applications in business that we do with AI. I'm responsible for um, AI research at Ericsson Globally, and I'm also an adjunct professor at KTH, uh, where we collaborate quite extensively. Uh, so to start with, let's see. I will show you the vision of um, uh, AI and telecom networks. Uh, the idea is that the telecom networks of the future should be zero touch. Uh, that means that uh, all the operational processes and tasks of the networks such as delivery, deployment, configuration, assurance, and optimization are supposed to be executed automatically, ideally with 100% automation. Automation is not all of it. Of course, we want the intelligence as well. Just running a network in a non-intelligent way is not sufficient, right? It has to be self-healing, self-learning, and self-improving all over time. Um, so it's fully automated. It means that it's a closed loop of autom automation. It's improving over time. That's the vision. And there are no humans in the actuation loop, um, meaning that in example zero and one, uh, this is not a zero touch network that we are after, but in number two and three, where the network is interacting with an intelligence and there is a uh, possibility to have a, a human operator shaken up on that, or maybe dictating some kind of high level intent to the network, or maybe requesting some kind of explainability of the network. That is an allowed scenario. And here I would like to say that uh, the two major technology blocks of artificial intelligence that we are working with and adopting is machine learning and machine reasoning. Machine learning is where we work with numeric data, specifically both bulk and stream. Uh, we apply machine learning models, we derive um, knowledge out of these machine learning models and we keep, we keep them in the knowledge base that in uh, its turn, the machine reasoning box, the green box will take care of and do the reasoning, planning, decision support, actions, execution of what if scenarios and really achieve fully automated network. Uh, as you can see in the lower end of this picture, we can also have expert knowledge injected in the knowledge bases. We can have training examples injected in machine learning models and we can have refined knowledge delivered to, to the network in form of decision support. And this is just to introduce actually the next block when Ulrika will tell you more about our industrial examples of 
applying artificial intelligence in networks. <clears throat> we don't uh, innovate in isolation. Ericsson Research is there, closely connected to all our business areas. And our business areas in their turn are connected to, the, to our customers. So together with customers, we create the use cases and the needs, the, the, uh, the, the domain application for the methods that we are developing. And then we have another organization called Global AI Accelerator that are really taking care of scaling and productifying the algorithms. Uh, while at Ericsson Research, we are finding the new methods and pushing the boundaries of artificial intelligence algorithms. And with that, I would like to hand over to my colleague Ulrika to talk about the business side of things. Hello, can you hear me properly? Yes. I think, yeah, uh, <laughs> Ileana is still in the, in the frame here, but okay. So, um, I had some problems loading my slides. I don't know if you have been able to do that. Otherwise, I'll talk without the slides. So from an Ericsson perspective, um, I mean, the objective that we have is really to not sell, create or sell AI separately from our portfolio of products and services. But it's really about empowering people and machines to transform the engineered network to a continuous learning network by using technologies like AI. And um, what we want to do is really to um, embed that into our products. So enhancing our software using AI, but it's also to, uh, like Elena was describing, removing the, the person and the human out of the equation when we're, for example, performing services and uh, moving towards an AI driven and automated network as far as possible. And how are we doing that? Well, um, we are doing it in, in our different business areas that Elena was showing. Uh, and we're doing it in different ways, depending on how the portfolio actually looks like. Um, the area where we have actually uh, came, came furthest is in the managed services domain, uh, which is and has been traditionally very human centric and human dependent and very little automation. Um, and uh, <clears throat> we started the journey by automating most of the processes as far as possible. Um, and then we added the step of thinking data driven re-engineering actually how we did do things and also adding the AI um, technology to uh, the mix. Uh, and by doing that, we have actually um, been able to automate around 40% of the uh, processes that we're using in, uh, in managed services where we are managing the operators' networks, let's say. Uh, and then we have created new types of use cases um, <clears throat> and capabilities that we were not able to do before, being much more proactive. So not only automating, but actually proactively detecting problems uh, before they actually um, disturb the network so we can um, prevent them from um, disturbing the network. But also then um, being able to have really fast resolutions in place that we can automatically, uh, so to say, um, uh, actuate. Uh, and the solutions that we have are really divided into four main areas, you could say. It's uh, operational efficiency, so operating more efficiently. Uh, and then um, <clears throat> we have predictive maintenance, so we can predict when something needs to be, um, uh, for example, maintained, swapped, and so on. Um, and then we have service assurance and design and optimization. So even designing and optimizing the 5G network um, for example, now when most operators are starting to look into the future and how to do that in the most optimal way, um, <clears throat> it's, it's, uh, we're using AI to support our, our customers with that. And just connecting back to what Sara Maser said earlier, and, and I was touched upon several um, by several people so far around the environmental aspects and, and using AI for the environment going forward. Uh, we are also having one use case that is addressing this, uh, which we call energy infrastructure operations. And that's not only by cutting cost for our customers, which we can do with 15%, but it's also about reducing CO2 emissions with one metric ton per site and year. And just thinking how many thousands and tens and hundreds and thousands uh, sites we have across the globe with uh, different operators uh, in play. It's actually, it means taking a lot of equivalent to cars off the road every year, uh, which I think is also a very important uh, scenario to look at when we're, we're making this more efficient for uh, operating networks. It's also about saving the environment. Ericsson, 
always you. setting the bar higher and uh, a great inspiration for all of us. Our next speaker is uh, the Chaired Professor of Machine Learning at Livlio Universität, Markus Lewiski. Uh, Markus focuses on machine learning, which is one of the important cores of artificial intelligence. And he looks at how artificial intelligence can help solve human tasks. Research on applied AI towards industry. Marcus, the floor is yours. Innovation Hub. Or as we say, applied AI for the people, with the people. I'm Marcus Levicki. I'm Chair Professor in Machine Learning here in Lulu University of Technology. Today, I will speak about industrial applications. When it comes to industrial applications, one of the most prestigious applications is in handwriting recognition, where we have systems where you take like a picture uh, with your mobile phone camera of a form, and then we can get the digital representation or even the understanding of a meaning. We have applications in agriculture and e-health um, and in mining, and in general, we say machine learning for the welfare of society. A very recent Achievement is that we won a Swedish award for our predictive movement project where we predict uh, user orders in order to uh, optimize the transportation of goods, especially in lower density populated areas. When it comes to the, uh, there's a very prestigious um, project uh, on space data, the Swedish Space Data Lab where we provide intelligent AI algorithms on satellite data for end users, for analysis applications and research. Um, we could say, hey, everyone could do that by themselves, but here we are speaking about terabytes of data and various intelligent machine learning methods applied and sometimes tuned to different use case scenarios. Um, so it's very efficient to have a high-performance computing center to do that, like the one we have here in Lugia. That is one of the candidates uh, for the European Digital Innovation Hub projects, which will be running in the Eurozone Europe program. Um, another uh, more uh, industrial project is uh, in the area of mining, where we have, for example, uh, the idea of recognizing parts and trucks, like that scale model here. Um, we want to recognize these parts and we have developed methods where we use only scale models like this one to train our methods, but still they are applicable in real environments. Here we see, for example, a video during training on the left side and then during the application on the right side and it works out rather well. This group of uh, George Nikolakopoulos has also received various awards. For example, when it comes to the investigation of mines, uh, it would be quite hazardous for humans to move up uh, either the mine or uh, the windmill um, and see if there are maybe cracks or is it dangerous to move there. Instead of that, using drones to explore the area and then only in cases when it's needed, the human will actually move in. As you see, I'm not the only AI researcher here in Lulu University. There are many researchers and we have received various awards um, and are leaders in various competitions. Two prestigious projects in industrial AI are, for example, the AI factory led by Ramin Karim, where it comes to uh, maintenance and smart uh, operation of industrial systems, or when it comes to um, smart grids and Industry 4.0, where you have many sensors communicating with one another. There is the Arrowhead Tools Project, one of the biggest projects from LTU University. Uh, led is a European project led by EU, trying to let uh, sensors with different languages communicate with one another. We also have research in innovative business models, and this research accelerates business and takes not only individual products into account, but the whole business and industrial ecosystem. None of these approaches to improve that is what we are building up here in Lulio. That's a LTU.ai digital innovation hub. We're having already a starting project, uh, the Applied AI Digital Innovation Hub North project funded by the EU. We're currently in the run for a European Digital Innovation Hub project. 
And the idea is to build on our strong research subjects, but also on our strong research infrastructure. For example, we have this biggest running GPU computation cluster for research in Sweden. Um, but also on our good education, we have the first five years master program on applied AI in Sweden. Uh, it's called civil engineer here in Sweden. Um, and we have connections to AI ASE, to uh, the science parks, not only in Junior, but everywhere here in the north. And building on that, we are creating a digital innovation hub here in the north. Thank you, Marcus. Very inspiring work, and we will continue to follow that. And I think it's now time to take a look and be inspired by international success. With us today, we have Germany and the deputy head of unit for the Federal Ministry of Economic Affairs and Energy. Uh, thank you, Ms. Dörte Nieland, for joining us and giving us a broader perspective on AI. The floor is yours. Thank you very much for having me here. I hope you can hear me. All right, thank you very much. I'm very um, happy to talk about the perspective from Germany about AI and industry. AI is the future technology and the growth driver, as we all know. It will determine the innovative and competitive ability of tomorrow across all industries and the areas of application in our industry and our medium-sized businesses are large. It's logistics, mechanical engineering, production, vehicle construction. According uh, to a report of a research institute, Capgemini, of the last year, that included the top 300 global manufacturers, it shows that the deployment of AI in industry and in certain sectors like here, especially in manufacturing is very promising. Research found out that Europe leads all major manufacturing countries in implementing AI in manufacturing operations. More than half of the European cohort are already implementing AI solution. And um, Europe is then followed by Japan with 30% implementing and the US with 28%. Um, there is a strong potential in AI across the manufacturing value chain. And three use cases stand out in terms of their suitability for kickstarting a manufacturer's AI journey. That is intelligent maintenance, product quality control, and demand planning. And just uh, let me give you an example. Um, the NONA, the Food Product Corporation, uses, for example, machine learning to predict demand variability and planning. A new capability improved its forecasting process and led to more efficient planning between different functions, such as marketing and sales. It had led to a 20% reduction in forecast error and a 30% reduction in lost sales. However, the German and also the European industry is shaped by SMEs. Um, no fewer than 99% of all the enterprises in Germany are estimated to be in the mid-size sector. And these medium-sized enterprises generate more than half the added value and provide over 60% of all the jobs in industry, particularly in, particularly in the industrial mid-size sector smart products, flexible production, efficiency, and interconnected added value offer tremendous potential, but also some major challenges. There is um, a very strong need for public support in this transformation process. We are lucky that we have in Germany a very good starting position. We have been funding research on artificial intelligence already for many years, and we have a strong internationally competitive and well-positioned positioned research landscape. The central challenge that we face is the transfer of AI basic research results into applications. And that's why the German AI strategy highlights transfer measures to support especially SMEs and startups in their efforts to create value in AI. So 
This is why we are especially focusing precisely on supporting the mid-size sector in its way into the digital age with a wide range of amenities. Um, a large number of protagonists are already promoting digital skills in SMEs. This is really um, essential. Um, we launched the course Elements of AI in Germany as well. I know you have it in Sweden and I think uh, Finland was um, the first country that had it. It's a free online course that explains the basics of AI to everyone, what it is, what it can do and what it cannot do. Um, we also have a number of mid-site 4.0 centers of competen competence, that's how it's called. These are competence centers that are based all over Germany. And um, what we did is we started with special AI coaches at that centers, a program to effectively reach especially SMEs with the topic of AI. Since June last year, more than 50 AI trainers have started their work in 18 selected uh, competence centers so that AI innovation can be adopted across the whole country. Um, with AI innovation competitions, my ministry is promoting AI lighthouse projects to increase the application of AI. In response to the corona crisis, a special call for funding has been launched to promote AI to overcome epidemic crisis. So we were very um, flexible here. And we are also um, promoting Gaia X, the European initiative to strengthen the digital sovereignty. And um, last but not least, what uh, we do have in Germany and what I think is also quite crucial is we are promoting um, cooperation platforms like Platform Industry 4.0, which, um, um, which aims to promote the digital transformation of manufacturing in Germany. It ensures a space for pre-competitive competitive exchange between relevant stakeholders like from politics, businesses, academia, trade unions, and also associations. And we have another platform that is called Platform Learn the System, a platform of learning system that brings together leading experts in self-learning systems and artificial intelligence from science, industry, politics, and uh, civil organizations. I think I leave it at this point here. Thank you. Well, vielen Dank. And it was truly inspiring and also very interesting to hear the German perspectives, both in terms of learnings and challenges, but also successes. Thank you. And without further ado, we have one of uh, Sweden's uh, stronger AI heavyweights with us today, who heads up the Center for Applied Anonymous Autonomous uh, System Center with the questionable abbreviation AASS of Urbu University. Her resume is beyond extensive, but I will do her justice by mentioning at least one of the things that she's done be, uh, above and beyond Örebro, which is she was a key part of the Swedish Omstadskommissionen and addressed how we can use technology to reboot Sweden after the pandemic. Amy, the floor is yours. Hi everybody, my name is Amy Lipfi. I'm a professor in information technology and I've been working in the field of AI and robotics now for the past 20 years. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about our journey of how we've been working with artificial intelligence. So at Örebro University, we've been driving research, education and collaboration in AI for a number of years. Our research is placed at the Center for Applied Autonomous Sensor Systems, where we have today over 70 researchers who are looking at the fields of AI, and this includes methods within machine learning, but also other AI technologies, who look at robotics and autonomous systems, and in particular, who look at the integration of AI and robotics so that we can create the next generation of intelligent systems that can work with and for humans. When it comes to education, we've been trying in the past few years to integrate AI in a meaningful way in several different types of education programs. We have, for example, our engineering educations, but we also have been looking at other types of educations where we feel AI is an important 
aspect in the education. For example, we've just recently implemented a revision of our law program where now they have an opportunity to take part in the developments of both AI and digitalization. Collaboration is essential for us at the university, and one aspect in terms of education and collaboration has been running a number of competence development initiatives. We offer courses for free to the industry as we see that information about AI is so essential to come out to all different types of industries. And we now have a specialized program called Smarter, where industry partners can come to the university, can share their different AI challenges with us, and together we try and find new solutions to these problems, but also increase their level of awareness and competences about AI. We find that by working with industry in terms of education, we also lift new research problems that feed into the research environment. In terms of collaboration, we also see that there is a need not only to provide competences in AI, but to ensure that the need and demand of AI is also uh, happening and occurring in, in an equal pace. And so for this reason, we've been working with our national partners on the implementation of AI. And in particular, what we do is we work with companies, but also the public sector, to see how they can take the knowledge that is being produced in academic environments and really transform that into something that can be implemented into concrete solutions. There are a lot of different aspects that need to be looked at when it comes to the implementation of AI. It's not just the technical ones, but also legal aspects and aspects about IT infrastructures that are important to see. Although we are in these pandemic times, we are working our best to nevertheless create good meeting places where researchers, industry, students, um, and the public sector can interact and discuss various challenges about AI. We have uh, our robot lab, which is a very useful tool for us to explore pilot projects within the area of AI. We also have a newly built innovation arena where we will hopefully have a chance to meet face to face in order to discuss our challenges. Our aim and our vision is to create a sustainable ecosystem around AI. When I say sustainability, I mean that all the different pieces of the university need to feed into each other. We see that the research feeds into education, the education feeds out into industry and collaboration, and these awaken new research questions which feed back into the research environments here at the university. Our objective and our aim also is not to work in isolation, but really to work together with our different international partners and national partners. In this way, we hope that AI can be an instrumental tool in confronting some of the biggest challenges that we have uh, before us, and that we can show how AI can really be used for the good and the betterment of society. Professor Amy Lufti, uh, that was truly inspiring, both in terms of being practical and showing us the, the work that you're doing, but also explaining how the broader ecosystem works and how these different insights and knowledges feed into each other uh, and therefore become uh, successful for real. And one of the key words that I threw, heard throughout your presentation was collaboration, uh, which is also a key uh, red thread throughout uh, these uh, days of, of conference. And I think that is a great segue to let us look at uh, an opportunity to collaborate and learn from other parts of the world and perspectives. And I think we should move to glorious India, because no, who better than Amitabh Kant, who's presently the CEO for the National Institution of Transforming India. He's the author of Branding India, An Incredible Story, An Incredible India. He's been the key driver in Making India, Startup India, and the list goes on and on. Uh, thank you for joining us. The floor is yours. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm greatly honored to address you here at the Sweden Innovation Days 
India and Sweden have individually recognized the importance of artificial intelligence and are both working towards realizing the national strategies. There are certain characteristics such as a rich data ecosystem and a vibrant talent pool which is, uh, makes India an exciting artificial intelligence destination. India has the cheapest data rates in the world and with close to 700 million internet users, it is a data rich country. India is systematically building more infrastructure to bring more people online. Every three seconds we add an internet user. Thus, not only we are creating a rich data ecosystem, but also propping up India as a global playground for research and development of artificial intelligence. Ladies and gentlemen, it is expected that artificial intelligence will be adding close to US dollar 957 billion to India's economy by 2035. Recognizing this opportunity early on, Niti Aayog released the National Strategy on Artificial Intelligence in June 2018, ahead of many other countries. The strategy was especially significant in the global context, as it was the first to explicitly prioritize the AI for all or the AI for social good positioning. Something which has not only been appreciated globally, but is now being widely adopted. The National Strategy of India sees the roadmap for realizing India's larger vision and identifies some key steps which needs to be taken. Firstly, we have to incentivize both fundamental and applied AI research through the setting up of centers of research excellence in artificial intelligence and international centers for transformational artificial intelligence. These institutions will be supported and driven by the top tier technical institutions such as, such as our institutes of science, institutes of technology, and the triple institutes of technology and robust public-private partnership. Secondly, we believe that we have to democratize access to this key AI-specific computing infrastructure. They are AI research analytics and knowledge assimilation platform has been conceived and we are moving forward in this. Thirdly, India must cultivate and harness its rich human capital and large pool of technical talent. This must be done through appropriate skilling of both students and professionals. As a globi global IT powerhouse, India will have to reskill the present workforce to be future ready. This will require retrofitting existing initiatives as well as require the building of new platform addressing the evolving learning requirements. India has made great efforts to redefine education through the new education policy, which brings the curriculum in closer alignment to a skills-based approach to education and is better aligned with the requirements of AI skills and training. Fourthly, Adoption can be accelerated through the creation of a robust multi-stakeholder marketplace, such as the data marketplace for, for data training, AI models, creation of large fundamental data sets, which will reduce the entry barriers faced by academia and startups, and will also encourage international experts and researchers. The data annotation marketplace for crowdsourcing data annotation requirements and deployable model marketplace, which will bring together buyers and suppliers of AI solutions. Finally, and most importantly, all developments and deployment of artificial intelligence must be done in a manner which carefully accounts for considerations pertaining to ethics, privacy, and security. In July 2020, Niti Aayog released a draft document towards responsible AI for all, containing the principles of responsible AI, developed in consultation with various national and international experts. We were one of the first countries to emphasize the need for AI to be developed and used responsibly. 
to build upon this legacy further and to strengthen our commitment the government of india recently organized the global summit on responsible ai for social empowerment ladies and gentlemen india is a diverse country in terms of its geography people languages and challenges this makes india the perfect test bed for not only developing ai products for india but the diversity allows for solutions to be developed which are also deployable in other economies potentially establishing india as a global <coughs> tech garage the country has been ranked second on the stanford artificial intelligence vibrancy index we have more than 1000 artificial intelligence startups and we are moving with a rich talent and vibrant data ecosystems that are necessary to build ai products and india is well positioned to become a leading destination for ai solutions and products the government is playing a critical role serving as a catalyst for building new synergies as a founding member of the global partnership in artificial intelligence india is already leading from the front as it champions the responsible use of ai for social good to realize a more inclusive society through artificial intelligence not only really will be taking india forward but we'll be taking the world along with us as we find solutions to the challenges of india on education health nutrition we'll be finding a solution not for the 1.3 billion people of india but for the 7 billion people of the world as they move from poverty to middle class in the next decade thank you very much ladies and gentlemen Thank you Mr Count I will take that as a promise you've now said it on camera you will take the world with us with India's success and learnings and this is uh, a conference of collaboration and you unfortunately won't be part of the panel discussion later but uh, I'm sure that uh, you will reach out to the different participants and share knowledge uh, and learnings with us thank you Sure yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, we are on a global roll, so I think we should continue the journey to Brazil. Uh, I'm super excited to have Silvio Meira uh, with us again. An extensive resume, and I won't do you justice by only mentioning your current position as chief scientist at the digital strategy company. But I know that your talk will show the depth, knowledge, and experience that you have of both uh, research and academia as well as government. Silvio, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much for having me here today at this impressive seminar. I'd just like to add a few considerations to uh, what uh, many people have said already this session in the in, in the in the previous one. Uh, from my uh, point of view, uh, what we are dealing with is uh, with learning how to use data to generate benefits benefits across the whole value chain of just about uh, everything that we are uh, trying to consider as fields of application uh, for uh, in artificial intelligence all over the place in our particular session here which is about industry i think is uh, the problem is how to combine data in our algorithms and not only ai algorithms we have to be smart on on choosing things there is a lot of algorithms out there the ai algorithms and not everything that you need to use data as input to generate benefits as outputs needs ai somehow so there is a question of choice to start with so using data and algorithms to combine products with services in or into or with experiences substituting uh sales and deliveries with results for clients that's what we want to achieve in the end and why do i say results for clients and considering the whole value chain because a lot of people are considering and we saw quite a few examples here on uh, how you're going to use uh, artificial intelligence on the factory floor on the plant floor uh, uh increasing efficiency efficacy of production processes but there is a lot of disruption coming around i think when you consider that retail and distribution are actually migrating what they understand of the whole uh, value chain and processes to create to develop to deliver products and to manufacture them as well uh in on behalf of the clients uh, when you look at um, 
at uh, things like uh, consumer to manufacturing on how you use data on the client side, on the consumer side, in B2C, to understand what the clients want, what they uh, don't want, but you think they might want in function of the data you have on what they ask for, they look for in uh, uh, e-commerce platforms, in uh, social and network conversations, and, and, and so on. It might be the case that industry could expect disruption coming not only from other industry that using a, it's using AI uh, to uh, increase the efficiency uh, of their manufacturing processes, but also to understand the whole market in which they are embedded somehow and consider our markets around that one because in digital markets in general, in markets that are powered by digital platforms, you do not necessarily have borders. So the problems we have to face are more or less connected to what, what data we have, where is it at the moment, what systems, which systems are using that data and what for, and did we solve uh, for uh, conformance, uh, our own rules about the data and regulation, uh, rules of the market about the data we have to ask the following questions. How can we be more agile? That's a question of the competitive present. How can we reduce risks and costs? That's a question about survival. And that's, have, that has implications on how do we create, considering costs and risks, opportunities, new, uh, new sales, and profits. Profits that we need to invest in more, maybe uh, technology, more marketing, more wealth, more results for society and not for the firms only. If we have that all into account, uh, I think we have to consider that anything that you're gonna do in artificial intelligence these, these days needs uh, some kind of infrastructure that encompasses models of AI that we're gonna use, data and information that you can synthesize on top of that data. And you have to do that in an, in an economical way. You have to take into account that, for example, for training certain current uh, AI models is extremely expensive. When you consider, for example, the cost of training uh, models with billions of, uh, of factors involved. That's of, of course not the case of most applications you're gonna see in industry. But you have to think about that if things get too complex. Also, I think uh, AI for industry is more likely to benefit that kind of industry that's going to look for new business models that inject AI as an essential part of them and not an improvement of old business models. And when you look at that, both the comparison between old and new business models, you have to to think that uh, at least you you'd not consider bad business models that are only good for you, industry, or any kind of business, but not good for people and society. And to, to have that uh, as a uh, sort of a more wider picture that we'd have to take into account, I think we have to consider what kind of ethics we are going to have when you have uh, very large scale AI applications in the industry, in the market as a whole. We have to take account of transparency. What are we doing to people or with people's data? Why will we reason about it? We have to be explainable. How do we do it? What do we do and how do we do it? And at some time in the future, if not necessarily now for all kinds of applications of AI that we have, we're gonna have to be accountable for that. So transparency, explainability and accountability, the T model is going to be absolutely fundamental if we uh, want to do anything that's sustainable with AI in industry, uh, retail, government, or whatever. Thank you. Uh, and clearly, we will have lots of questions and would love to dive further into that. But staying true to the format of the conference, which is giving uh, the audience a, a flavor of the different types of perspectives and, and innovation, we will continue with a panel discussion about AI transforming industry.
because it's valuable to take the time to uh, connect the dots and see if we can make some sense out of these uh, latest talks and what that means for us, and maybe using a bit of brain power to do some predictions into the future. But let me start by welcoming Professor Christian Gutmann, who is the Vice President, Global Head of Artificial Intelligence and Data at Tieto Evry. Welcome, Christian. Thank you. Could you give us you? an elevator pitch of what you do? But more importantly, you've listened to all the talks today. Um, what is your perspective or your reflections on how AI is transforming industry? Yeah, absolutely. Love to. So first off, um, yeah, thanks for having me. Great panel. Lots of uh, good discussions, introductions. So from my side, I mean, uh, as, as um, some of you know, I mean, I've been involved in AI for many, many years and now focusing a lot on industrialization, commercialization, end-to-end uh, -end processes in AI. Uh, what my team at Tieto Every does and what I'm also doing at the Nordic AI Institute is focusing a lot of linking all this technology to value creation. So how do you actually get value out of this technology that exists? That's one. I'm advising and talking a lot to leaders and to um, CXOs, CEOs, government leaders, different key stakeholders for them to understand the art of the possible. Uh, there's a huge gap still as to how that uh, can turn into an actions. Uh, and then, of course, also my team, uh, and we are here to every turn this into execution delivery. So actually having services and solutions for the ecosystem, particularly in the Nordics. So that's sort of an uh, elevator pitch, a couple of uh, uh, thoughts. And then you asked me also to reflect on the, on the uh, talks. So they were obviously a lot uh, and quite diverse. But if I attempted in this way, I was... Um, I think one part that I'm hearing a lot is this, uh, there's a lot of applied AI that we have been hearing about now uh, from Ericsson, from Amy, uh, also from Dirt and Silvio. And I think that is very good, basic research, applied research. Um, greetings from Berlin, by the way, also. I have just been speaking to a colleague uh, of, of uh, Dorothea Baer. Perhaps you, you yeah. Exactly, you know each other. Um, but of course, there is a lot of, um, uh, you know, this application needs to turn into commercialization. It needs to turn into business. And there we are actually having a big challenge here in Europe. I hear it here in, in Germany too, and we need to be much quicker. I, uh, I think uh, there's a big gap to fill. Uh, and the second one is the SMEs, these small businesses. We need to be very careful to give these small businesses, small or medium-sized businesses and startups, the opportunities uh, to access data uh, and to not be overburdened by massive amounts of regulations. I think that is a very important, very important part. And, uh, and lastly, uh, if I'm now looking at this very diverse um, set of people that have spoken from, I believe from Brazil, uh, he, uh, Kitano spoke from Japan, we have India, we have Germany. So what you all have been hearing now in the audience and in the panel is you hear obviously a lot of countries now being on their toes and wanting to be the number one place in the world to attract talent, to attract business, to attract, uh, to attract investments. So that, that is something just to note. So I think the game is on. Uh, and certainly from, uh, from the European perspective, from the Nordic perspective, uh, we have everything to gain and, and a lot also to lose if we don't do it right. But this is sort of a short summary from my side. And I think you touched upon one of the key aspects here in, in the collaboration, which is the theme of, of the conference, which is the SMEs and the, uh, and the public-private partnership challenge. And I was wondering if we could get a German perspective. Dorte, you mentioned that applying AI into industry is one of your challenges. And how do you see the public-private collaboration play a part in that? Dorte? I think we need your sound, Dörte. Is it working now? Yes, welcome. Me? Thank you. Um, Dörte, what's your take on the, the importance of the public-private partnerships in order to move AI into the world of applied AI? 
Well, it's, um, I think it is challenging. It has challenges and it also has opportunities. I think there is sometimes a lack of public sector capacity and experience as one of the key challenges for public-private partnerships. And the preparation, procurement, management of uh, public-private partnership contracts can be a complex and resource-intensive undertaking for a procuring authority, and especially those um, that are new to these partnerships. And um, we are a little bit reluctant in Germany um, due to some experiences that we made, um, yeah, where, where the cases got very expensive, took much longer as it was expected. So, um, yeah. On the other hand side, well, it's big potential to improve the value for money. <clears throat> I think this is a big, um, big opportunity. And uh, with our Gaia X project, it is not really a public-private partnership. It is a, or it's to be seen as a private partnership uh, at the end. But uh, we're funding it as well, so we also see a lot of opportunities there. Thank you. And I think you're addressing one of the key aspects of this challenge, which is that the public-private isn't that easy always because there's different languages, there's di different uh, paces, uh, and there's b different buzzwords uh, in terms of how to achieve things in legislation. Um, and Sylvia, I think you mentioned it, the importance of new business models. And new business models for me as a technology investor means the startup community. That's where many of the new business models will come. What's your experience when creating ecosystems to funneling in um, the early stage companies into the uh, industrial part of the ecosystem? Well, that's, that's a very, <laughs> that's a key and complex question. And the problem is, as I said, when I mentioned data to start talking about AI, one of the main problems of uh, startups, especially in a very early stage, is us access to, uh, to data lakes, to data sets, to data warehouse, uh, in, in at the very least, to data flows and streams that you can use to train models. You don't do artificial intelligence when you think about machine learning and deep learning without having access to uh, at least bad data, let's say. Uh, it, could, it could be bad data, but it has to be high volumes of data. And if it is good data, it's even better. So the, the biggest problem, if you're gonna start something uh, from scratch that has to do with a business model, a new, uh, you know, from the, in the world business model uh, that has to do with AI is access to data. In that aspect, partnering with big companies in retail, industry, even government, and in some places like Brazil, you have a lot of open data that's available for the community to use to train models that have to do with prediction, for example. It could be a very good start as well. Key aspects there. Thank you for sharing that. And I think there's, a, there's an interesting segue into what is ultimately one of the elephants in the room, which is the pandemic, which changes the name of the game. And Amy, we haven't really addressed it so far uh, in this conference, but given that you were part of Omstarts Kommissionen uh, and looked at how we can use technology to reboot Sweden, do you want to share some learnings here for the uh, AI industry perspective? Yeah, so I think Certainly digitalization has been our, our fallback during this pandemic. Without it, we wouldn't have been able to have distance work, distance education, and we wouldn't have been able to have this conference. Um, but I think we need to really step up and accelerate how we are using digital technologies. And when it comes specifically to AI, one thing that we've looked at a lot with this, this Restart Commission, part of this, the Swedish Chamber of Commerce, is the balance between the, um, the supply and the demand in AI. Um, and if we look at Sweden, there's been uh, fantastic efforts to really ensure that there is a supply that is building up research talent, building up you know, an ecosystem that will allow, for example, an implementation of AI. But we have to also make sure, and I think this is the challenge given that we are in a pandemic, that the demand for AI is also growing, 
that means that we need to kind of look at what are the bottlenecks that currently hinder organizations from truly adopting AI. And they can be legal bottlenecks. They can be uh, bottlenecks about competence levels. They can be bottlenecks, for example, about data that was previously mentioned. But what are the bottlenecks that are stopping the, um, the uptake of AI? so that we are not currently investing a lot of investments in the supply. And in a year or so, we don't have the demand. Now, I am an AI researcher. I've worked in AI for many, many years. And I think one of the things um, that I, I, I like to sort of lift is that if we don't balance between the supply and demand, as an AI researcher, we always are very afraid we're going to throw AI into the next winter. And also as an AI researcher, I can sometimes think that we, we are just in the midst of a very big pandemic and we've been in it for some months. And I had maybe wished to see AI come up with a brilliant solution to address this pandemic. And I haven't seen that yet either. So I don't want to rain on anyone's parade. I think you know we're, the progress here is fantastic, but we should be demanding more uh, out of AI and ensuring that as I said, there's that good balance between supply and demand. Amy, supply and demand, and you mentioned a uh, possible AI winter, which is obviously not something that we're interested in. And Elena, from your perspective, how do we make sure that we don't hit these bottlenecks and a potential AI winter? Because we need to go from a competitive uh, AI industry landscape to solving the big problems of our time. What's your take? Yeah, so um, I think I'm very lucky to be uh, to like uh, sit close to the core all that uh, perfect data. You know, being a an AI researcher within a big corporation is kind of uh, nice, right? Uh, and I'm not saying that we are not collaborating. We are collaborating a lot with academia and public sector and other industries. But uh, I mean, just tapping into what Sylvia was talking about uh, regarding the data and the importance of applying algorithms on something very relevant. Uh, I do agree. And I also, we also know how uh, difficult it is for companies to share uh, business sensitive data sometimes. Uh, and that's why some companies start big AI research organizations within them, within the companies, right? So, um, I mean, from my perspective, from Ericsson's perspective, it's not, uh, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's quite easy actually, because it, we don't uh, kind of, we don't come up with, with an algorithm for the sake of the algorithm. We always start with some kind of concrete need for the customer uh, that we are solving uh, using different technologies. And when there is a fit for AI, then, then it's AI uh, essentially. So, um, uh, yeah, C coming back to this, like how to avoid the next AI winter, I think the relevance of uh, problems that we are solving, as long as we kind of pick the right problems and uh, have the right data, then we'll be fine. Silvio, how do we pick the right problems? How do we fix the right problems? Well, <laughs> they are always, there is always something to improve, right? Uh, there's, I mean, if, if I just uh, give you an example from telecom sector, with every G, we, it has to be faster, it has to be bigger bandwidth, it has to be more flexible, it has to be cheaper, it has to support more devices, it has to be better, uh, low, like more reliable, it has to be lower, um, longer battery time, uh, less dropped calls. I mean, all, all these characteristics, there are plenty. Um, and then it means that even, I mean, that is every, everything is a problem in itself. And then, well, how do Where we uh, I love that. get That's a beautiful more, tweet. Um, That's a beautiful tweet. Everything is a problem in itself. <laughs> There's always something yeah, okay. to there's always something to do, but we have a little time left. And uh, Sylvia, I'd like to segue into you. Um, how do we pick problems? How do we use uh, artificial intelligence the the best given this supply and demand challenge? That's for me. Yes, please. Yes. Right. Um, what are the problems that the clients have, the customers? I think a lot of uh, a lot of uh, R and D, the old kind of R and D I grew up with uh, in industry, in uh, university research and development centers, and so on and so forth, center too much of the uh, focus 
on what we can do, what we can do from what we know, what are the problems that we already know. I think we are about time to change the focus really to what customers want as experience. And if we discover more or less about that, even less than we discovered about that is often more than what we know about the products and services we already have in our minds. Well, there you go. We've heard it from all the corners of the world. Um, AI is a question of supply and demand. We need to collaborate between public and private. We need to take the research uh, into the applied world of artificial intelligence. And I think uh, so far today, we've seen a lot of big ideas, lots of will and genuine interest in collaboration and sharing uh, our thoughts. Thank you, panel. I wish we could speak longer, but uh, we have a time schedule. But thank you for AI and industry panel. Welcome now to the next segment. I have the honor of handing over this production to my friends in Gothenburg, Lindholmen Science Park. Please, uh, the brilliant head of development at Sol, Grenska Science Park, Magnus Bergendahl. Thank you for having us and uh, warmly welcome to this session on transforming healthcare. By investing only 70 minutes of your time, you will have the opportunity to meet five highly skilled people with different perspectives on how we together can and are transforming healthcare by moving from mainly treating symptoms to a stronger focus on prevention, prediction and interventions. My name is Magnus Bajendal and I represent uh, this session and will guide you through it. I also represent Salgenska Science Park and um, that is a non-profit organization that is having its focus and, and the goal to accelerate health innovations. We work closely hand in hand with AI Innovation in Sweden and other in innovation suppliers and, and support organizations such as Vinova as well in many of our innovation projects. And it's with great, great pleasure that we stand here to deliver together this session on transforming healthcare. Um, the format of the session is that we will have five presenters and five presentations and directly thereafter we'll go into a panel discussion. So with no further ado, I'm very happy to present to you our first speaker, that is Marcus Lingman, the Chief Strategy Officer at the Halland Hospital Group in Sweden. Marcus has a background as a researcher, clinician and a senior healthcare manager and will give us an introduction to the healthcare system that he represents. He will also guide us um, how Region Halland developed the concept of information-driven healthcare to meet universal challenges by making use of wealth of data in modern healthcare systems. As part of this, it's also about developing and applying AI models to identify new patterns and predict the future. I'm happy to present Marcus to you, who is also now on awarded um, the, the AI suite of the year. Marcus, stage is yours. Happy to have you. Thank you, Magnus. Thank you for the invitation and uh, the opportunity to spend a few minutes on what we have to come uh, to call information-driven healthcare and how AI can help us unleash the power of healthcare data. The challenges we're facing in healthcare are well known to us all. The aging population drives care demand while we at the same time want to embrace new efficient and sometime, sometimes costly diagnostics and treatments. Information-driven care is a set of principles where we fact base all of our healthcare system by working along the value chain of knowledge. This means going from data to information that generates actionable insights, but these insights need to lead to changed behavior before it can lead to better outcomes for patients and more efficient healthcare systems. Until then, the data has created little value. We also complete the paradigm of descriptive care, where you find business intelligence using historic data with predictive care, with the help of computer science leading eventually 
to pre uh, prescriptive healthcare where algorithms also can take action themselves. Healthcare continuously produces a wealth of data, which are still largely an untapped source. Partly because healthcare is so fragmented, but also due to its level of complexity, both on the individual patient level, but also on the systems level. This is where machine learning, neural networks, and natural language processing have huge roles to play. The main obstacle that we faced in our five, now five-year uh, work in the field was data access. But even in a highly regulated environment like healthcare, many of those problems can be solved. The role of AI in healthcare is and will be pattern recognition and risk assessment supporting both the managerial level and in the clinical encounter. We have shown that healthcare data can be used to inform proactive interventions to reduce readmissions after patients have left the hospital, identifying patterns of mental illness before the stage of psychiatric disease, predicting death in the emergency situation, identifying risk of sudden cardiac death based on the ECG, and also being able to differentiate between dangerous and benign chest pain in ambulatory care. We also know that there are numerous commercial applications now approved by the FDA, for example, and the list is getting longer. AI is entering specialty by specialty, starting with radiology and other image depending areas. So what is needed to move forward? My strong recommendation is that we build ecosystems of all competencies needed to proceed from data to information, to insights and further to behavioral change. This includes clinicians, computer scientists, legal expertise, management, and connection to academia. In our system, we did that by organizing around what we call our Center for Information Driven Care. Through this center, we can also support life science industry that is craving for healthcare data in order to flourish. We can resolve different uh, uh, research questions as well as transforming and trace, uh, translating uh, the, those results into real world healthcare. Our current areas of development is mainly within the applied models, federated learning, AI ethics and explainable AI, as we see scaling and trust in models as key to the adoption of AI when translating data into health and longevity. And as we gradually go into precision medicine and virtual healthcare, the AI toolbox will be necessary to handle all that data. And having said that, I just want to uh, give the word back to you, Magnus, and, and see what uh, the coming speakers have to say about this. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. Really interesting to get a flavor of what the region Halland and, and your hospitals are driving in the transformation of healthcare. And uh, particularly interesting to see how you look into the future and dwell upon that. And we're looking forward to hear more from you in the, the, the coming panel discussion directly after the, the others' presentations. I know there's been a long journey for you, and I'm, I'm so eager to hear more about the, the lessons and the, the learnings that you, you've encountered and, and captured uh, throughout that. So many thanks for, for sharing that with us. And uh, now over to our next speaker, that is Ebba Carbonier, who is a portfolio manager at SWELIFE, a national innovation program within life science in Sweden. She is based in Karolinska Institutet at Stockholm. Um, her portfolio project contains nationally scalable solutions for health, su su uh, such as gene sequences and cell and gene therapy. But she's not only focusing on the, the cell and gene level today, 
Eva will instead talk about the system transformation where data and computer power are used to predict and prevent rather than diagnose and treat um, tasks. I also happen to know that uh, Ebba's other interests are space and kite surfer and surfing. So if anyone out there in the world, we're representing 18 different nations in this, this call, uh, would like to dis discuss, for example, Voyager 1 or 2, I know that uh, Ebba is looking forward to, to chat with you also about kite surf places on Earth. Ebba, over to you. So many thank you for that, uh, Magnus, and uh, really look forward to talking about space and kite surfing at some point as well. Unfortunately, we don't have the afterworks uh, after these conferences, but that would be really nice. So I will I will share my presentation here, and uh, just checking all of you see my presentation now. Good. Thank you for having me and Marcus, thank you for a great introduction as well and Magnus. So I will talk about AI for prediction and prevention, which is not equal to AI for diagnosis and treatment. And I will talk about this in a healthy risk ill perspective as a system transformation. And so let's just start with a simple root cause analysis here. The OECD have come to the conclusion and calculated that we unfortunately only spend 2.8% on prevention. And we spend 97% on trying to fix health. So that makes us uh, have some consequences. And those consequences are, of course, personal suffering and personal costs. And very large societal costs, which is not really sustainable in the way we're doing it now. And the thing is also that there is very, very good calculations from the OECD, which says that if we spend one euro on prediction and prevention, we don't have to spend six euros on trying to fix health afterwards. So we're basically boiling the frog here. Unfortunately, that's what we're doing because it's the same with nature, what we're doing with nature as with health. But if we look at it this way, if we understand even more than what affects health. From New England Journal of Medicine, lifestyle affects health with 40%. Family history and genetics affects health with 30%. Environmental and social factors affect health with 20%. And our dear healthcare only affects health by 10%. And we spend 97% or let's say 90 or 95 or 97% on the healthcare part which can only affect health by 10, 20, maybe 20%. And all the incentives and payer models and business models are made for focusing on the healthcare. So we have to really talk to our dear Nobel committee to give more incentives to really trying to do it right from the start. So, AI for prediction and prevention is not equal to AI for diagnosis and treatment. We spend most of our data and AI and ML projects on medicine, the ill part, and even more so on precision medicine. But what really contributes then to prevention and preventing, for example, diabetes type 2, heart and cardiovascular diseases, cancer, and even COVID-19, of course. It's actually prevention of obesity, and even more so to do it right from the start, prevention of childhood obesity. And we have to go on affecting the incentives, the payer models, and the business models so that we do more of our AI and data projects on the prevention part. And thankfully we work with that because we have a large uh, 
project now, Zero Obesity at School Start 2030, where there is definitely this prediction and prevention and also with gamification. So we should really use our gaming industry, for example, not only to produce Candy Crush, but really prediction prevention, um, behavioral and motivational um, applications, maybe addictive health applications. So we're also having a grand challenge. And since we are working in this with uh, multinational companies, for example, SAS Institute and Microsoft, I would actually like to invite other countries and welcome you to contact me if you would also like to work in this way, because we've had many good contacts with many countries now. So it's actually a bit of a, a of course, it's a global pro problem that we have to uh, challenge together. So you can contact me on that one. And we also have another project, which I think is fantastically interesting because we have, of course, quantum computers being built in Sweden and in our wonderful Gothenburg. And there we are developing quantum computing algorithms as engine for AI in health. So we are developing quantum computing algorithms to understand our genomics better, to understand why we become ill and how do we keep healthy. So if you have some projects, this is very novel, of course, but if you're in any way in this area, you're also most welcome to contact me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eva, for that presentation. Do I dare to ask you a couple of questions? I'm getting so curious about the, the projects that you're running, uh, especially when you, you're talking about the Gothenburg connection, of course, but also the connection to Stockholm, uh, with a smile on my face, regarding the quantum power to change the, the healthcare and the, and the system. How would that make such a quantum leap using that power of, of the, uh, the new uh, computers? Of course, with, with the coming computing power that will, uh, I mean, there, there was a simulation and it's now working and there are of course Google and IBM and Honeywell, different technologies, but what is happening that is the simulation show that we can do a computation in three minutes and 20 seconds instead of 10,000 years. And it's just astonishing those numbers. But we, what we then really have to get going on is using this computing power, not only for the medicine part, of course, for finding the quantum chemistry, for, for doing the medicine, but to really predict and prevent. And of course, then there can be enormous matching uh, in, within, within such computing power. So, but it's really in the early stages and development, but mm. that is what we're really looking forward to and working on. Super, and looking at your portfolio project at Sweet Life, um, are there a, a, a number of projects connected to this quantum technology or are they more connected into AI? What is the balance between that in, in the portfolio? There is definitely, um, I mean, it's always this, is it, is it uh, uh, data statistics and uh, machine learning or AI? There are, of course, components in, in several of the projects. Uh, but just like Marcus really touched upon as well, we really have to get our, our data sets in order. That's the basic, the baseline of being able to, to, do, to do the fun part. And that's actually one of the reasons why we're working with um, childhood obesity, apart from that, uh, from a value chain, doing it right from the start to try to prevent diabetes and heart cardiovascular diseases, is really this thing to the, the, the childhood data is easier to work with than the um, multi-disease old person as well. So it's actually a bit of cleaner data as well. So there are components, like you're saying, in, in all of my projects, in my portfolio. 
So um, this clean data uh, set are really connecting to what Marcus talked about earlier. Do you, Eva, looking at you, um, do you feel that there is a, a lot of those data sets available in this sector right now, or if that is a limiting sector for these these leaps and this looking into the prediction and prevention area? It is. Um, I mean, the, there are data sets, but definitely there has to be more training sets. Mm. And we are in Sweden. We are very careful, which is very good. But if we really get into the legal parts, it's also there are barriers. But sometimes we seem to to talk about more barriers than there really is. So so that's that's the point. Thank you, Ebba, for sharing these insights and also looking forward to have you in a panel uh, discussion. And um, within just a, a few steps, we're listening to South Korea, and it will be interesting to hear about that, the availability of data sets. But before that, we have the great presenter from AstraZeneca, Peter Blomgren, who is the vice president and head of data office at the AstraZeneca R&D. Peter works as the global leader based in Gothenburg, where AstraZeneca has one of their three strategic R&D centers. Peter leads a department that helps um, the R&D teams to utilize data for digital solutions and artificial intelligence as a, meaning, as a means of getting medicines to patients. They're doing that by cataloging matching and making data available, just as, as uh, Ebba was referring to, that availability, availability is really key, on both the white glove and the self-service. Peter is also responsible for data strategy and policy, including data and AI ethics. That is for sure an area uh, of increased importance across the whole industry. When Peter is not, uh, is not buried in, uh, deep into data sets, he is um, also a dedicated runner, everything from 10K up to a marathon. You can see that in your eyes, Peter, when, uh, Peter, when, you, when we're talking about this. Uh, has a family of four plus, Charlie, the Labradoodle. But Peter, happy to have you here and looking so much forth to hear more about your work at AstraZeneca. Thank you for that. So we all have close ones in need where disease affect their life or even took it. I work for AstraZeneca because we strive to improve patient lives and use science, data, digital and AI to do so. We strive for the earliest and greatest impact and aim to treat and prevent the causes of disease. And we strive to modify and eventually cure it. Since 2013, we are on an, quite an inspiring journey, which has completely changed the way that we work and do science. It's been a, quite an amazing journey. It's like opening up your shirt and discovering there's a Superman dress underneath. So Astra is now often um, characterized by its culture based on dedication to science, broad collaboration and sustainability, willing to do the unprecedented. There are two ingredients here that I'd like to highlight today. One, innovation doesn't happen in isolation, so co collaboration is absolute key, we've heard it already. And two, how to apply data, digital and AI to improve patient lives by early detection and personalized treatment. So we'll watch two video clips that showcase examples of this, and please run the first. Today, healthcare faces a constantly evolving set of challenges and opportunities. Increased life expectancies, rising healthcare costs, and digital technology are driving disruptive change, whilst big data and artificial intelligence are becoming more integrated. This is all happening while new advances are teaching us about mechanisms of disease, leading to new treatments and the ability to better predict patient outcomes. With these changes come new pressures and demands on our industry from patients and caregivers, health authorities, payers, policymakers and others. It's never been more critical to ensure we are putting patients and their needs at the centre of everything we do. One way AstraZeneca is helping to address these demands is by developing health innovation hubs connected by a global network. Our hubs bring together digital, R&D, operations and commercial in reimagining how we can improve patient outcomes. We work to identify the main challenges patients face and collaborate externally with academia, 
medical professionals, government, technology companies, entrepreneurs and investors to co-develop and implement solutions to those challenges. We have more than 10 health innovation hubs comprised of both structural locations and virtual partnerships that work to solve, showcase and scale these innovative and holistic health solutions. Each hub is locally driven and regionally relevant while operating on a shared agenda to optimize health management and improve patient outcomes. We are already seeing the early successes of these hubs and believe that by working together, we can continue to push the frontiers of healthcare innovation. This is now starting also here in Gothenburg called HealthWorks. The first project is to decrease heart uh, failure hospitalization. Another great example is the BioVenture Hub, a unique and open collaborative innovation environment in the absolute middle of the AstraZeneca Gothenburg site. More than 30 companies with most recent joiner Mindforce Game Lab combining gaming and healthcare, as you uh, talked about earlier. So moving to the second theme for today, data, AI and digital being a foundational pillar of the AstraZeneca strategy. We use it end to end to improve how we discover, develop and get medicines to patients. A few examples include understanding disease biology and finding new ways of targeting the underlying drivers of disease by using knowledge graphs, by using data science and AI to understand our genes. We also use it in clinical development to better target the right patients and how we do trials using remote visits and new devices, something that's been very helpful uh, during the pandemic. And also in the treatment uh, and products like Turbo Plus, um, a digital app and smart inhaler that is also helping to recognize and avoid asthma triggers. And finally, we heard it from Ericsson, I think, in predicting maintenance of machine before they break down. So we will now listen to Jose, who leads uh, oncology R&D. He will exemplify and describe how we work with, to improve patient lives by early detection and personalized treatment. We are convinced that together we can save and improve patient lives, and increasingly so before the patient even considers themselves to be one. With that, I thank you for joining and see you in the panel discussion. Now, please run the clip with Jose. Pues bien, yo creo que estamos en un momento en que estamos a las puertas también de la cuarta revolución en lo que se refiere a asistencia sanitaria. Todo empezó hace siglos con el concepto de que el médico iba al domicilio. Mi abuelo era un médico de polo, iba al domicilio para todo, para partos, facturas, para lo que ustedes quieran. La medicina avanzó muchísimo cuando pudimos empezar a proporcionar asistencia de calidad en centros hospitalarios, el nacimiento de, las, de, de la radiología, de, de, de las pruebas diagnósticas, laboratorios, la posibilidad de dar tratamientos intravenosos con antibióticos, esto cambió y mejoró en lo que, será, en lo que fue la tercera revolución industrial cuando pudimos ofrecer tratamiento especializado. Yo mismo trabajé durante muchos años en hospitales que lo único que hacían era tratar a pacientes con cáncer. Y finalmente entramos en la cuarta revolución, que es la vuelta al principio. El paciente vuelve a estar en su casa. El tratamiento y el manejo médico de cualquier paciente se realiza en el entorno donde el paciente vive y donde el paciente uh, realiza sus actividades. Esto es una revolución porque además se hace con mayor calidad. Es el momento de ofrecer soluciones que son uh, centradas en pacientes, soluciones remotas, soluciones que permiten el controlar la situación de salud a tiempo real. Es lo que nos va a dar la tecnología digital, la inteligencia artificial y uh, la capacidad de tener algoritmos que nos den predicciones muy precisas. Y lo que quiero proponer es que la cuarta revolución ya está pasando. En el caso del cáncer, estamos diagnosticando pacientes de manera muy precoz y hay tecnologías como las biopsias líquidas que nos van a permitir que pacientes sean diagnosticados antes de que tengamos síntomas o de que tengamos uh, evidencia de cáncer por escáneres. 
y esto nos va a llevar a un número de curaciones mucho más alta. Vamos a poder tener la capacidad de hacer tratamientos individualizados. No hay dos cánceres iguales, no hay dos pacientes iguales y no hay ningún motivo porque tengamos que tener dos tratamientos iguales para nadie. Vamos a llegar a esta fase y finalmente vamos a monitorizar los pacientes de un modo continuado. Sabremos día a día lo que está pasando con la enfermedad. Sabremos si la enfermedad da síntomas que son preocupantes o síntomas esperanzadores. Podemos ver si hay que escalar el tratamiento o hay que parar. Este concepto de monitorización continua de la salud y de la enfermedad va también a cambiar radicalmente la esperanza de vida. Thank you for that, Peter. You clearly have a very important role in the big organization to capture that data and AI opportunities. And then I'm happy to hear that collaboration is a key in your organization because being big is also uh, simultaneous being humble to the world. And then that is very important for the, the forthcoming successes. Um, going from big to something that is growing very quickly, I'm happy to present our next speaker. That is uh, Min Hong Yang, the co-founder and chief business officer officer of the South Korean healthcare startup called Lunit. It's especially exciting with the Korean perspective on this topic as South Korea was the first country to implement a, a specific regulatory guidelines for digital health solutions. So um, Min Hong is uh, in charge of the business development for radiology products. And previously he was devised online business strategies and analyzed customer behavior in the home health department at InBody, the world leader in body composition technology. Min Hong is a graduate from Korean Advanced Institute of Science and Technology and will share the experiences about how Lunit grew from an idea to a successful South Korean startup, uh, providing novel AI-powered solutions for cancer diagnostics and therapeutics. Min Hong, I'm very happy to have you here, and stage is yours. Okay, uh, thank you very much for your kind introduction, Magnus. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, so, okay, hi everyone. My name is Min Hong, uh, co-founder and chief business officer of Lunit. Before we get started, I would like to thank Sweden Innovation Days team for giving me this opportunity to share our journey. Luni actually has a deep relationship with Sweden. Uh, in August, Kaolinska Institute in Sweden published a paper in the JAMA Oncology, which compared the performance of radiologists and three different AI solutions for detecting cancer, breast cancer, including our solution. And Luni's algorithm was proven to be the best. So uh, today I'd like to share uh, with you all how we built our AI powered solution in South Korea and how we are actually selling our product worldwide. I organized in my presentation based on the order in which our solutions were developed. So I will talk about how we collected medical data for development, how we worked with government agencies to get approval as a medical solution or devices. And finally, how we successfully started to commercialize our solution. So Luni is a well-established startup company based in South Korea. Founded in 2013, we have raised over 50 million US dollars so far from remarkable investors from Korea, Japan, China, and the United States. We have over 130 employees and a branch in Boston, Amsterdam, and Shanghai. We are especially focused on conquering cancer, one of the leading cause of death worldwide with AI technology. We are developing two main products in our lineup, the Luna Insight diagnosis cancer early in patients by analyzing screening modality images such as chest x-rays or mammogram images. We are also developing Luna Scope, a uh, therapeutic biomarkers that predicts treatment outcomes for cancer patients. Luna's co-founders are deep learning specialists. Our technology has proven itself in multiple deep learning challenges where it has beaten entries from prestigious companies such as Google, IBM, and Microsoft. And Luna has been selected as one of the top 100 AI startups by CB Insights and was included in the Technology Pioneers 2020 
by the World Economic Forum. While we have cutting edge deep learning technology, it is actually meaningless without data from hospitals and medical institutions. So let's talk about how we leverage it, Korea's unique healthcare system. Let's take a look at the two tables uh, about the uh, top five hospitals in Korea uh, and, and US. The, they're the largest hospitals in the US and Korea. As you can see here, the top five hospitals in Korea have more number of beds than the US hospitals. In addition, more than 40% of can cancer patients have surgeries in those hospitals very, very concentrated, and they are all located in Seoul city, same city. And under the universal insurance system, there are a huge amount of data in, in Korea healthcare system. Korea's population is close to 50 million, and we take more than 40 million chest x-rays and 4.5 mammogram, million mammograms annually. The average, average outpatient visit to doctors by Korean patients was 16.6 .6 visits a year, is actually 2.3 2 times higher than that of the OECD's average of 7.1. However, it, it, it was not easy to convince doctors to co cooperate because they did not believe in the power of AI. And AlphaGo came to Korea in March 2016. It was a great event that caught the attention of the whole nation. People talked about this event everywhere during the week. It also changed doctors' mind about AI. Doctors started to paying attention to the power of AI. Then we started recruiting in-house medical doctors, and there are currently a total of seven doctors, including radiologists, oncologists, and pathologists. And we assumed that the trust in our solutions from doctors was the most important factor for success. To build that trust in the medical society, we have published more than 40 papers or abstract in prestigious med medical journals such as JAMA Oncology and the uh, Lancet Digital Health. Uh, we earned doctor's trust, but regulatory approval was the next step. Fortunately, the Ministry of Food and Drug Safety in Korea has supported the development of AI medical devices through initiatives such as creating a proactive regulatory environment. We also helped publish the world's first guideline on the approval of AI medical devices in 2017 by working with the MFDS and various stakeholders in a monthly committee meeting. And recently, MFDS was elected as the uh, inaugural chair of an international organization's working group on AI medical devices. After Korean FDA approval, we received CE certificate and started commercialized the solution from late 2019. Our key winning strategy to scale out is having partnerships with major vendors. Lunit started uh, to have partnerships with GE Healthcare, Fujifilm, Philips, and so on. They have more than 50% of market share in medical device and packs industry, and another partnership is underway. So Luna is working with those vendors to integrate our solutions into their devices or platform. And our solution can help clinicians read more efficiently, improve clinicians' workflow, and provide a more native reading experience. So we have more than 160 pain customers actually using our solution, like pain customers, and more than 5 million images have been analyzed on our platform. With users in countries such as Italy, France, Portugal, Brazil, South Korea, et cetera, et cetera. Lunit seeks to become a worldwide provider of AI solution. These countries are just the beginning as we have plans to enter many more markets internationally. Yeah, that will be the end of my presentation. Even though this is from a different country, I hope that our story has been helpful for all of you. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Min Hong Ming Hong. Absolutely of interest for, for all of us. And uh, I, I think I speak not only for Sweden, but also for the remaining part of the world. Uh, I'm, I'm very curious about the importance of the Ministry of Food and Drug Safety <clears throat> that you mentioned. And uh, maybe you can, what, what would the situation have been or how much have that helped you? 
Yeah, because there actually there is no uh, guideline or regulation uh, policy for AI-based uh, software. So they actually call, like gathered all the different stakeholders, like universities and government research centers and industry people like us. So we have like a monthly meeting, start from bottom, and we uh, build actually together that that policy and guideline, and we released it to the global level. So, yeah, that was very helpful. Yeah. When was that? Was that in time? Sorry for that question, but was it recently yeah. or? Yeah. Yeah, we we built uh, we released our guideline in 2017. And we revised it like uh, three times, and I think uh, we revealed the latest version in English and this month, I think. Yeah. Would you be stated so strongly the importance of this uh, um, this release of the safety document that it's a if before and after period when this is in place? Is it such a big difference for you be doing the business or? Yeah, uh, because uh, there was no guideline before, so we have to ask and directly asked to uh, like Korean FDA people. So it takes some time to get approval. But for now, if we build a new software, it's the, 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 the period to get approval is really shorter. And it's, yeah, that will be very helpful, yeah. Super. Min Yong, once again, very much thank you. And you will be also joining the yep. panel session afterwards. And I'm so happy to have you on board here, despite it's way past midnight in your time zone. It's OK. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, now our final speaker, Leif Nordlund, is leading the AI healthcare and life science research for NVIDIA in Nordics. Leif works with researchers, partners, and customers to accelerate artificial intelligence within the pharmaceutical, biotech, and healthcare industry and research. Leif is based in Stockholm, Sweden, uh, having a master's in computer science from Uppsala Uni University. And he will be talking about accelerating clinical decision making and drug discovery with the use of AI and share examples from the many projects that NVIDIA and its partners are working on. Leif, happy to have you on board. Welcome. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, I'll try to mix big and small today, as I think that has been a little bit of the theme today. Uh, of course, we are working on many groundbreaking projects with NVIDIA, but we're also working on uh, where to take these projects into the care system and to be practically using this. Uh, that's I think that's a combination that we are doing uh, to both target the really complex uh, projects, but also to be able to use this technology to be able to support a suffering uh, care system in different countries. So we've been doing uh, this technology now for 25 years at NVIDIA. The, the GPU was invented in 93, and then we have been sort of introducing it more and more to do advanced stuff. And it has been happening a lot of technology changes during the last uh, two years, actually. Um, one of the biggest things uh, in, in our approach is that we want to do what wasn't possible to do before. And we do that by inventing new technologies, both hardware and software. And we call this a full stack approach. So we want to make sure that there is a full portfolio of the software and hardware for our partners to use when they are, in, in their case, building the apparatus or building the algorithm to solve the most challenging scientific problems. We are today working about uh, with about 2.3 million developers all over the world. And uh, these are both, of course, researchers, but also commercial developers who are building solutions then to introduce into the, for example, the care system or in other industries. Um, What's happening and the trends that are happening right now is that using these technologies, we are more and more seeing uh, that we can use technologies both for uh, learning more about the human uh, body, the proteins, the details, the DNA, to pull together and look really in the depth how a, a human and our interaction with the nature around us is working. So that is one thing. That is what called the grand challenges. I'll be talking a little bit about those projects we are doing. Also, we'll talk a bit about the projects that we're doing, which are more in, in, in the care system. So it is more like, since we're coming from the graphical side with our GPUs, you know, to, 
to, to present to, this, to the doctors and to the other peoples in the system pictures of uh, ray, radiology pictures, pathology pictures, uh, DNA strings, etc. We are working a lot today to using AI to analyze these pictures and, and to introduce this kind of apparatus then in the care system together with our partners. And partners here can be both software vendors, but also vendors of these machines then. We mentioned a couple of names earlier today, like you know Siemens and such, who make these machines. So it is a complex ecosystem, and Vida is not working on this alone. We are working on it together with our partners and together with our 2.3 million developers all over the world. Um, some of the uh, really grand challenges we're working on, really complex stuff, I can mention there are some really interesting work going on. One is that we are working on generative models for de novo chemistry design. So actually designer drugs then that can, we can create new molecules that have never been uh, existing before using a chemistry and AI in combination. What we're also doing is multi-omics R&D. So that's combining different types of data so genetic data, phenotypes, uh, pathology data, uh, cell and how the cell is looking, cell imaging analysis, all of this um, combined. Uh, that wasn't possible to do by humans before because this data is extremely complex. So we're using AI algorithms to be able to analyze these very complex data sets in order then to really understand um, what we're dealing with here when it comes to diseases and also being able to work then in a proactive way that was mentioned today by EBBA, that we can actually target the, the lifestyle uh, if we know more about what is not good for us. Some other really large scale work we have been doing is of course quite recently related to the COVID. So we just uh, finalized a project called Deep Drive, Deep Drive MD. So basically what we did is that we gathered most of the GPUs we could find uh, of our technology and, and together they, they were used then to look at the complex structure of the COVID virus when it is infecting a human cell, how it is working using simulation technology together with AI technology and 20, 27,000 NVIDIA GPUs at the same time looking at this problem. And this research work has now been downloaded by more than 4,000 researchers all over the world, which where we are sharing this in this ecosystem to be able to find out, you know, if there's anything uh, that we can do in order to uh, look for a new cure, cure for this really. So that was some of the really big challenges that we are working on right now. Um, when it comes to the sort of, you know, the practicalities of using AI in the care system, we have a number of projects going on. Uh, one is the SMILE project at Karolinska in Stockholm which is basically a, a translation hub. So that's where the clinic, clinicians, the researchers and the students can come together and benefit from the collected competence in image analysis, visualization and quantification that we are doing there. And we are doing this together with the Karolinska and we are providing a platform uh, to get software and hardware for medical image workflows so that people can start using this then in their day-to-day -day research. Another uh, project we are working on locally here in Sweden is called ADA. So that's the Analytical Imaging Diagnostics Arena for Sweden. So it's a national arena, as the name says, and we're doing their research and innovation in medical image analysis. And this relates also to that the the, the images that we are working on is state of the art, the absolute latest type of image that you can get out of this advanced instrument that is coming from the other side of the industry and the, the companies like Siemens and Philips, which are making these machines. So in the AID arena, we, we collect um, in a safe way, real patient data from different of these state of the art uh, machines and analyze these and diagnose these either using AI algorithms. So very practically oriented uh, work we're doing there. 
Um, I don't know how many was listening also earlier today in the beginning of, of today's session where Sara Masu was describing the Berselia system. So that is another project we're doing here in Sweden. So the Berselia system is going to be the fastest supercomputer in Sweden. It's going to be located in Linköping. And it, it, its purpose is to advance the AI research in Sweden and to enable industry use of AI like in industries like pharmaceuticals, telecommunications, to enable breakthroughs in those industries using this kind of technologies. So compute does matter. And uh, we, we in, the, in, in a lot of these uh, projects, we are doing it in a combination of academia, industry, and our knowledge then, where we are transferring our knowledge to the researchers, to the academia, using different forms of transfer knowledge. One being that we have uh, AI algorithms and AI models, which can be um, transferred from NVIDIA into these ecosystems. Um, we are also, of course, then educating on what work we have done in our research. And, uh, and eventually this will lead to an even growing ecosystem then of people that understand large scale AI. So that's a lot of my purpose in life is to make sure that I can uh, make this uh, democratic model so that more people can can use AI technology and that is of course something that we are working together with a number of other organizations in Sweden uh, so Berselius is the WASP supercomputer uh, or at least funded partly by WASP which will be located then in the Linköping University to do this breakthrough research another computer that we are working on right now is called Cambridge One so that has been presented as well, and that's going to be one of the UK's absolute biggest supercomputers. And this is built by NVIDIA in order to do uh, more research for life sciences, healthcare, pharma, etc. So we are going to use this platform then to develop even new models, new AI models, new algorithms, which we can then transfer back into science uh, to benefit science and both in academia and in research in these companies. So this project is starting together with AstraZeneca and GSK and also Guys and St. Thomas's NSA's Foundation Trust, which is the basically the English healthcare systems uh, where, where they can have their funding model. Uh, and also a couple of customers to NVIDIA, which are uh, developing new uh, solutions for healthcare. One being King's College in London, and the other one is Oxford Nanopure, which is a company which is focusing entirely on DNA and DNA sequencing. Super so all in all, these are the number of the more in, uh, most interesting projects we are working on right now, I would say. And uh, I'm happy to share more details uh, with you, the community if there's interest in a specific project or in a specific technology. I'll be happy to do that. But uh, but for now, I'm going to keep it short so that I don't break anybody's time schedule. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Leif. Very interesting. And then it's uh, interesting to see how NVIDIA is actually making the platform for, for others to build and continue the, the forefront of the prevention and prediction work. Leif, stay tuned and stay here because right now we reached the, the stage of the panel discussion. So I'm happy to welcome back all of the presenters. So Marcus, Min Hong, Peter, Eba uh, and, and Leif all together. Um, I think it goes beyond saying that due to the pandemic situation, we are do, uh, occupy, situated in different studios. So I hope that we all can hear each other in a crisp and good uh, format without too much delay to uh, South Korea and Stockholm and, and other places. <clears throat> We have now seen a lot of, of ambitious and inspiring opportunities about how healthcare can be and are about to be transformed into the, uh, the more stronger focus on prevention instead of having the, the focus on mainly treating the symptoms. This is really a new land to conquer and, and we see that we all are trying to do our best. We're talking about platforms and data and strategies and startups and big companies and so on. Um, and we found out through these presentations that uh, equally there are ethical and humanitarian reasons for doing this job and also there are societal and then also financial reasons why we should push into this transformation in, and look into the prevention part of healthcare. 
So we started with you, Marcus, uh, about 50, 50 minutes ago, and, and uh, listening about the valuable insight from Region Halland, how you are shaping the future. And when you presented and, and talked about it, it, it sounded like a massive work that is ongoing like a train, that is uh, simple and quick-footed. But I do think that you've been through some, quite some, some struggles and hinders and, and uh, hurdles. So with all your experiences, what is the key point and, and what kind of hinders do you still foresee? Why is this transformation not going quicker than it is? Well, summarizing uh, five years of work into uh, eight minutes uh, makes things uh, appear uh, a bit simpler than they actually were. Uh, and um, I think the, the main challenges that we uh, faced during these, the five years of, of workup was actually uncertainty. Uh, legal uncertainties, a certainty about uh, financing, what we're doing, etc. So uncertainty is, is, uh, has been the main challenge. The left main challenge among all these challenge is probably still uncertainty. Uh, and at least in, in Europe, uh, the regulatory landscape is too unclear. And and, uh, and we are in in uh, intense contact with uh, the political level in in Sweden and in on the, in Europe on this because everyone knows what they cannot do, uh, but there is a difference between uh, not doing and doing in terms of clarity uh, on the European level at the moment and also on the national level, and and there is a mis mismatch right now. Uh, between uh, what we can do and 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 would like to do in terms of um, like saving lives and, and improving health, based on all the solutions that are wonderful and have been presented here during the last half hour, uh, and 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 what we what the restrictions are, and we we really need a clarification on that in in on the country level. Uh, and uh, so, so that's what we are working on right now to to be able to proceed more rapidly and, and faster. So, if that is the the remaining obstacle still, the the legal landscape and the uncertainty of that one, how have you been capable of of balancing that over the the five years? Yeah. So, so there is still a lot you risks or or yeah, there there's still a lot you can do within. The, uh, what is clear, uh, and I think uh, we are not using uh, the full boundaries as as already exists. So uh, your question why is why why weren't we going faster? Or aren't going faster? Well, that's because the boundaries are unclear. Uh, are unclear, but but within those boundaries, there is a lot of of uh, room for action, and that's mm -hmm. what we learned, and that's what we. Uh, used uh, to the full extent, extent uh, I believe, uh, thanks so, to our very proactive legal team. So still the uncertainty, you, you dare to take the risk and take action in different domains. Uh, Peter, Epa, Minghong and Leif, what is the situation on your side? Peter, yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's it's very true what you say, Marcus, because you can always push the boundary and you can use the collaboration that we've heard as a theme across this. You can connect up with the, the, the key parties that need to be involved and collaborate and drive together. I think that also links to the, the other aspect of how to get value out of this, which we heard in the discussion about supply and demand before. So I think value can be found and driven by the knowledge that exists in the intersection between healthcare, the business and AI. So that presents opportunity and requirements on decision making to, to actually go for it. And then the collaboration to, uh, to um, deliver on it. Could be top down with big hairy moonshot goals that we talked about earlier, or opportunity driven bottom up from the business, but making sure that you connect those uh, competencies um, and, and in, in that intersection, 
I think that unlocks the value. And then you solve for the hurdles uh, within the constraints and uh, over time push the constraints um, or the boundaries for uh, creating that clarity that you talked about, Marcus. Eva, please. Uh, talking about these boundaries, uh, it seems also that we are in a bit of a tipping point where our very large national projects actually start sharing data. For example, within the genomics medicine Sweden and the biobanking and our prevention of childhood obesity, it, it's not the boundaries anymore. It, it's really the, the doing of the sharing data and, and the potential of them doing the prediction on the data. So uh, I, I perceive that we have, um, our country is so small, I mean 10 million inhabitants, it's nothing, it's like a city. So, so we are getting there step by step in, in using the potential of the national data. Thank you, Ebba. Talking about being a small nation and, and uh, not even a city in a global perspective. Min Hong, listening into this situation that is described by Marcus and Pedro and, and Ebba, do you recognize a similar situation in, in uh, South Korea or have you taken further steps to allow digital health um, solutions? And how is the situation to get into data? Yeah, uh, definitely I agree with uh, your point, uh, Marcus, Peter, and Eva. And, uh, and we definitely include the same uh, situation. We actually didn't uh, export the data from hospitals, big hospitals, especially for university hospitals. They actually, uh, we approved by IRB, but they don't want to uh, get out the data from their hospitals. And it, we actually, uh, our privacy law, is revised to use that anonymized data like GDPR, but still they don't like it. They, like uh, their committee, they don't allow to uh, take out the data from the hospital. So we actually uh, built our room in the hospital. We dispatch our people to gathering data and uh, anonymize all the data and just extract the model. So like, as Marcus uh, mentioned, like federated, federated running or many other technology can solve that problem, but for efficient approach, we need to gather all the data in the one space, one location for like a faster learning, like a AI approach. And so when we implement our solution to the hospital, it's the same situation. We, we would like to recommend like cloud because like continuous machine learning, that's the strength of the AI, right? But big hospitals still hesitate to, to implement the AI solutions in the, in the cloud. They prefer like on-prem server, so it's similar. But I think it's uh, getting better, yeah, from in, in different countries, including Korea and, and other European countries. Yeah. And in Europe, to fill out on that, in Europe we are working a lot in Nvidia on the Monai project, which is an, oh. uh, a big federation of companies and research right. institutes that wants to solve exactly this problem. So uh, anybody that wants to see how we are working with federated learning with the industry, trying to set standards and so, can look into the Monai project. Leif, yeah. dwelling on that, um, we heard a little bit about the legal perspectives and the hinders and, and, and still finding opportunities in that. Do you see that in your perspective, such as, uh, as you are so close to the technology side, that technology itself plays a part to resolve these issues? Or can technology lower the bars and make things less hindersome uh, with small changes? Or, or how could technology play a part to make this happen quicker? I think there's two things we are working on which will help it. Uh, one is things like the Monai project where we are implementing technology that is sort of, you know, comes from a, a number of companies and also some uh, research organizations can put a stamp on it that it, this is actually a secure handling of data so that nobody is fearing that they will not give their data to the system due to the fear. Another one is, of course, to develop further technology of explainable AI that you can actually reason with algorithms so that you know how it sort of came to this diagnosis. You have to be able to track it back and avoid a black box concept. That's going to help us enormously as well. Hmm. So the explainable AI, I, I could see a lot of 
uh, head nodding. Um, Peter and Marcus and, and Ming Hong, are you waiting, expecting for that to come eagerly? Would that make a big change for you and how we can utilize data to predict the health situ situation? Well, I can start there. Trust in the models is key to uh, to deploy them in real world. Uh, you cannot get past that point. And that brings me to the question when a model is actually mature to be able to serve as a clinical decision support system. That's one of the unclear borders that we are handling right now. Uh, and hopefully the clarification from, from South Korea can, can guide Europe there maybe because uh, the discussion on the European level is nowhere to be found, unfortunately, uh, in that sense. We have the MDR uh, regulations coming up uh, and, and they're good, and but still they're very novel to us uh, and, and we, they have not been uh, applied in any way thus far. So we still have uncertainties to, uh, to handle, but bit by bit, uh, the awareness is there at least. So I, I'm sure that it will, will be resolved, but, but there will forego a, a thorough discussion before we feel really we have that kind of highway from idea into uh, application in, in the real world healthcare system, so. Thank you, Marcus. Peter. Yeah, just to build on that, that you know, we want to make sure that both man and machine live our values. And, and in order to do that, we put together data and AI ethics um, uh, and both principles and how we put them to practice. Explainability and transparency is, is a key piece of, of that. Um, but of course, you know, at the current situation, that's one of the examples that you need to do. You need to take charge and, and drive that yourself because it's it's not fully established across industry yet. But uh, I think it's it's absolutely essential in order to to dare go all in and, and really apply it across the, the chain. Talking about the chain and so on, there's a lot of things needing to be in the right position and spot to make this this thing happen and then, then we can easily talk about the system that this is all um, living inside and right now we're talking about bits and pieces of the system and um, the question is do we have the right system in place for capturing and allowing the, the power of AI in predicting models in connecting to health aspects. Eba, you, you have a great portfolio and a lot of work on this one. Do you see that the system is rightly tuned for the situation that we are getting into, or is there some change needed? Well, it's a very good question. And, and the thing is that um, we're sort of living in the 200-year-old perspective here when the surgeon is still the the star. Uh, and of course, with this uh, lifestyle challenges, uh, what really the, the consequences regarding diabetes type 2 and heart and cardiovascular diseases and cancer and, and what we're seeing now with COVID-19 as well, that the system in terms of incentives and payer models and business models and really where do we spend our AI resources and projects, there we, we, it's urgent we make a system transformation to really spend our AI resources and our projects and our, our computing capacity in, in the prediction and prevention. I would like to emphasize, of course, that we shall definitely uh, cure and do the diagnosis and treatment, no question about that. But we should really prevent what, what can be prevented. And obviously there is so much that can be prevented. And then as well, it can really be precision medicine because then we really know why it's coming into the ill part uh, if we have prevented what can be prevented. So the system, the system is uh, need, in urgent need of a system transformation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, absolutely, and, and that's something that this this um, 
uh, topic is really depending on like, the, the importance of the person that is pushing through the boundaries. And you, you guys are really the, the, in the forefront and then good ambassadors of doing that work. So, so my big applaud to you. Before we close this session, I have a final question to you. We've talked about hinder and the system change and things that are needed and then the, the, the obstacle of the legal system. But when ev all of that is in place, what is the one single best opportunity that is uh, released then by AI in prediction and preventing? So what is the best thing to come that you see with releasing AI in the prediction models? Marcus, would you like to go first? Going from descriptive to predictive and further on to prescriptive care. And that means tailoring care on the individual level uh, as opposed to treating patients on the group level that we are used to. So uh, going into precision medicine and precision healthcare, that's where we need to go in order to face the challenges driven by the demographic transition and others. Thank you. And a final word for another one. We are running out of time. So I'm... One more person that can do the, the, the pitch of the best to come. I can just agree with Marcus, going from really not only precision medicine, but really precision health and also health. Super. And with that, I'm so happy to share this session together with you in great um, um, uh, stories that you've released and then let us all take part of. And um, by that, I say thank you to the panel and thank you to all people listening. It's us together that is transforming healthcare. And by that, now over to the Stockholm studio. Thank you. Thank you, Gothenburg. AI clearly has a role to play in transforming healthcare. And now on to track five, which is AI for sustainability and climate change. Maybe the universe has a rescue plan for us. Maybe it's a lucky coincidence, a very lucky coincidence. Either way, I thank the stars that the power of artificial intelligence surges five to midnight on the eve of a potential climate and planetary collapse. To echo our young climate activist, Greta, we shouldn't be having this conversation. Above and uh, beyond the fact that climate change is scary and deeply existential, it's embarrassing that we've put ourselves in this situation after centuries of ruthless overusing the resources and decades of knowing about it. As we speed towards the cliff, the power of AI might be able to play a role to help us recalibre strategies, recoup carbon dioxide and readjust to a new world order. Fossil free. So hail the power of innovation. And let's kick off this track with the Stockholm Resilience Centre. Deputy Director, Associate Professor Victor Gallus knows better than anyone that the clock is ticking. Thank you. Victor, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for that nice introduction and, and congratulations for a marvellous programme. I mean, what, a, what an amazing lineup. Um, I, I don't have uh, a lot of images and I can't share them now, but that doesn't matter, so I'll do it without slides. I, I think the most important thing for me at the moment, listening to these discussions, and you already mentioned AI and climate change and, and fossil free, is to think about how the climate challenge is so connected to the living planet. So the forests, the oceans, agriculture, and all the other systems where, where we as humans depend on, on, uh, for our world, well-being. We should remember that the pandemic that we're trying to cope with at the moment with such big, big impacts on, on our planet and our people is the result of not, not only a globalized society, uh, but also the fact that we haven't managed the living planet in a good way. Deforestation, in, in intensified agriculture, etc. So I think to me, one of the key messages whenever we talk about AI and the climate challenge is first of all, the sense of urgency. There is an urgency to act or we need to act quickly. But the other aspect of it is direction to make sure that the innovation that we drive through AI has the proper framing and direction. To me, that is key. Another aspect that I find increasingly important and, and that people have, have raised numerous, numerous times is the role of diversity and the role that diverse knowledge systems play 
I mean, just when we talk about applications of AI for any issue, whether it's health issues or, or social issues, that you need domain expertise and you need a diversity of, of knowledge that cont contributes to this challenge. Uh, you need to make sure that your AI systems, wherever you apply them, whether it's in, in farming or, or for the climate challenge or forestry, nurtures and build on diversity and doesn't create bigger vulnerabilities as we move into a more turbulent future. So diversity. And the last point that I think is critical, critical for whatever innovation we talk about and becomes increasingly important when we talk about AI is distribution. The distributional impacts of the AI revolution. How do we make sure that the systems that we design to be able to cope and, and navigate the climate challenge doesn't create negative impacts on the most vulnerable? And to put it a different way, how do we make sure that those innovations actually contribute to the agenda 2030 uh, resolve po serious poverty issues and make sure that we, we hear the voices of the most vulnerable as tech development continues to develop. So AI has a big potential for the climate challenge if we are open to acknowledge these four in ingredients, I believe. It, it is about urgency, direction, distribution, and diversity. And with those four things together, there's a massive, massive potential that's not quantifiable, but that's also what's so exciting with this. Uh, to, to really tap into the, the power of that development. Thank you. Thank you, Victor, and thank you for sharing your thoughts. And I think uh, we will address that later uh, in the panel discussion, which is both climate change and artificial intelligence, but also making sure that we address social inequality, so the full uh, uh, 2030 uh, agenda. Moving swiftly on, we can't talk about fossil-free welfare states without addressing emissions. And we can't talk about emissions uh, and sustainability without talking about the tools to uh, measure impact. And that's easy to say, and it's harder to do. And I'd like to welcome Dennis Pamlin, the senior advisor at RISE, and you will tell us about uh, the emissions framework that you guys have uh, developed and why it's important. Over to you. Sorry, I lost you there. Did I? Dennis, can you hear us? Sorry, I lost you there for a second. Yeah. Yes, now I hear you. Thanks. Dennis, you have a uh, phone yeah. Tell us. Thanks. Yes, uh, I do. Can you see my screen? So I'm going to be quite frank here and open. I think we can have a good. I can echo what Victor was saying that this is an interesting lineup, etc. But I think we also need to be very frank about the challenges we have here now um, and the fact that we are basically having AI as part of the problem today uh, rather than part of the solution. So let me just show the slides here on um, running and it has measurable negative con uh, contributions today and it can have measurable positive contributions tomorrow. So I'm leading a project that was launched in Paris that is really about taking the next generation of solution to market. And we see primarily today AI as a problem, uh, but as a huge potential here. Uh, and let me just explain that because we have seen that Sweden already have a gigaton of solutions ready to be exported and implemented on a sort of a startup scale. But AI is largely making those invisible or making it harder for this new solution to reach markets. And the reason is that the current AI focus is adding a new smart tool into an old system. So we're basically having this idea that we are optimizing things. We are making things better in minds. We are making distribution slightly less inefficient. But that is not where sustainability lies. That is in the disruptions of today. And very few AI systems are helping with that sustainable transformation. They are stuck in optimization of the old system. And that is linked to the second part. The AI focus is on the big polluters very much today when we talk about climate. It's about how they make it slightly less bad. But it's very seldom that we see AI really putting forward the next generation of solutions. So, and this is sort of a framework that we have to sort of, <laughs> in, in a small set of solutions, we saw that 100% of the AI solutions that was uh, suggested was focusing on the problems, just making the problems less bad not putting solutions in, in place. 
And this is really uh, the fundamental challenge is that AI scientists and products, they love big data, quality data, but those are rarely available for where we really need them, for where transformation is needed. So when you tweak a system, usually a lot of data is available, but when you transform a system, that's less data availability. And also, we want large sets of data, and that usually go back into history, the unsustainable area, rather than in the future. So we have some fundamental challenges for AI. And if we, if we change AI to statistical assessments, then I think people would be more aware of the challenge of where data is coming from and how we assess that. So just to take two examples, strategies today are sometimes using AI based on ideas on how the new solutions are linear or not really successful. This is the International Energy Agency. You, their data sets are often used when you use energy projections. And they have been fundamentally wrong about the future of solar, for instance. So by using AI, we get strategies that are bad. But also within companies, they use AI, and many AI scientists and AI consultants, they want to show rapid return on investments. And that means optimization of system, quick things up there. And that means that McKinsey can see there's 50 billions in the oil industry to have them more efficient. But they need to discuss transformations. So AI is part both of the problem with strategies and investments. But we can solve this. We can say make sure that Sweden at least link all major AI initiatives to strategic 1.5 low energy demand compatible initiatives. In Sweden, we don't really understand that many of us. We think that all emission reductions are good. And then we need to make sure that we identify and tag data based on needs, not the old products. That will allow the new solutions to enter to the market instead of being shut out. And we need to have a tracking system, and I think Sweden can be the leader here, to balance between AI initiatives and tools in support for transformative innovation and global sustainability and those that optimize existing systems. And I want to stress, it's not bad to optimize always, but what we have now is a lock-in system. And then finally, I think the real exciting thing is to be part of the next generation of infrastructure creation. The roads, everything we have around us is nothing compared to the AI structure we see being born now. And how do we develop best practice for how we gather, tagging, everything and using sensors and questionnaires that is based on allowing new solutions instead of optimization? How do we have open data training set for global sustainability? Those require open and uh, free access because many of the new startups and the new people within companies who want to push the agenda, they don't have the budgets that the old unsustainable uh, stakeholders have. And we need to establish a review and evaluation for the AI with a global sustainability compatibility filter. So there are tools here to be developed. We shouldn't just look at the individual AI projects, but also the underlying structure. That's all for me, thanks. Thank you, Dennis. We hear you loud and clear. End of tweaks and time for transformation. And we need to put this within a framework, and Sweden has a solution for that. And I hope you adhere to the previous speakers. It's all about collaboration and together, and this is something that we will share. Onwards. Yeah, sorry, can I just add on that? Because it's so important that we, when we talk about who do we invite, because we tend to invite the old sectors, not the new sector. So collaboration is a buzzword. We need to be much more specific on what we mean by that, because Sweden is a lot about talk, not so much about action. Sorry for interfering, but Thank it's so you. important. It's so important. So thank you for sharing that, Dennis. I think progress is made where all aspects of society toe the line. So the grassroots push and our leaders set the pace by the power of example and relative responsibility. Market leaders in all sectors have a huge opportunity to trail trailblaze and therefore it's very exciting to welcome the AI team of H&M to talk about how technology is an integral part of reaching our sustainability goals. So welcome. With us we have Linda Leopold and you are the Head of Responsible Data and AI and Arti Seghami. Did I pronounce that correctly? That was great. Close enough that means. Uh, and you are the Global Head of AI Analytics and Data at H&M. That's correct as well. <laughs> Linda, let's start with you. Let's uh, put this in context. What does the sustainability goals mean for H&M? Well, first, I mean, climate change is a huge challenge for many industries, including fashion. So we need to transform the way we produce and consume fashion today to be able to reduce our uh, emissions. 
And uh, at the HM Group, we have an ambition to become fully circular and climate positive. So we have set goals to only use recycled and sustainably sourced materials by 2030 and to have a climate positive value chain by 2040. And that means the whole value chain from the cotton farms to our customers' washing machines. And of course, innovation will be key. Innovation and to have sustainability at the core of the business. Those are the key elements. And uh, speaking of AI, we really believe that AI will be a key technology to reach these goals. Which is a beautiful segment to you, Arti, who heads up the AI. How does AI play a role in uh, achieving these goals? So AI is a, an amazing tool to have a sustainable decision making in the entire value chain. And looking at how we implement AI, it is in the entire value chain. You look at it from the start, where fashion forecasting or, or you know, understanding how many pieces you're going to buy of certain product to certain market or how we allocate them. All of that is different part of the integral part of a value chain. And you know, AI makes us be more precise to understand how we're going to utilize things, how we're going to make sure that we you know, make that demand and supply to fit together. And it also fits very well for our customers. And, the central part of a circularity is about avoiding overproduction. So understanding how we can calculate and make sure that we have right amount of garment for right amount of time in the right amount of you know, market at the right moment for the right customer, that ensures that we can reach that. So we not only that we're not utilizing the resources in the wrong way, but we also ensure that we don't over transport, you know, over warehouse things, utilizing the, uh, too much energy and all that. So it's in totality, it's a great win-win solution, both for us, but also for our customers. H&M Group have always looked at meaningful growth as a key element of its growth. It's about happy planet, it's about happy customers, it's about happy colleagues. That will give you good money. So that's the important part of it. AI is an amazing tool for us to reach those goals. And of course, to reach our sustainability goals. And I'm assuming you're using AI for all this, uh, uh, reducing all this over, over, over that you mentioned. Could you give us a specific e example? So, as I mentioned, you know, quantification is a very great example of that. You know, in, we need to understand how many, how many pieces of a garment you're going to buy for certain markets, and that could differ depending on the demand of the market, the demand of the store, how the, you know, the, how the market constitutes, what are the interests at all, what are the fashion in that market. All those things are, in, you know, different signals that we can bring in to understand because it's not a one size fit all. And looking at globally how, how the market looks like, everything is changing. And it's not that one, you know, back in days, maybe we could dictate fashion in a different way. Today is different. All the kids have access to the fashion in different ways. They have these, their phones and they look at all the influencers. You, we need to be more precise and we need to be on top of that. And that's how AI helps us to be more precise in that decision making. It's super exciting. And uh, Linda, as Victor was mentioning, uh, sustainability is not only about climate, it's also about uh, ethical and um, uh, social uh, sustainability. How is the H&M thinking about that? Yeah, definitely. So the area that we call responsible AI, uh, the mission there is really twofold. So we want to use AI to do good and to reach our sustainability goals. But then we also are, want to work actively to prevent causing any unintentional harm when we are working with AI solutions. So th it's that twofold goal, goal of do good and do no harm at the same time. And all this sounds great, uh, but how do you make it work in practice? How do you build a team around it? Because ultimately your core is fashion and not necessarily climate change. How do you make this work? How do you make people run in this direction? So in the, in the, in the essence, this is not a technology thing. We usually talk about this 10% AI, is 20% tech, is 70% people and processes. You need to shift people's mindsets in the business operation to think differently, ask different questions. On a Monday morning, they come to the office, they're going to ask different questions around, around what they want to do with their business, what they want to do with the operations. And that mindset shift is about changing and transforming the people. So we work a lot on the transformation. We have looked at it holistically to the, on the totality. It's about, that is also why we address the entire value chain. A lot of companies look at one part of it, the UAI, they do customer facing stuff, fun, fancy, sexy apps, and that's really cool but it doesn't impact the totality. And we need to look at the totality. That's why we look at all over the place. And we usually internally, we don't call it AI as artificial intelligence. We call it amplified intelligence. Because what we're doing, we amplify an existing competence of our colleagues to make better decisions. And that's super important because that's exactly what the transformation is about. People transformation, mindset transformation, not much AI. <laughs> that's a great tweet. So this is not about AI. Uh, but to give us a sense of, because I assume 
there's different parts of this smorgasbord that is pulling, but could you give us a feel for where it comes from grassroots, internally inside, from your customers, from above? How does all this play into I think strategy it, in the movement. Yeah, it, it, as a, yeah, it is holistically. It has to come from all over the place. You have to look at the, what the customer wants. You need to look at the business. You need to get the people, look at the people inside it because you need to, as I said, move and change, shift the mindset of the, our operations, the people in the store, the people in the design teams, in the, wherever you look at. This is also why we address the own entire value chain to change the mindset of each of the people. And it, it, it expands more than just sustainability. It also expands the areas that Linda was talking about around ethics, around the responsibility. Do we do good? We do no harm. We need to understand the data because the data that's out there is our own data. It's my kids' data. It's, you know, we need to be, be careful about that. It's not GDPR. It's about creating those relationships. And that is super important for us. A company with huge amount of values, long-term relationship with our customer and meaningful growth as the core of it. So AI is in everything and everything is not AI. <laughs> <laughs> The and Linda is making a very important part of that, working with the ethical side of it. That's super, super important. Yeah, and I your customers understand that. They know. Yeah, th I mean, they, they do, and that's a really important transparency. That's one of the core values for our work with responsible AI. But I want, want to get back to what Artie said about creating this culture, and it's all about people. And I really believe in creating a culture of responsible AI, because we can have all these assessment tools, principles, etc. But you really need to get people talking about the ethical questions and to really make it top of mind for the people who are working with our AI products. That's so important. I've heard that you have AI debates internally. Is that true? That's true. That's one of the tools we have to, to make it top of mind. I mean, AI and ethics, that's, it's a very abstract topic. So how do you make this super abstract topic more tangible and easier to relate to. Um, that's why we created this debate club. So we let our colleagues debate fictional ethical dilemmas. It's like almost like mini science fiction stories, scenarios that could potentially arise in the fashion industry today or in the near future. And they are giving an assigned standpoint that they have to argue for, no matter what they think themselves. That's fantastic. I look forward to maybe when you one day publish these, just to get a feel for how the brains inside H&M reflect um, on these topics. This is an important point. What, what, what Linda is doing is amazing because it's about intervening what happens here in a programmer and what happens there. How do you intervene before that happens to make sure, are we thinking about this in an ethical way or not? That's not easy. Mm -hmm. That's shifting our mindset. Thank you. Thank you guys for being a market leader and taking your responsibility uh, within the fashion sector. Thank Thanks you for having for us here. for having us. Thank you. So two more talks on this track. And the first is Johan Granström, who is Partnership and Business Development Manager at ABB Sweden's Industrial Automation Division. Johan focuses on making cities and energy systems smarter, greener, by utilizing the potential in digital technologies, people, and partnerships. It's all about optimizing energy use and surveillance. Johan, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Uh, uh, Thank you so far for, uh, for a wonderful event. Um, I just want to start with talking, uh, just agreeing with the previous speakers that AI isn't really the big thing about technology. It's really about transformation and it's about amplifying people. But it's interesting to find what we actually can do with the technology. Did you know that 64% of global energy consumption and 70% of the global CO2 emissions are happening in our cities? As you heard uh, in the introduction, my name is Johan Granström and I, I work a lot with making cities and energy systems smarter and greener. And from my, my point of view, we need a holistic approach rather than only innovating in the verticals. And you know, access to clean energy is fundamental for the creation of sustainable cities, but it's also an enable for most other sectors to SDGs and fight climate change. Recent technology and price development, along with regulatory and policy changes, creates new opportunities as well as challenges. And they are kind of all included in, in four major trends. The first trend is about the rise of rene renewables, such as solar and wind power. But it makes the energy supply more weather dependent, meaning that supply and demand won't be balanced, which is why we also see an increasing deployment of energy storage. It also means that a growing share of the power generation is actually hap happening distributed in the grid rather than at a centralized power plant. 
creating bi-directional energy flows and makes it much more difficult to plan and dispatch power. The second big trend about electric vehicles, the electrification of transport and mobility grows exponentially right now, which is great for sustainability, but does indeed offer challenges such as capacity issues and peak loads, especially in urban areas where when people get home from work and like to charge a car, shower and cook dinner. The third one is about a general electrification trend in the industry, as well as the birth of new quite energy intense industries such as battery factories and, and data centers. And the last one is about that the conventional supply and demand chain is kind of transforming into an ecosystem of energy, creating a demand for smart and autonomous solutions to coordinate and optimize all distributed assets such as generation, energy storages, and flexible demands. To address this, we have worked a lot with developing a platform which pretty much is a solution to connect assets, aggregate data, and optimize the energy system in real time based on data and predictions to reduce energy costs, to shave power peaks, but most importantly, to minimize the CO2 footprint. And this comes in kind of three different flavors. One that is addressing smart charging for electrical vehicle fleets. We work with industry sites and commercial buildings, as well as my favorite, virtual power plants. That is really about managing a city or a region-wide network of distributed assets, such as EV fleets, industrial sites, commercials, buildings, and so on, to enable dispatchable renewable power, flexibility, and ancillary services. As a part of that platform, AI will play a main role in understanding and predicting the complexity, the dynamics, and the flexibility of a distributed, low carbon and renewable energy landscape we are aiming for. And one project I actually would like to mention is one in northern Sweden. In Skellefteå, north from the Northvolt F battery factory, we are developing the future of energy management together with Skellefteå Kraft and other parties. Um, in Sara Culture House, which is a beautiful 20 floor tall wooden building, which holds an hotel and hub for art, concerts, and congresses, as well as the public library, we are adding a new level of intelligence together. We are connecting and aggregating data from all the assets, such as the electrical equipment, the heating, energy storage systems, solar power, power and all that and combining that with advanced predictions to be able to optimize the energy flows and control the assets to minimize the CO2 footprint. Because a conventional way of including a building into an energy system is pretty much to add a grid connection big enough to match the demand, right? And in some cases, you actually add a layer of smart switch to automate some functions in a building. But in this project, we are taking it to the next level by making the building an asset for the city. By utilizing AI, we can better predict the characteristics, the behavior, and the energy need for the rest of the system when it comes to supply as well as demand and control all assets based on that. We have also opened up for AI experts to build value-adding applications that we can use to make even better optimizations. One example is actually the Swedish-based startup called Greenlytics, who has developed an application to predict solar energy generation based on a number of weather forecasts and the building solar system setup. And to sum up, the energy landscape needs to transform into a collaborative ecosystem, which is sustainable, connected, and powered by AI. So let's write the future of energy together. Thank you so much. Thank you, Johan. Let's rewrite the energy history together. Hear, hear. And last but definitely not least, it's an honor to introduce Shilpa Kolhatkar, the global business development leader at Nivida, who will talk to us about how technology can support the global fight to keep the planet under one and a half degree target. Technology alone will not be enough to save us, but as we've heard today, it has a part to play. The floor is yours. Perfect. Thank you so much, Aurora. All right. So, um, hello, everybody. It's been such a fantastic um, track so far, listening to all of our esteemed speakers. Um, and my favorite definition of sustainability is really how efficiently um, the systems are working for the people 
and also how well they are working for the environment. Um, so now is really the perfect storm, I think, for using AI as the transformational tool um, to help achieve sustainability goals towards a cleaner, greener, uh, a healthier planet. And um, as Victor and others have indicated earlier, um, successful AI is collaborative. It's inclusive, it's diverse by nature, right? Because that's where the true success lies is in using multiple data sets from different entities so that more meaningful decisions uh, can be drawn through a combination of different data sets. So now is really the perfect time for using AI because of three things coming together. Loads and loads of data that is being generated by people by devices, combined with the availability of supercomputers, um, that's where NVIDIA comes in, and um, uh, the, the, the availability of and maturity of AI algorithms uh, that have been in development over the past several decades, because AI is not, you know, is not new, as you know. So here at NVIDIA, we are very proud today as our new NVIDIA DGX supercomputer uh, that's located in our headquarters here in California. Uh, has been announced as the most energy efficient AI supercomputer on the earth. And um, as nations become AI nations, cities become smart cities and scale their domestic AI infrastructure, there are implications for the environment. So having this power efficient infrastructure, power efficient supercomputer is really a huge step towards sustainability goals. And if you think about it, AI provides outcomes in um, two steps. First, it's use of AI to learn more about how people are using the resources, the water, land, oceans, um, and to sift through tons of data and look at trends and patterns in that data, right? So measuring it. And the second step is using AI to then improve and uh, you know, optimize these assets. Um, such as robots to selectively go and apply pesticide or fertilizer or selectively water farms. So let me give you a few examples. Uh, there's a lot of sensors gathering data on weather, wind, um, road surface temperature and conditions, um, air and water quality, vehicle traffic, and so on. Digital Twin is a tool where you feed in all this data inside of a supercomputer in a virtual environment and describe its physical counterpart. And once you've done that, once you've created a digital twin of the corresponding physical space, maybe it's the ocean, maybe it's a city, you then create models and simulations to see effect of um, changes in some of the parameters. Um, you know, there's no way in the real world to try to um, experiment with different types or levels of pollutants in the ocean, for example, that affect the ecosystem. But in a digital twin, you can, and you can very speedily do millions of permutations and combinations to see the impacts very quickly by varying these parameters. The so Virtual Singapore is an initiative by the Singapore government, which they have created a digital twin of the city um, using simulations and models in the digital world first for the purposes of urban planning, and then make those implementation decisions um, for the real world. Another important sustainability example is one which Johan talked about around clean renewable energy. Cities, as you can imagine, are looking for creative ways to help the smart, smart energy initiative. And that's where machine learning is being used today. Machine learning to forecast availability of renewable energy sources like it's wind or solar through predictive modeling. It's also being used to analyze usage pattern of people, of factories, of, of businesses. Combine that with forecasts. Um, so you may be part of rush hour rewards. We have something like that here with our energy company. It's an incentive where you earn rewards for saving energy during the peak demand periods. So smart thermostat automatically tunes the temperature based on certain time blocks during the day so that it's not drawing as much from the grid. And when this is done across tens of thousands of homes, it helps the city tremendously by stabilizing and load balancing between the traditional grid and the renewable sources and even uh, preventing rolling blackouts. Another example of uh, AI for sustainability is one where NVIDIA actually plays a very big role in is autonomous vehicles. Our friends mentioned that earlier. 
Um, so autonomous vehicles, AI guided AVs will be helping mobility on demand um, over the next coming years, decades, we are all gonna see that. And that will lead to substantial greenhouse gas reductions for, for in the urban transportation space because of use of computer vision um, for traffic optimization, for route optimization, for uh, platooning of cars um, to roads and traffics, thereby improving the road capacity and also autonomous ride sharing services so that people are using the common pool of cars and vehicles out on the roads. And uh, one last example uh, is um, AI for sustainability in agriculture. Um, as you can imagine, um, computer vision, um, you know, it's very, very powerful. Um, and it's currently being used by some of our partners who've developed um, robots. Uh, Agrobot is one such partner. And this, it's a harvester. It's a harvester robot which goes and inspects whether a strawberry is, is the best time to pick a strawberry, whether it's ripe to be picked. John Deere uses computer vision for selective application of pesticide only to the impacted areas. In another example, satellite data is used with so satellite images and soil sensor information is being combined and is used to plan the watering needs and the application of fertilizer. Um, so in computer vision, when spots of green are visible in a, a space between the crop rows, then that's when the AI knows that it's likely a weed. So these types of techniques yeah, really I'm so help. Sorry that I have to break you off here. Okay, no worries. That was kind of my last example and uh, over to you. Thank you so much. And clearly we need much more time to address the in-depth details of these things. But thank you for sharing the overview. And I think this track has demonstrated that um, as Victor said, we need a sense of urgency. Climate change is real. It's deeply existential. Uh, and the speakers today have addressed both the technology that we have and that we need to develop. But basically, what I learned today is we have most of the technology. Now it's a question of what Artie said, a mindset. We need to create the change, the movement forward and address these things. Within the framework uh, that Dennis spoke about, use, using people and also never forgetting the social inequalities to make this happen as, as Lin, Linda mentioned as well. It's complex and we can't set a detailed plan. We don't know the outcome. We need a visionary leadership that just as Doug Hammarskjöld said uh, in the outset of today is the eye fixed on the horizon and iterate. Thank you for uh, joining us all today on the climate change track. And I'd like to now hand over to our colleagues in Gothenburg. And Sophie van der Steen, over to you, track five. Tomorrow's mobility. Directly here from Lindholm Science Park and the session on tomorrow's mobility. My name is Sophie Wennerstein and I'm the program director for Drive Sweden, which is the strategic uh, innovation program, uh, one of Sweden's 17 actually, uh, strategic innovation programs uh, funded by Vinova, uh, Swedish Energy Agency and uh, Formas. And we focus on uh, the mobility solutions of tomorrow for people and goods that are sustainable, safe and accessible for all. And um, we provide a collaboration platform for academia, society and industry and the end users uh, to together develop and test uh, and implement solutions together. Uh, because as we've heard many times today, uh, collaboration is crucial. And I am sure that we will hear about uh, how crucial it is also in this session. Uh, and nobody has missed that digitalization, automation and electrification uh, will have a major impact and create a lot of opportunities uh, for the mobility sector. Uh, and today, um, we, and even though Sweden is a very small country, we have some of the uh, major players uh, in Sweden in the automotive and mobility sector. Uh, and today uh, they undergo uh, groundbreaking changes. And in this session, we have a great lineup uh, of interesting speakers uh, who will dive into the subject. We have uh, two um, uh, from the automotive industry, one from the Swedish Transport Administration, uh, and then two representatives from India and Israel participating. So let's get started. Uh, and first on the digital stage, we have uh, Anna Westerberg. Uh, she's the senior vice president at Volvo Group Connected Solutions. 
Uh, so a warm welcome to you, Anna. Thank you, Sophie, and hello from Gothenburg. My name is Anna Westerberg. I'm leading Volvo Group Connected Solutions. We develop and operate connected services for Volvo Group customers around the world. In my presentation, I will talk about how we work to make transportation and infrastructure solutions more sustainable and efficient. I will share three examples and I will highlight the importance of collaboration and partnerships in this development. You may not have given it much thought, but the Volvo Group contributes to the functioning of our society in many different ways. Trucks, buses, construction equipment and connected services are involved in several of the functions that many of us rely on each and every day. Transport is an enabler for prosperity, growth and welfare. Without it, the societies we live in will not function. And the demand for transportation is increasing with a growing population, a growing middle class. Urbanization is a global trend that means that we need to find new ways of transporting people and goods in and out of cities in an efficient way. Growth in e-commerce impact the demands and requirements of transportation and create new patterns. As much as we understand the drivers for this increased demand of transportation, we also understand the facts of science, that we have several global challenges to combat. For example, climate change, bad air pollution, congestion and road fatalities, meaning that going forward, transportation needs to be done in a more sustainable way. Behind me, you see a figure, a number, one million. Last year, we celebrated that we had connected more than one million trucks uh, and machines for our customers around the world. And for commercial industry, this is a big number. And it's a number that is growing every day. And this is very good news. And why is that so? With this amount of data generated by these connected assets, we can make a big impact to our customers and to society. When more vehicles are being connected, in combination with connected goods, connected drivers, connected infrastructure, we can increase the efficiency of transportation. And from the data generated by the connected vehicles, we can support our customers in many different ways. For example, we monitor key components to predict a breakdown so we can avoid costly unplanned stop for our customers. That, if they happen, also um, likely can cause disturbances in traffic impacting all of us. Together with connectivity, electromobility and advancements in autonomous solutions will drive significant innovation and transformation of the transportation industry in the years to come. And these will be strong contributors in addressing many of the global challenges that I've just addressed. As a result of these software-driven technologies, new business models will emerge and transportation will be done in a much safer, efficient and sustainable way going forward. Sustainability and climate change are truly the challenges of our generation. And our contribution is to offer leading transport and infrastructure solutions that enable societies to prosper today and in the future. And through these technologies, connectivity, automation, electromobility, this can be done. But we also need to take a holistic approach to look at a bigger picture, a whole system. For example, uh, an electric truck. What are the services? What are the charging solutions? Well, how is the infrastructure set up? And then we need to combine all of these together. And this means that we also need to work in new ways with a broader set of partners to succeed. You can say that partnership is for us the new leadership. And now I will go deeper into three uh, examples uh, of value creation and I will share with you how we, the Volvo Group, together with customers and partners, work for more efficient and sustainable transport and infrastructure solutions. Here in Gothenburg, we have a very large infrastructure project ongoing with the purpose to make it easier to transport people in and out of the city as we expect the population to grow in the years to come. 
So there is a lot of digging going on and there are several hundred thousand tons of clay and mud that needs to be transported out of this city during this um, infrastructure work. And since this is happening in the center of Gothenburg, there is also a high focus to minimize the environmental impact from this work. So the challenge was how can we optimize the load on each truck for maximum productivity while at the same time minimize the environmental impact and staying within the giving limits? And how can we simplify the administration in this process for the operators and authorities? And this was the challenge. And together with our customers, NCC, a Nordic leading building and infrastructure company, and other partners, we developed a service that we called Efficient Loadout, which makes it possible to optimize the load uh, on each truck and also remove all the manual paperwork and move that to a digitalized process. And the result is less trucks on the road, lower emissions, simpler administration and a safer work environment. This particular project will reduce transports in and out of Gothenburg by 8,000 during the project lifetime. It will remove handling of 65,000 uh, papers to digital documents. Uh, and it all together then has the potential to enable a reduction of CO2 emissions by up to 1,000 tons. And we could not have done this on our own. NCC could not have done their own, their own not, nor the traffic authorities. But we could do this together and that's something that we are very proud of. Urban logistics uh, contribute to challenges in the form of traffic, congestion and poor inner city environments. But it's also a prerequisite for an attractive city. Smooth is a research project uh, in which we, together with other industry players, research institutes and the society, jointly develop and test a systems of systems in Gothenburg with the ambition to reduce the number of goods transports by up to 40% to the inner city area. And the challenge is that a large portion of the trucks delivering goods to the center of Gothenburg um, is not carrying a full load. Our analysis shows that approximately 90% of the truck traffic carries only one third of the total uh, goods entering to the downtown area. And the systems for systems for urban transport is a very complex issue and it involves many players and many different systems not designed originally to interact with each other. So a key feature here will be to find the solution with a dynamic decision algorithm for consolidating and reloading the goods um, in different hubs based on a very complex amount of data. Now we're going to move to the US um, and we're going to move to California. And the people living in California is in a dramatic way experiencing the effects of climate change, bad air pollution and traffic congestion. And to improve the situation, the state of California is investing in initiatives to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, to strengthen the economy and to improve the public health and the environment. And one initiative called the Volvo Lights, standing for low impact green heavy transport solutions, is a unique collaboration between the South Coast Air Quality Management District, Volvo Trucks and 14 other organizations to pioneer a range of vehicle charging and workforce development innovations critical for the commercial success uh, of battery electric trucks and equipment. And over a three year period, Volvo Lights will demonstrate the ability for heavy duty battery electric trucks and equipment to reliably move freight between major ports and warehouses throughout the region with uh, less noise and zero emissions. And this is one example how public private partnerships can accelerate industry transformation for the benefit of all stakeholders and for the overall society. So very much driven by the new technologies enabled through collaboration between industry, society and academia, we are creating the transport solutions of the future and they will be more efficient, more sustainable and safer. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Anna. Very interesting to hear these concrete examples of how you at Volvo are working with the future mobility and transport solutions. And also underlining also the very important role that you as a global player has in creating uh, the sustainable societies of the future. Uh, and partnership is the new leadership. Uh, but also newcomers and startups have, have a very important role. Um, particularly for driving disruptive innovation. And therefore, I'm very glad to introduce our next speaker, uh, Linnea Kungehed from Einride, who is the CMO and co-founder founder of Einride, an extremely innovative and promising st Swedish startup. Uh, Linnea is heading all marketing, uh, communication, design and public affairs at the company. And a uh, warm welcome to tell us more about your exciting journey. Hi, thank you so much for having me and thank you for that introduction. I'm super happy to be here. So as you said, my name is Linnea Kuhnehead. I'm co-founder of Enride and Enride is a startup based out of Sweden. And we are um, still a small player, uh, but we are also challenging a huge industry. Uh, and before we go in a bit into more what we're doing, I would just like to touch up on briefly about the transport industry and the challenges that we see and also the very reason why we exist as a company. And so if we just start to look at the industry, the transport industry is actually a $2 trillion industry annually and it's responsible for somewhere around 7 to 8% of the, glo of the global CO2 emission. It is also highly inefficient since the filling rate today is only about 20% on average. So there's a lot of things that we can do here. And it's also a fact that transport is getting more expensive and this is, has to do with the driver shortage, but also the, the cost of fossil fuel that is increasing. So there are plenty of arguments into why we need to look into this industry and challenging it and to see how we can find new solutions. And how we see it from our perspective is that we need to shift a bit of the dynamics of how this industry is working. We need to stop looking at it from a carrier perspective and more looking at it from a shipper's perspective. That, that said, it's more looking for where is the demand, how much is the demand, and how can we transport this in the most efficient and cost-effective way, but also, of course, in a sustainable way, because that's where we have to go, right? And so we can see that there's three major shifts right now happening in the transport industry, and the first one being the digitalization. And the transport industry is still one of the big industries that's not really gone through this uh, this big shift yet and this will of course help a lot when it comes to how we can make it more efficient and how we can optimize the the transport and the filling rate uh, but what we also see is that we need to start looking into other solutions when it comes to the transport in itself the freight transport that is and that is that we need we have to go into other type of uh, fossil fuels such as um sorry we need to look at an electric alternative uh, instead of fossil fuels so by going electric there is so much more factors to take into account than going with a diesel so there's much more it's it's not as easy as that you can replace a an electric truck with a diesel truck. There's so much more to it. And actually the same goes when, when we talk about autonomous and self-driving. So what we how we think about the future of freight is that we need to go for a much more systematic approach. We need to look at it from a completely different angle. And for this, we need to be digital. And so we need to digitize the transport industry to be able to go for an electric and an autonomous future. And by doing that, we can see so many clear benefits. We can see that we can drop the operational cost of transport, and we can also, of course, lower the CO2 emissions up to 90%. And so that's something that we are really pushing for uh, from Endra's perspective. Uh, but coming back to mobility and the tomorrow of, to, of mobility, I think it's so important to highlight that when you want to go for electric trucks, electric and autonomous, there's so much more you need to do in the planning. And this is, I would say that this is impossible to do manually. 
And since a lot of the logistics planning today is manually, that's really where we need to start. Because when you take an electric truck instead of a diesel, you need to start looking into how can you make this electric truck run in an efficient way. And that comes everything from how you plan your charging cycles. What type of weather is it? Uh, are you going uphill or downhill? So there's so much more, but it also goes into what are you actually carrying? Are you carrying frozen goods? That's going to take a lot more energy than if you are uh, carrying uh, dry goods, for example. And there's major of this type of uh, questions that you need to answer if you want to run electric in an efficient way. But the really cool fact is that when we've been working with our customers and we're working with, uh, uh, for example, we're working together with Lidl, we're working together with Oakley and many more companies, to, to go for sustainable solutions, we can already see that up to 20 and 30% of all of their shipments today, all of the transport could actually be electrified with a good business case. And I think that is so important also to highlight that this is done with the technology that already exists today. So there's not really anything that we have to wait for any longer. We just need to think a bit differently and we need to have a great platform so that we can plan in a nice way so that we can make electric cost efficient and, and sustainable in the best way possible. And the really interesting factor here as well is that it's very similar actually when it comes to autonomous transport. Because if you want to go for safe a safe transition when autonomous transport, you actually, it's a very similar approach because you need to look into where do we have the demand and where is it safe to install this type of technology. And that is also something that we are doing uh, together with our customers. We're looking at different types of um, settings and uh, different types of environments where an installation of this new self-driving technology could be installed in a safe and nice way. And where, of course, we also uh, can have a good business case, actually a great business case, uh, but also to make it sustainable. And so that is something that we are working um, hard on trying to, to make that transition happen. And I would really like to show you a video that we did here a few um, weeks ago, where we actually became the company in the world to drive the fastest on an autonomous and fully electric truck at the Top Gear tr track in uh, in the UK. So let's see if we can get it here. So this is only a few weeks ago, and, and we were aiming for a record in driving fully autonomous. So I just want to also mention this, that this is fully autonomous. So it's not remote driving. It's no one in there. We've been getting those questions. It's not. It's fully autonomous. And it drives up to, at this day, we drive 82 kilometers per hour. And beautiful day in UK. So the technology is really here. And now it's just time that we take in, that we take action and that we make this change happen. Thank you so much for, for me. Thank you very much, Linnea. Extremely interesting. And thanks for sharing your innovative approach. Uh, uh, to tomorrow's mobility and uh, it sounds so easy it's just to to uh, think a little bit differently and uh, te te technology is here so you will be back in a little while for some discussion but now it's time for a little bit of a different perspective because for these new and innovative solutions to really uh, become implemented in uh, the transport system that we uh, are, are uh, using we need collaboration with the public sector we need the politicians, authorities, regions and cities. So I'm very glad to now present um, the Swedish Transport Administration, Olaf Johansson. He is the Programme Director for Digitalization of the Transport System at the Authority. And um, we look very much forward to hearing now about your role uh, in tomorrow's mobility system. So warm welcome, Olaf. 
Thank you, Sophie. Thank you. Very delighted to be here. Uh, to start off, uh, Traffic Racket, we are responsible for the long-term planning of the infrastructure for all traffic modes. And we're also responsible for uh, maintaining the traffic management and the investments in rail and road. So that's basically our our task. And looking at the road system, we uh, are roughly re responsible for the highways and the country roads. So not the roads in the cities. And right now at the uh, administration, we have a big focus on the to reach the climate goal. Uh, Sweden has said it's we will reduce uh, or supposed to reduce uh, CO2 emissions by 70 percent until 2030. So that's a really high goal. So we have a lot of uh, uh, kind of focus in electrifications, as other speakers have highlighted here. But I will today deep, uh, dig a bit deeper into the digitalization and what we do there. So. Looking at our role in the digitalization, uh, we are looking at kind of what will new techni techniques and new solutions mean? How can they be rolled out? What will that mean for the road system? And what kind of effects will they actually give? And um, so in that aspect, we're actually looking at the infrastructure, both the physical and also the digital, and how it can be designed in the best way to actually c contribute to these kind of goals. And the goals is like in traffic safety uh, to reduce the CO2 emissions, as I was talking about, but also to make the transport system even more accessible for the users in it. And um, all this is, of course, in, in line with uh, Agenda 2030. And uh, we're also looking a lot how like the vehicles and the future vehicles will interact with the infrastructure. Um, so basically, you can say like we are the the one to like we're looking at the society planning and how that can be developed um, and also one thing to point out is that we are one of sweden's biggest uh, like actors in procurement so we are really doing a lot of procure procurements each year and in that process we're also looking at new innovative solutions to give incentives to the industry to develop new solutions and we're approximately procuring for around 50 to 60 Swedish billion kroners a year. Uh, when we have been looking at uh, how we can use digitalization in different aspects, we have been, uh, we presented a roadmap last summer. And in that roadmap, we are pointing out, I will also say that it, it was a roadmap for connected and automated uh, road transport system. Uh, so in that we, we presented 20 measures or solutions, you can say, uh, that we saw has had a big potential to uh, make the road transport system more e efficient. And we were looking at those measures, how we can stepwise implement them and how they can create th these positive effects that I was talking about before. Uh, but it's also a roadmap to be able to point out in which areas we need more knowledge, for example, within the uh, automotive vehicles and how that will actually affect how they interact with the, with the infrastructure. Uh, in this roadmap, we also presented uh, six focus areas, and they are more about looking at prerequisites and what we need to develop uh, regarding, for example, legislation, what we need to develop and see how new business models uh, can be like come into the system, how the user acceptance is for new techniques and so on. And of course, then how the physical and digital infrastructure can be developed. Uh, this roadmap has been actually a base for uh, our dialogue with the industry. So we've been actually been using this to see, to be able to uh, create and develop the solutions together because we don't know the thing. We, we need a lot of input from the industry, for example, those actors that's been talking here before. Um, but we are, we are looking at different, uh, as I said, techniques in this roadmap. And one of those techniques are actually geofencing. And geofencing is, we look uh, at like a digital fence where you can create certain conditions and we can uh, use that, for example, have digital exemptions for heavy trucks. We can have it to safe exits from construction sites and so on. So then we're looking at what can we do to be able to roll this out? And that could be like having uh, the legislation on hand. Uh, we are also looking at uh, how to make these regulations accessible in a digital format so that the uh, industry can get collected data directly from us. 
Uh, we're also looking at the project that I think is interesting that's called Digital Winter Road Status Information, where we collect friction data from the vehicles so we can get a lot of uh, data points, uh, millions now, before we had like 10. And uh, so now we can get even a better um, uh, perception of what we need to do and how we can reduce costs in our winter um, Okay, uh, winter when, when we do anti-slip measures, for example. And we have been having uh, um, out and uh, test now for two years and it's giving really good results. So now the next step is to scale this up actually. So it's a lot of things happening within this area and we uh, are really glad that we can cooperate together with both academy and industry and actors like Drive Sweden and others. So thank you. Thank you very much, Ola, for uh, sharing your perspective, uh, which is, of course, uh, very important uh, when it comes to, to scaling these solutions in reality. And see you again soon for a short discussion. Uh, yeah. And uh, moving over then uh, to our next speaker, um, the mobility system is a global challenge, uh, of course, and therefore I'm very glad that our next speaker is from the uh, Indian Institute of Technology and uh, Professor Anup Shavla. Uh, has a long and impressive CV. Uh, he has focused on automotive safety and biodesign. Uh, and uh, he will speak today about the CITES platform, uh, a very um, interesting Swedish-India transportation innovation and safety partnership. Uh, so warm welcome, uh, Professor Anup Shavla. Thank you. Thank you for uh... Uh, nice uh, word you said about me, and thank you for inviting me for uh, uh, today's uh, uh, session. It's uh, really a pleasure uh, for me to address uh, this uh, gathering. I'm, uh, the sp I'm speaking on my on the behalf of my institution, which is an Institute of Technology, and at the same time, I'm also speaking on behalf of the Sweden India Transport Innovation and Safety Partnership, which is uh, which we refer to as uh, the CITES Partnership. Uh, this partnership has. Uh, uh, Roughly about 15 partners, including uh, people from industry, academia, and the administrative authorities, both from Sweden and uh, India. The members, would, uh, the members include the Volvo Group, Autoliv, Ericsson, Saab, Chalmers, Rise, VTI. The Swedish Transport uh, Administration is a key uh, uh, member, a key uh, partner for us. Altair, Manipal Hospitals, and uh, uh, Tech Mahindra from India, Indian Institute of Science in uh, India. Automobile Research Association of India, which is uh, one of the uh, authorities in uh, uh, India looking at road safety and uh, mobility. Uh, so we have been working uh, with, the, with the overall aim, the overall objective of uh, looking at the mobility as, a, uh, as an issue which we want to, uh, which we want to address uh, in the near future. We are also looking at safety as an issue because the way we look at it, mobility and safety, they always go hand in hand. No transportation can be talked of unless we look at uh, the, the safe aspects of it. While we'll talk of pollution control on one part, safety is also another very important aspect. Just to uh, uh, quote one uh, small uh, figure, on Indian roads itself, within a year, every year, we lose about 150,000 uh, lives every year because uh, of the fatal accidents uh, that happen. So the future mobility, the way we look at it is, uh, uh, is going to be, of course, AI-based. There is going to be a lot of uh, uh, AI-based, uh, uh, let's say, autonomous uh, vehicles that will be there on the roads. But all these solutions, they will work, they will be successful only when, uh, only when they are able to address the safety aspects uh, also. Okay, the, the third aspect of uh, uh, mobility, which is going to stay with us for, uh, uh, for many decades now, which is uh, which is the future of uh, mobility, is going to be electric vehicles. Now, whether it is uh, the traditional vehicles or electric vehicles, none of them can uh, move away from uh, uh, or can ignore the uh, can ignore road safety as an issue. And uh, 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 and all these uh, the solutions, they are driving us towards what we refer to as autonomous vehicles. We uh, one of the uh, previous speakers showed us a very interesting uh, video in which uh, a vehicle was uh, uh, was uh, being uh, driven in an autonomous uh, manner, and that is going to be the future of our uh, 
uh, future of mobility in the world. However, while that is uh, going to be the future, we'll have to look at what safety is and how safety would be addressed in that. For instance, if you talk of uh, roads, the uh, identifying other vehicles on the road, identifying pedestrians on the road, identifying two wheelers on the road will lead uh, uh, to many other uh, uh, issues that uh, we have to address. Uh, traffic, we have to address uh, all the algorithm that we have, the AI-based algorithms, the, the learning algorithm that we use in uh, these uh, uh, solutions. They have to address the traffic uh, uh, that, that is going to be present on them, and uh, they'll uh, they would help us uh, to make the uh, they would help us make the uh, roads safer. And uh, we know that the vehicles uh, today, vehicles uh, in fact for the last uh, quite a few decades, have been having lots of sensors and uh, uh, electronic control systems uh, in them. But those uh, systems, they are going to they are uh, uh, going to be using more and more AI-based uh, techniques. And uh, they're also going to be using vision-based uh, techniques to identify, uh, let's say, uh, vehicles on the road, to identify people on the road. And uh, uh, the solutions that we come up with will have to address uh, these uh, uh, aspects. In fact, uh, 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 the future of mobility is going to be AI-based. It uh, has to address, uh, it has to address uh, the road safety uh, as well as uh, 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 autonomous uh, vehicles and uh, uh, the control of the vehicles has to be addressed. Uh, has to be addressed uh, through them. One additional challenge that I uh, uh, foresee in uh, all these solutions is going to be the issue of uh, 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 not just data security but data ownership. The, the one big issue that uh, will remain for uh, uh, the administrators and for all uh, stakeholders to uh, address would be that the data which is coming from these vehicles. Well, uh, is that owned by the vehicle owner or by the automobile manufacturer or by the government? It can have serious implications on uh, 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 on uh, what kind of solutions are uh, accepted and what kind of solutions are uh, taken uh, 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 are taken to reality because uh, 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 it will. I mean, the data ownership will have legal implications. It will have uh, uh, issues on what data can we use in these AI solutions. Of course. I uh, fully endorse the fact that uh, the future is going to be uh, AI based. The future is uh, the future of autonomous vehicles, electric vehicles, and road safety. It's all going to be linked to the AI uh, tools that are going to come up in the next, uh, 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 I'll say, in the next, uh, in the immediate uh, future. And that is uh, uh, going to control mobility and transportation in a big uh, way. I think I'll end with that. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, actually, I remember the uh, inauguration of this initiative earlier this year. Uh, and I would like very much how it was underlined that safety is now considered or, or needs to be seen as an integrated part of the mobility development as a whole. Um, and a very good example of a successful bilateral collaboration as well. So thank you very much. Um, and we welcome you back uh, in a little while. Uh, next up uh, is another international speaker, uh, Dr. Anatlia Bonstein, who is the chairwoman and director of the Smart Mobility Initiative at Israel's Prime Minister's Office. And the initiative coordinates the activities of 11 government ministries uh, and agencies and places Israel as the hub uh, of technology and know-how in the field of smart mobility and alternative fuels. So warm welcome, uh, Dr. Anat Lea Bonstein. Sorry if I pronounce it wrongly. You you pronounce it just fine. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Everything is okay. Very good. Okay. Thank so you. so you know not not once is Israel referred to as the Silicon Valley of the auto tech industry or the place where technology and innovation a, a, in in a smart mobility are produced. And so, yes, Israel is now a hub of technologies and innovation in both alternative fuels and smart mobility. Uh, what we have in Israel is about 600 companies or startups in those fields which span autonomous vehicle-related technologies, artificial intelligence, cybersecurity, connected vehicles, a shared the shared vehicles economy and everything related to electric mobility like next generation battery or fuel cells so that's like that's like over 600 companies and over 300 research groups in the academia in this sector 
and now over, over 30 multinationals have activities or R&D centers in Israel, in, uh, referring to the auto manufacturers or component manufacturers. And not just this, but there are over $25 billion capital, uh, capital raised by Israeli startups, either through acquisitions or through investments. So this is the Israeli ecosystem at a, at a nutshell. But so it's a big success. But part of this big success was the fact that the government of Israel decided to put a strong emphasis on this sector and created a national plan, which with the mission, with the goal to place Israel as the one of the world's leader in a, te a technology leader in a, those fields. And so that's how the, the a smart mobility initiative, a unit under the prime minister, within the prime minister's office, coordinating the activities of 11 different uh, ministries and government agencies uh, was launched. That was nine years ago. And our mission as a coordinator of the, all this program was first to encourage research development entrepreneurship in those fields. And this is by supporting every segment of the technology production chain, starting all the way from supporting basic research and launching research centers, supporting startups in all their stages, promoting pilots and demonstrations, and also a launching and also a launching a, a, a community of entrepreneurs, which now has over ten thousand entrepreneurs in it. And so, and, all, and also promoting pro programs to encourage investments. Uh, and, and, and so a lot of technology was created. And what we needed to do now was take this technology and incorporate it in the, in the transportation system in Israel, bring the technology to the street level, to the, to the community. So we work closely with municipalities, with authorities, aiding them with deployment of innovative technologies, of innovative concepts. Uh, so we're actually gone from encouraging, strongly encouraging innovation and technology in the last few years to now shifting to encouraging implementations and deployment. And this, uh, this uh, uh, so for this, on this end, what we need to do is also support, not just financially, but set the right regulation in place. So the regulation to all, supporting also for the pilot phase, but also for the long term term phase, setting the right legislation. And yes, our, 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 our goal is actually to take the four mega trends of the auto, autonomous uh, industry, which are the, which are the, of, of the, of the automotive industry, sorry for that, which are the autonomous, the shared, the electric, and the connected. And through that, deal with everything that was said prior to uh, in, in the lectures before, that will actually be very, very efficient for the transportation system to reduce traffic jams, re re road congestion, reduce uh, air pollution, road accidents, and make more everything more efficient, affordable, and and, uh, and used by all. And uh, I, I would want I, I would just like to add one more thing that I visited uh, Sweden, Gothenburg, and especially the Lindholm uh, Science Park, and I was very pleased and encouraged to see that the way Sweden works is very much alike what we do in Israel, which is putting the, the, all the stakeholders together: the public, the private, the academy. And as the government support, supporting them with the right set of tools, that's how you create innovation and bring it to deployment. And we have strong collaboration with Sweden. We have a couple of companies already working in Sweden and strong a, a collaboration. So thank you. With this, I will end. Thank you very much, uh, Anat, for this very interesting um, presentation and, and the talk. And I'm glad you've been to Gothenburg. <laughs> Welcome back maybe when we have a little more light outside. Um, now, uh, I would like to uh, invite all uh, our speakers, or uh, at least uh, Anup Shavla, Olaf and uh, Linnea, back together with Anat, and uh, we will have a little discussion. You have all described in a little different ways uh, a future that is uh, connected and uh, automated and how data and AI 
create enormous amount of possibilities, but you've also touched upon some of the challenges, of course, that we are also going to face. Uh, so uh, let's have some minutes now and talk about this. And I would like to see if we could get some uh, really concrete examples up here uh, from you, from your different perspectives on how, how can you see AI uh, enabling safe, uh, efficient, sustainable mobility systems uh, preferably not uh, in, in 20 years, but rather uh, in a short-term perspective. Uh, do, do you, I'd like to hear some cases or, or examples uh, from your perspective. Uh, Linnea, would you like to start? Yeah, I can start. Uh, I think that um, if we want to roll out this technology today, we, we need to have AI. I think that's like the base case in all of this uh, technology is if, that, if we want to make autonomous safe and we want to roll out it in a, in a great way, we need to uh, apply AI to make it possible. And uh, like I mentioned a bit in the presentation, I think that there's so much to take into consideration when it comes to both how you do um, the autonomous part when it comes to uh, to the actual execution of the driving, but there's also, of course, a lot of uh, planning that you need to do be, to be able to even drive electric. So I think moving forward in this shift, we're going to have to take uh, machine learning and AI into how we want to plan and execute. And um, yeah, I, I mean, it's it's simply a saying that it will not be possible without it. And then, of course, uh, we are already uh, up and running and we've been doing both with the autonomous driving together with customers, but also with the electric trucks and to make that efficient and cost effective. And that's something that we are applying uh, already today. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, thank you. And uh, Professor Shavla, um, when it comes to traffic safety, how do you see AI being an enabler in that area? I think uh, when you're talking of autonomous vehicles, I fully agree that uh, we cannot have autonomous vehicles without uh, AI being an uh, inherent part of it. That is, uh, that probably goes uh, 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 without uh, any doubt. Uh, when you're talking of safe road, when you're talking of uh, uh, vehicles on the road and we want to ensure safety, I do see AI contributing in a big way in terms of uh, uh, maybe uh, identifying objects on the road, identifying vehicles on the road, and uh, uh, many of the algorithms or many of the techniques uh, which will have for uh, uh, autonomous uh, driving will have to uh, will have to move will have to uh, take into account the vehicles which have been identified the, uh, say the pedestrians which have been identified on the road and so on uh, we cannot uh, uh, do without that and uh, uh, there will be uh, other aspects also where uh, AI will become uh, important and that would be if the, even even when you're talking of uh, let's say vehicle maintenance you have so many sensors in the vehicle. Uh, in the vehicles uh, today. Uh, so managing all the data, understanding the, what the condition of the vehicle is, and then deciding what the response of the vehicle should be in view of uh, an uh, impending scenario in front. That is also going uh, to need a lot of AI uh, techniques, a lot of machine learning based uh, uh, techniques. So yeah. when we are talking of uh, autonomous vehicles, yes, AI is going to be there in a big way, but all these uh, aspects that I mentioned, they, they are being addressed by uh, researchers right now, and they'll have to be uh, uh, address further. Yes. And you mentioned road maintenance. That is one of your major tasks, uh, Olaf. Uh, yeah, yeah, I definitely. <laughs> AI. Uh, yeah, we can use AI in many different aspects. I think it's very interesting examples that have been given already. I think if you look also around the roads using AI, for example, we can, uh, by having um, advanced ana picture analysis, we can see what kind of dangerous areas, areas are around the roads. For example, steep slopes. We can look at the dangerous uh, railings and uh, we can ident identify them in that way. And then we can see, okay, where do we have these kind of problems systematically? in the road transport system and then we can uh, systematically like build them away or like invest in, in those kind of actions. So we're actually having research projects within this together with uh, AI Sweden for example. So I think that that's very interesting. Yeah. And we can also use it in other aspects such as uh, climate change and see and predict in air quality and see where we can get like the best uh, measures out. But I think like here and now, I think there is road safety and traffic safety is maybe the one we can get fixed first. 
Mm, yes. And, uh, and Anat, uh, what is your perspective? Uh, how do you work with, with uh, AI and from the Prime Minister's office? So AI, first of all, it's an enabling technology, cross-sectorial, and we can achieve a lot from it. We can learn a lot from it, like Olaf said. But what we need to do is, in order to have the best benefits from it and not take it for there's always the heaven versus hell scenarios. So we, we need to set the right policy, the right governance for it. And it's in a lot of other enabling technologies like data and, and, and autonomous vehicles even. So once you get the right, uh, the right uh, uh, benefits, from it, you get the right policy from it and governance and, take and create a secure and trusted and energy efficient system, that's where you can benefit from it. Yes. Yeah, you're touching upon something very important. I mean, how do we make sure that the technology actually go hand in hand with the, the policy goals and the, the societal goals so that we don't get a development that is not sustainable? I don't know if you want to comment on that, uh, perhaps from your perspective, Professor Shavla. I think I lost a bit of the audio on meeting. Can you please repeat the question? Yes, I know I was asking uh, how uh, we can make sure that the technology development go hand in hand with the societal goals so that we don't create uh, a society that is not sustainable, uh, even though we have technology that can, can do a lot of things. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's uh, very important uh, that uh, technology has to go hand in hand with the society. But otherwise, the society will not accept the uh, technology. Okay. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, let's say uh, one of the major needs for the society in India, at least, is uh, to have uh, roads uh, safer. I mean, uh, if we had uh, technology, if we had autonomous vehicles which uh, uh, runs nicely, but it, uh, let's say, has a, a crash every alternate day, nobody is going to accept that. So uh, the society goals have to go hand in hand with the, what the technology is. And uh, uh, I'm sure whether it is uh, uh, the, uh, the industrial partners or the government agencies, whether it's public funding or private funding or uh, whatever, hmm. no funding is going to succeed if we are not addressing the society goals. So that, yeah. uh, will, that, that will have to go hand in hand. And uh, that's going to be the uh, crux of, uh, let's say, the way economy will uh, drive uh, the technology. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can I maybe? Thank you. Yes, Lenny, I one last last word. <laughs> yeah, uh, no, I, I think that it's so it's so interesting because we we talk a lot about the policies and also legislations uh, within this area, and I think it's so important also to highlight that um, again that we we've been running our simulations on how autonomous technology would respond to being on a diesel platform and we could actually see that that would increase the the amount of co2 emissions so i am totally agree also that we need to to see into the society's best interest also when we are deploying this new type of technology it's so important mm. And by that, I think that we could have gone on and on for at least two days talking about AI and mobility and the future of mobility. So, uh, but unfortunately, uh, we will have to uh, pass over to the last session. And I would like to thank you all speakers. And just to summarize that in order to really benefit from what new technology and uh, can, can do, we need to work with real users, real cases, and base our work on real challenges that we are trying to solve. So uh, a warm thank you to everybody and uh, a thank you from me uh, at the Lindholm and Gothenburg and uh, back to Stockholm again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sophie. What an interesting, inspiring track about mobility. And clearly, AI has a role to play here, but also mindset, collaboration and policy. There is no room for log on here. We have to aim for the stars. And on for today's last track, the grand finale, where we address the foundation, the foundation of everything, democracy. We've taken democracy for granted and we're bombarded daily with the news of its threats. I'm obviously partly talking about the US election, but also about the rise of anti-democratic movements, fake news, and a decline in the trust of public institutions. 
Addressing the challenges of our times require technology and artificial intelligence, a sense of urgencies that we've heard from many of our speakers today, and a mindset shift in you and me, and a flourishing democracy. So let's talk about the threats and solutions here today. And a great place to start this conversation is at Umyo University and Virginia Dignam, Professor of Ethical and Social Artificial Intelligence. She's a board member of the World Economic Forum AI Council and Scientific Director at WASP. Virginia, the floor is yours. Virginia? I cannot hear anything. I don't know if someone can hear me, but I have no, I cannot hear. We can hear you, Virginia. I, I, I don't know, am I supposed to start speaking now? Because I could not hear the introduction. I have no sound. Yes, you can start. Yeah, go on. Okay, this is very strange too. <laughs> Anyway, so good evening. Thank you very much for having me here today. Um, I don't know if I will be able to answer any questions, if there are questions, because I cannot hear nothing, but we'll solve this as we go. Um, I would like to give a very short introduction to the work that I'm doing on responsible artificial intelligence. And the issue is, of course, that uh, there are many approaches and no, none of us as Void or uh, everybody has understood uh, the impact and the potential impact of AI. Uh, and the, what is uh, in all these discussions is about not only about that AI can potentially do a lot for us, but the question should also be what should AI be doing and who should be deciding about when and how to apply AI. And it's important to start by seeing about what is AI exactly, because depending on who you, hear, who, you hear, who you hear or where you read it, there can be many different approaches to understanding AI, from the idea that AI is something magic that um, takes over uh, our decisions and decides for us and uh, uh, always knows the best, to uh, a much more uh, simplistic version in which AI is just the next step in um, automation and, in a sense, just business as usual. Um, what is important to realize, whatever the approach or the vision or the idea or the understanding that you have about AI, is that these systems in, are software systems, are systems developed and designed by people, uh, and therefore they are not alone. They are part of a social technical system in which people, organizations and institutions also have a role to play. If we think about AI systems as being systems which have some degree of autonomy, so software which doesn't really need uh, necessarily all the time to be um, uh, uh, directed by a an user, also systems that are able to adapt and to, to sense and understand somehow their environment or part of their environment and adapt to it, and doing that in interaction with us, what's important to realize is that we cannot have autonomy without responsibility. And if the system, the software system is a tool, is an artifact, is a piece of software, it is not the responsible party, what is important is then to identify and to determine and to describe and um, uh, indicate who, which organizations, which people, which institutions should take this responsibility. At the same time, as we are designing interactive systems which can interact and act in the same environment where people have and have impacts on people's lives, we also need to uh, put some accountability for the uh, cases in which the system, the system might do it wrong, in cases in which we need some explanation from the system. So interaction requires accountability. And finally, when we talk about adapting systems that adapt, that change, that modify both themselves and the environment and their understanding of the environment, then we need to have some level of transparency about how this, uh, this adaptation is doing and what, what is leading to the adaptation. So uh, for any AI system, we need to have what we call the art principles, accountability, responsibility, and transparency. And these are principles which are not only principles for the 
AI system itself, not, not principles for the software, but they are principles for us. They are principles for people, for organizations, for institutions. And we do need to take this responsibility for the design of the systems. Uh, how can we do that? We can look at the process by which we are developing and managing and governing this pro these uh, systems, and therefore ensuring that the development and managing uh, pro process are incorporating these principles. We can also do the, the by design approach, try to develop software that in its behavior incorporates some of these principles, but mostly we really need to look at the role and the position of all the stakeholders, from researchers to developers, to manufacturers, to users, to uh, policymakers, and so on, to ensure the regulation and the certification of these mechanisms. Because uh, uh, the regulation and the certification mechanisms of these systems, because the systems uh, are, um, like I say, impacting our lives and um, uh, Therefore, we need to take the control of the decision, take the decisions, and considering uh, taking into into account the possible risks in a way that we ensure that we minimize the risks without taking away the opportunities. And by uh, having an, a responsible approach to AI, it is not like many see a kind of. Uh, um, uh, constraint to innovation, but we, we should really see it as a stepping stone for innovation because we want to develop systems that people can trust, that are taking a responsibility and a ethical, a ethical and human principles into account. We are going by definition to develop and generate and taking uh, steps towards a more innovative um, approaches. Uh, then we can see this as um, a business differentiation, taking an irresponsible AI as a way to differentiate from others and mostly as a drive for transformation. So what I would like to finish with is that this idea that AI can do a lot. Yes, it can, and we should and definitely should take into uh, uh, take advantage of all the opportunities that AI uh, offers us as people and as societies. But we need to do it in a responsible way. We need to take into account the potential risks, and we should ask ourselves what are the system the the the, the the situations, the conditions, and the impact of these systems, and how how are we going to uh, organize ourselves about that? We are we people are the ones who set the purpose. AI is the tool that can help us um, uh, get better decisions, get better uh, opportunities. But we set the pur purpose. AI can give us the answers. We are the ones who should be asking the questions. So thank you very much. Virginia, uh, thank you for that. Uh, now I hear nothing at all. I see that you are speaking, but I hear nothing. I'm at saying all. thank you for uh, a discussion about ethical um, AI, and I feel a lot safer when uh, you're at the helm and doing research around this topic. And for our next talk, I think we should take an umbrella view, look at the global aspects and the challenges uh, of AI and democracy. With us is Mikkel Hogströmer. He is chairman of the Global Agenda Council on. De data-driven development at the World Economic Forum and heads up AI Forum and Planet Smart City uh, with us today to share his thoughts and experiences. Mikkel, show is yours. Well, thank you for having me. So let me start by spending a minute on innovation. Of course, every Friday I'm asked to judge what AI startup deserves venture capital. And as a result, every week a dozen or so startups receive additional funding. But being based in Silicon Valley, <laughs> I can safely say that more companies fail due to excess funding than to the lack thereof. And we often work on more ideas than we can properly act on and fragment our time and resources as a result. So my definition of innovation equals ID plus action. And having followed the first day of the Swedish Innovation Days, I can safely conclude there is no shortage of ideas. But the question remains, what ideas will we act on and remain focused on until we become leaders in that field and how will you choose most successful entrepreneurs and business leaders they have that in common that they are focused on what they feel passionate about i focus 30 years on applied ai be it as 
president of SAS Institute, C3.ai or CEO and partner at McKinsey and Company. The last few years I spent on the governance of AI as CEO. Um, I'm currently advising PE firms and sit on boards, including, as you mentioned, Planet Smart City, that's building affordable housing and use AI to foster thriving communities. And I'm passionate about the ethical use that Virginia so nicely highlighted, the ethical use of AI, and engaged as chairman of the Global Agenda Council at the World Economic Forum and spearheading the Data for Good initiative together with MIT. But today I was asked to focus on the work F is doing as regards to the impact of AI on society and the future of democracy. But we cannot talk about AI without first talking about data. As a reminder, data is the new oil that fuels the growth of our digital economies. And like AI, the competitive future of Sweden starts with data. Intangible assets, including data, that I represented 84% or 21 trillion US dollars of the S&P 500 company value in 2018. And it is the expectation that 80% of data worldwide will reside in companies, not private hands, or the government. There will be 30 billion connected devices in just two years, and we are already starting to see connected humans, the Internet of Bodies, or IOBs, generating massive amounts of data. So data defines our age, and it's the glue that binds and drives politics. Data is a tool for liberation, but also potentially a weapon for exploitation. And yeah, data flows remain largely unregulated and issues around access and ownership are increasingly contested. So data is no longer just input, but a policy issue in and on itself. Given the importance of data to the globalized digital econ economy, governance and politics, I think there will be a few more important geopolitical issues in the coming years. Some even argue that data is the new form of capital. It is already one of the most critical pieces of infrastructure in modern economies and societies. Data requires production, transportation, security, um, security. we have storage, refinement, dissemination. So the architectural design of such an important piece of infrastructure should not be left to chance, but should be carefully constructed in a way that addresses some important questions and tensions that were raised already earlier. How do we balance the well-being of people and communities, ensuring that they can benefit from data to improve their lives with the need to protect their privacy and shield them from misuse and abuse of data? What data should be protected as public good, not just in the economic sense, but in a broader social sense? And what data should be treated as a commercial asset? How can data best support a competitive, thriving and diverse market for innovation that furthers the human condition? To govern the use of increasingly personal data from abuse, WEF members believes the new data economy calls for a global data convention. Although personally, I think legislators must, must step up as well. And in fact, Sweden, could make the data platform its competitive advantage. As an exporter of refined data and digital services, Sweden could unlock, unlock the potential to export its booming service economy that currently represents, I think, some 80% of the GDP, but only 20% of the exports, give or take. So for data inequality to not worsen during and after COVID-19, those with strong data capabilities such as Ericsson, should make a more concerted effort to ensure those without do not get left behind. Because like OECD, Sweden is tracking industrial age KPIs. Unlocking the potential of the digital age is not about internet access or access to computers from home, as much as it is about skills and exploiting digital illiteracy. Citizens' lack of digital fluency increases inequality. And there are five initiatives that can make Sweden a digital leader. And I'll summarize them quickly. Number one is increased citizen awareness. And that's the digital literacy improvement and better engagement among educators. I, I believe that could be a core strength of Sweden. 
and it deserves increased focus. Number two is adapting systems. There is a need for new forms of independent oversight, regulatory strategies, community pressure to change the design of the social systems. That would include limiting anonymity, governing bots, and foster multi-stakeholder accountability for corporations. The third is values. Technology has consistently proven to expand and fine-tune democracy, open minds and flatten perceptions across the globe. But in the short term, bad actors have been ahead of the curve utilizing it. So that's calling for us to build better policies, more transparency, and that political communication become more sophisticated and tax heavy. Number four is working for good. I believe in governments, enlightened leaders and activists to help and steer policy and a democratic process to produce better democratic outcomes when we work together as private public partnerships of sort. Number five is assisting reforms. Pro-democracy governance solutions, they will be aided by the spread of technology and innovations like AI. Those will work in favor of trusted free speech and greater citizen empowerment. Addressing the eco chamber effect where news is limited to like-minded sources. Um, so in summary, the responsible use of AI calls for a common understanding of the basic principles of how it works. While AI has the potential to improve the human condition, at the same time it threatens to deepen social divides and put millions of people out of work. So while its inner workings are highly technical, the non-technical among us can and should understand the basic principles of how it works and the concerns that it raises. As the influence and impact of AI spread, it will be critical to involve people and experts from most diverse backgrounds possible in guiding this technology in ways that enhance human capabilities and lead to positive outcomes. Today, citizens' lack of digital fluency increases inequality. But better educated and more equipped people, that has to be good. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, you, your talk spanned over so much, both in terms of how we should utilize data and see data as an asset, looking at bad actors, policy, the importance of collaboration, education, but also giving us some great examples about how Sweden can lead and be a, a positive part of a transformation to strengthen the foundations of democracy. Thank you, Michael. And let's move our focus to France who, like Sweden, are on the forefront of technology, as well as serious about strengthening the institutions of democracy. I'd like to welcome Ambassador for the Digital Affairs at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, France, Mr. Henri Verdier. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and um, good uh, afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be with you and to go straight to the point. Uh, I think that, yes, um, AI is a radical innovation of our times, and we have to, to use it to, to, to make progress, but it could threaten democracy. It's not just that we can use AI to enforce democracy. It could be a threat. It could be a threat because it can be weaponized. It could be a threat because it can be used in a way with a lack of transparency and accountability, and we can make mistakes, we can have bias, and we can be unable to audit this. And also because we can have a bad balance of power and we could have a, a world with a huge monopolies with AI and no counter power for democracy. So here, <clears throat> if I may, I would uh, start my intervention with two reminders. First, the fact that democracies need political institutions that respect the rule of law. And that's very important. The rule of law is a restriction of the arbit arbitrary exercise of power by subordinating it to well-defined, estab established, and transparent laws. And it requires transparency, accountability, and powerful counterpower. And with AI, we, in this new world, we'll, we'll have to build a new rules of law system. And the second reminder is uh, the famous uh, quote uh, of the, the first Kongsberg law. Technology is neither good nor bad, neither it is neutral. Technology is not neutral. The spread of technology changes the world. And the way we apply the technology changes the world. 
And here, in, to face the AI revolution and to protect democracy, I think that we we have three ways to to consider. First, we need to ensure that AI is deployed in order to serve first and foremost the citizens, and not the government, and not just the interest of big tech companies. And technologies has to be used to empower citizens. We had civic tech, maybe we need AI tech. And um, we, we need to, to, to share the, the power of AI with the citizen. And of course, that's very complicated because uh, as you, we all know here, code is law. All those things start, uh, we, 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 can, we are not free if we act as consumer. We are free if we are able to produce, to create. And we, we need to empower citizens with uh, understanding, building, auditing the code to, to be able to reinforce democracy. And of course, with AI, we cannot just audit the code, for example, because we have algorithms that frame, we have rules framing the code and not just the code. And it's very technical and complicated, but we have an issue here. Does we understand what we are dealing with? Maybe we could also speak about commons. It is very important that AI is not just the monopoly, uh, the big AI, the great AI, are not, not just the monopoly of few organizations and that citizen has access to this kind of power. The second way is to ensure that AI is deployed in a transparent and accountable way. Some of the speakers spoke about this. In France, we, had a, we have a first experience and a complicated one. Because the law decided uh, three years ago, the law for a digital republic, that we have a, a strong principle now, when the state use uh, AI or just algorithm uh, to, to answer to a citizen, we have first to warn the citizen that we are using an AI, and then to be able to explain how it works. And we are trying to implement this law, and to be frank, it's very complicated because to explain to the citizen how it works. It's not just to open the code. You have to be able in simple words to explain what you are doing, why you, my children will go to this university and not this one. And to be able to explain the, the principle, the, the core principle of the algorithm. This issue is key and a lot of issues, uh, so we spoke about uh, automatic uh, driver, self-driving car in the last session. The, you know all the famous trolley problem. When the, the car will have to decide uh, if it uh, kills this person or, or this person, who will decide? Who will be able to, to agree with the decision? And uh, that's very important. And the last point, because I know that we, are, we don't have a lot of time, is that we need to ensure that AI is deployed in a manner that does not only tackle our concern, but those of the global community. And I said in the introduction that technology is not, and the technology's impact differ depending on the context, be it historical or geographical. It's very important to, that we don't limit innovation, of course, but that we are aware that the impact can be different in different contexts. Context. And that's why France uh, did propose the idea of the global partnership on, of in artificial intelligence, like we have the IPCC for climate, to be sure that um, the best uh, or some of the best scientists will meet the policymakers around the world and to have a global and serious conversation about the future of AI. Because we consider that if we want to protect democracy, we need a global conversation and a collective decision of what future do we want. And um, just to sum up and to, leave, to, to let time for the exchange, we believe that the only strategy to organize this future is uh, to have a collective, international, multi-stakeholder approach with states, scientific and companies and civil societies and to have a conversation about the future we want. Thank you. Explain uh, everything in simple terms, but I will hold you to that when you join the panel uh, in a little bit. So, many speakers today have addressed the importance of diversity, not only because it's right and fair, but it's actually an integral part of success, period. 
Our next speaker has dedicated her uh, professional career to this aspect of transformation. Welcome, Elena Kell, the Swedish Ambassador to Women in uh, AI and part of the H&M Group. Welcome. Thank you so much. It's so great being here today and following this wonderful day. So today I'd like to share some thoughts with you on gender balance and AI. Uh, and I think uh, some of you have mentioned that. And to put it mildly, things are not looking so great at the moment. In fact, I really believe that we are finding ourselves in the middle of gender diversity crisis and diversity crisis in AI in general. According to recent research by the World Economic Forum and LinkedIn, only 22% of jobs in artificial intelligence are held by women, with even fewer holding senior roles. Recent studies also found that only 18% of authors at leading AI conferences are women, and more than 80% of AI professors are men. This is a huge problem. Think about it. Representatives of the half of the world's population is barely involved in developing technology that is shaping our economies, our societies, our future and democracy. And of course, we know that AI boosts innovation and offers a lot of opportunities to improve lives and society, hence this fantastic day that, has, uh, that I've been following. But also we know that it's a powerful tool of amplifying already existing inequalities. So what can we do? Where do we start? And I think to start with, we really need to be aware and recognize that there is a problem. There is an overwhelming evidence that gender biases are baked into AI tools, and there is no lack of such examples in AI systems. We have voice and speech recognition systems that perform worse for women than men. We have face recognition systems that provide more errors with female faces, especially faces of black women and women of color. We have recruitment tools reinforcing gender bias from the historical data that they've been trained on. Search engines that reflect societal stereotypes present in the data. And last but not least, in health related and in criminal justice systems. So how does this happen? And well, we know that AI tools reflect the biases of those who build it. And we also know that those are predominantly white men. So when AI systems are created, people who develop it and you know, incorporate often very in a, in a very unconscious way their own biases in the different stages of the creation process. So data gathering, data cleansing, model implementation, model evaluation and deployment. Hence, there is a really big chance of not being able to identify certain issues and therefore amplify the biases already existing in the society if this work is done in a homogeneous group. So what can we do about it? And I really believe that we need to create diverse and inclusive environments in which AI systems are developed and deployed. And of course, the starting point of addressing the current gender gap is naturally to involve more women in the design and deployment of AI tools. And it is really important to remember, however, that women are not a homogeneous group and neither are men. And we need to understand how the intersections of ethnicity, of gender and other identities and attributes shape people's experiences with AI. And we have to ensure that women are seen and included as a diverse group. It is also essential to acknowledge that by referring to gender as a binary concept, we often risk erasing all other forms of gender identity. So we need to be aware of that. Um, and today I'm really happy that I could share some examples of how in the organizations that I'm part of, so women in AI at H&M group, um, we are moving the needle in the right direction, I believe. So in Women in AI, a global community, uh, we are about 5,000 members in 115 countries. And our mission has been to increase women's participation and representation in AI. Over the past four years, we have launched a variety of educational mentorship programs to bring more girls and women into the field. We have launched startup acceleration programs to challenge the alarmingly low percentage of women getting investment in AI startup ecosystem. Together with AI Sweden, we have launched AI crash course, and together with Vinova Innovation Agency in Sweden, we are exploring how AI can actually contribute to gender equality rather than counteract it. In our AI department at H&M Group, we have actually identified the gap of having too few women in technical roles, and we're actively working to change that. 
we have so far increased that number by um, performing training in unconscious bias, rewriting the job ads, diversifying the platforms where we reach our candidates. And we also focus heavily on diversity, inclusion, and fairness as part of our responsible AI assessment. We make sure that product teams, all product teams working with AI and machine learning, among other aspects, assess their team diversity, as well as all possible effects that uh, our AI tools and products can have on vulnerable and underrepresented groups. So there is no lack of opportunities to improve the current situation, and it is all up to us to find the ways in which we can contribute. Bringing, bringing more women through education and more inclusive recruitment practices, of course, uh, is just one way of doing that. But ultimately, this is a much broader problem and that needs to be addressed on so many levels. So first, we need more women in diver and diversity in general in decision-making roles, in public policy, in academia, in corporate leadership, and on governmental levels, working with different aspects of AI, challenging existing power symmetries. Second, diversity and inclusion needs to be recognized as part of the core business strategy and not an add-on in any organization, but most importantly, in any organization that explores AI and machine learning as part of the business strategy. And last but not least, and I think here I would echo Virginia and others, we need to design and deploy AI systems in a responsible, ethical, and transparent and accountable way. Having diverse and inclusive teams developing and deploying AI applications is, of course, a crucial enabler for that. So gender inequality is a societal problem, and all of us, being part of global ecosystem, uh, have a big responsibility. So there's a lot to be done, and we need to do it now. And I would actually like to use this opportunity to ask all of you to, re to reflect um, uh, through this small exercise. So take a moment to reflect on your team, your organization, any context that you find yourself in at the moment being part of AI ecosystem. Who is represented? And most importantly, who is not? What perspectives are you missing? Is the target group of your AI application reflected in your team composition? And once you've done that, really use those insights and start thinking about the ways how you can include those perspectives in your product development involve people from different disciplines that can help you to identify possible consequences and effects of your products on different groups. Lack of gender balance and diversity affects how AI companies work, what products get built, who they're designed to serve, and who benefits from them. So to sort of sum up, <laughs> fixing the gender balance in AI is not going to be a quick fix, and we cannot treat it as such but we all have a role to play. We often say that technology is an enabler, and it is, but I think it is time to ask ourselves, an enabler for what? Are we enabling a better society, a more sustainable and equitable future for all, or just certain groups of people? Thank you so much. Thank you, Elena. Very interesting. and. Um... As you said, diversity is not only a numbers game for fairness, it's also a question, to, a question of for what? Why are we adding uh, more perspectives, more competences um, and more angles? It's because it's the way to solve the challenges of our time. It's what we need. So time to discuss this and make sense of all the perspectives we've heard so far in this track. It's time for a panel. And firstly, I'd like to welcome Evelina Antilia. Antila. Antila, almost right. <laughs> General Counsel, Head of AI and Ethics at Peltorion. Please give us your take uh, on this topic and reflections of today's uh, speeches. Thank you. Yeah, so a few years ago, we saw technology as, or AI technology, as something for the future that was cool. But we soon shift, and now companies are actually looking and exploring how to make use of AI in their organizations. And as part of that, they are thinking about ethics issues. And that is so good. <laughs> it, it's really, really good. I wish I could do a high five. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, but, and, and it's important that we take this seriously. Uh, although today there are quite a few players that are actively and truly using AI, like the big American tech companies, uh, in the long term, this will have a huge impact on society. Uh, and we can today choose 
to build systems that are fair, secure, and that will take all of this into account, that we need to actively put resources into it now. And another thing I'd like to add is that it's so much more than the algorithms. It's actually about our society today not being equal. For example, I mean, not everyone has tools to realize that we live in filter bubbles. So I think it comes, comes back to education. So much important stuff and a lot of to, to unpick. And I'd like to start with, with you, Henry, to, to unpick this. And how do we move this conversation and all the big words that have been said today into some sort of constructive action? You've been muted. Do you hear me? Yes. Okay. So to be brief, um, I did ex I did mention some approach. Uh, sometimes we will need regulation because we need to be able to to audit the AI to be sure that there is a, no bias, uh, voluntary or involuntary. Uh, to have a serious conversation with the companies about accountability, about uh, what they, they are doing, and that may be important. The second point is that we need a global, international, multi-stakeholder conversation, like the JPI, but we can have other fora, and that's very important to, to exchange between um, stakeholders. And the third point I did mention also is about commons, because don't forget this, all the digital revolution is because some people thought that computers were so important that we had to share this with the civil society, and it was not just for the army. And here we, we, can have, we could have the same with AI. We could have few superpowers with super AIs and uh, nothing for the citizen. And that's very important to be sure that me, as a citizen, I will be able to use the power of AI in my daily life and, and to create and to, to, to launch uh, ideas or innovations. And Evelina touched upon the same thing, which is the implication of the power of AI sits with a few. Um, and I think framing it as the common uh, gives us a, a good understanding of it. But could you give us some examples of what could be the common here? Do you again? Yes, I'm fascinated. First, um, Mikhail spoke about data. So first, we have to be very precise about which data we can share. And uh, of course, sometimes it's complicated because uh, uh, health data are personal data. But for example, we could uh, organize ourselves to have a uh, lot of health data for research and to be sure that they are used for the common good. And uh, of course, open data, free flow of data and a user data set for common general interest are very important. And then I think that we have to create open source AI and not just the AI of big companies and to be sure that everyone can build or improve AI. We have some open source AIs, but they are not the biggest one. And Michael, you mentioned governance, which is an integral part in, in success here. And what I was thinking is, what are the institutions that we need, the existing or maybe future institutions that we need to establish to, to make this change possible? Well, we have a very good way to uh, govern the flow of money today. And um, I think when we look at power, we also look at it as we even have expressions, follow the money, and you'll see where, where, <laughs> who is sort of behind the power. Uh, I don't think it's significantly different with AI. It's just that we're looking at data. And to govern that data is essential. And a lot of the regulatory uh, movements that come out of the EU, they are focused on the data itself, uh, with the exception of Article 13 in the Privacy Act uh, that actually focuses a little bit on the use of data. There isn't so much focus on that yet. I think that has to come. And that leads us then into AI, what type of AI family. I mean, there are only four AI families. Um, and so which of these four can you apply for what purpose? Uh, and what can you do with what type of data? I think those type of discussions has to be governed by, by some one other than the companies that provide the technology. 
the AI functionality itself is, you know, the AI libraries are relatively open source for everyone. Everyone can download the microservices and use them. Uh, so that's not so much the issue at hand. The issue at hand is who has access to what data and, and what, who, who, who owns that data and what can they do with the data. And that needs to be governed uh, by a uh, institution of the kind that the web proposed, I suppose, or something similar. Virginia, could you give us the uh, approach and perspective of academia here? You spoke about transparency, accountability, responsibility, and we're talking about institutions to govern this. What do you see from a, a research angle? Is this theoretical or happening? Uh, it is happening, and I think Henri already mentioned one of the main, uh, the biggest efforts at this moment, the Global Partnership on AI, which France, together with Canada, uh, has started uh, involving several countries. I'm fortunate to have been invited by France to participate, so I'm one of the experts involved in this initiative. I'm Con trying to get uh, to see how we can involve Sweden in general in this initiative, but uh, it's still ongoing. But from a research perspective, I think that the very first thing which we have to understand, and we are talking about innovation today, is that the AI technology that we are using today is not the AI technology of tomorrow. The AI technology of today is extremely and maybe maliciously uh, based on data. And I think it was my, Michael who referred to data as the new oil. Yes, it's a good, uh, a good analogy, but we should not forget the mess, mess that we created for the climate with the last oil that we used. So we have to take care of the potential mess that we are going to do by using data the way that we are using today. Uh, she, data today we are using mostly in a correlate uh, by correlation. We are making inf inferences and identifying patterns in data by correlation. Correlation brings with it all the issues of bias, of unconscious uh, uh, combinations of an, an uh, unforeseen uh, uh, um, uh, patterns in this day, which are the basis of a lot of the problems that we see. So if we talk about innovation, and it's something which academia is doing, we really need to move into new novel approaches to using, uh, to decision making, computational decision making, because at the end of the day, that's what AI is doing. And we are doing it now with, the, like I say, uh, extremely dependency on data, but there are other ways to do it. There are already, uh, and already for several years, uh, methods based on correlation, uh, on, sorry, on causality instead of correlation. We have all kinds of issues in which we can use synthetic data instead of the, the real data in order to try to uh, uh, mitigate and support the issues of uh, bias, but also the issues of uh, extremely uh, computational demands that this type of approaches have. So I think that the, the main message I would like to bring here and the message for innovation is don't be too focused on the cap capacities and the, um, the restrictions of the algorithms of today. We really need to move into a new generation of algorithms, which really can bring a step forward, you know, that it, uh, it brings a step forward in the innovation, but also uh, which includes by design, the issues of uh, responsibility and ethics and uh, the solving in a completely different way, uh, these type of issues. Elena, if I address you, Virginia reminded us of the important point, which is technology uh, is constantly moving and pretending that we're discussing this from a static point of view doesn't do us any services. When you think about technology as something constantly moving, how does that apply to diversity and the challenges that you work with? Well, I think that's uh, such a great question. I mean, the faster we move, the bigger chance it is that we are leaving uh, groups of people behind. So I think in general, when we talk about diversity and inclusion, it is really a good time to move away from looking at it as an add-on, uh, looking at it as some sort of soft values that are good to have for organization. Because I think now, well, yesterday, but now is really the time to make sure that this lens, any organization that works with AI has. Uh, because as you say, you know, the faster we move forward, the harder it will be to reverse that. Um,
Um, hard to sum up a big topic and different angles. Evelina, you have uh, a few more seconds before we have to end the panel. What's your take? Could you do a, a human brain prediction into the future on AI and democracy? Oh, yeah, <laughs> tough one. Um, but I think um, courage should be the lead word because I think it's important that we actually start to use AI, to test it, iterate, and uh, have the possibility to evaluate it because we tend to focus quite much about technical and ethical issues uh, instead of seeing the effects, and then we can actually apply legislation to that. There we go. Courage is the lead word of a full-on day of together, collaboration, technology, innovation, and a genuine sense of solving the big problems of our time. Thank you, panel, for sharing your experiences and insights. This has been a, a fantastic track, and thank you, Evelina, for joining us here thank today. You. Thank you. So, the day comes slowly to an end. I feel filled to the brim with uh, insights, experiences, projects. Peter, yes. you've been behind the scenes looking at all the chat rooms yeah. and uh, all the uh, back buzz. What have you learned? There's been so many interesting questions. There have been so many interesting talks. Uh, talks. And what, what I'm really happy about is that we're talking about so much about the the human side of AI. We're talking about uh, collaboration. We're talking about that leadership is the new, or partnership is the new leadership. So I'm really looking forward to seeing all of these collaborations that we're talking about really happen. Because that's what we need to really make out of this. Collaboration ships needs to happen. And on that note, I want to, to pass this on to uh, Regina Summer, who is one, uh, who's been one of the hosts behind this entire program from Vinova, but she's also managing international collaborations and international cooperations with countries, both Brazil and Canada from the Swedish point of view. And Regina, I know you have something to tell us about funding opportunities later this week. Yes, and thank you so much, Peter. Thank you very much, Aurora. It's been an amazing day. I'm so proud of this day. Uh, I mean, I've seen, we have had fantastic panelists, fantastic speakers, and the interaction on, in the chat, it just makes me overwhelmed. I'm so, so happy for this day. Uh, you are an amazing moderator, uh, Aurora, too. So very, very happy for everything that we've seen so far. Uh, and of course, uh, I'm, I'm so proud of the capacity and the competence that we have in Sweden. We have an amazing AI landscape, and, and that's why we wanted to have this day, to show the world what we have, but also, of course, to benchmark with our international friends that we're also very, very proud of. So, uh, I mean, the purpose of the Swedish Innovation Days is about uh, showing the AI landscape uh, creating, you know, um, forums for knowledge exchange, and then matchmaking and, and, and network. And, and, and the matchmaking we have here on day three, uh, it's amazing. Uh, it's 435 uh, meetings arranged by Ignite. Uh, so, I mean, I look, I just, it's going to be two more great days. So I'm very, very happy for this. Uh, the goal, of course, is, I mean, to give you uh, as much as possible during these days, but I look a little bit more ahead, and I think we all do that. We want this to become collaborations. We want this to become international collaborations. Uh, so, so to, you know, learn of the effects of these days, that's going to take us uh, some months before we know the effects of these days. And, but, so... What we want to do during our session uh, is me and some colleagues will uh, present to you different funding and the future network opportunities to continue the dialogue and also to continue international collaborations. Even if it is, you know, uh, business, creating new businesses, um, you know, to trying to attract talent or, or creating innovation mm -hmm. projects, any of those things. Um, are interesting, of course, and I hope it, it interests you. So uh, on Thursday, the 19th of November, we will have four sessions presenting uh, funding opportunities from Vinova to the Swedish actors that they can use in their collaborations with certain countries around the world. 
So that's the session on Thursday, and I hope as many uh, as possible can, can join us. I think it will definitely be rewarding and, 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 um, and giving for the future collaboration. So I think that's that's all for me for now. I'm not going to take more of your time, uh, but to join us on Thursday. And, and again, thank you so much for this amazing day. So, so happy. Thank you so much, Regina. Um, so this is turning to the end of the program for the first day or the talks for the first day. Uh, but before we end, we have a half an hour of uh, the release of the AI landscape for the European startup mapping. But first, Aurora, I really want to ask you, what's your takeaways from, from this day? Well, my key takeaway is that many of the innovations that we need exist. Many of the ideas exist, and, and several of the speakers have echoed that, which means that the importance of a conference like this and meeting like this is to further shift the, the mindset of people, helping policymakers, helping all parts of society in that ecosystem to make this happen. Because, as we said, these aren't innovations that are nice to have. They're actually important to have, and uh, there are existential uh, survival depends on it. And I think one of my key takeaways was from the H&M discussion, where they really talk about like AI is to enable and enhance our human abilities so that we can do more with what we do best. And I will definitely bring that into the future work I do within the area. Can I give you a challenge? Yes. The challenge is that we've had so many speakers from so many diverse different perspectives, and we've talked about collaboration. And I'm going to hold you to the fact that these people need to continue to meet and talk so this network is real and alive, and that we, in a year's time, can uh, demonstrate tangible outcomes. We definitely want that. So if you're interested in the AI ecosystem Sweden, please connect with us. AI Sweden is a non-profit organization that are here to support the acceleration of the entire Swedish AI ecosystem. So if you're interested and if you want to collaborate on different topics, please engage with us. Uh, let us know what you would like to do. If it's startups, reach out to me uh, and you can learn more about us at ai.se and be sure to connect because we have a lot of opportunities and a lot of engagement already happening. Uh, and with those words, I would like to welcome Sandor to the, the stage as well. Thank you very much. Thank you for the whole day. It was, it was wonderful. Yeah. Welcome. Thank you. So Sandor, this day isn't really at its end yet. Uh, no, we have certainly not. We have a bonus moments. track. Yeah, exactly. We have a bonus track, and it's uh, it's really nice, uh, nicely following uh, your request or your challenge. What we are going to do is we show that how you can have ecosystems of ecosystems, how we can create a, a common, uh, and how we will release the first time how we can create a common European AI startup landscape. Fake high five. Yes, <laughs> fake high five. So hopefully you will see that how we, how we get get there, who is behind it, and then and then this will be um, a good chance um, also to. Move forward and then to make it live, at least from an AI startup ecosystem perspective. Yeah, but we'll let you get through it. Thank so you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. So welcome everyone, uh, welcome you all who stayed online after this long day and then also we welcome you all of you who are joining specifically for this event. We are going to launch now the first European AI startup landscape. Uh, my name is Sandra Albrecht, I I'm, I'm live here in Sweden, I'm working very closely with AI Sweden and Ignite Sweden um, on uh, making this, uh, this common landscape. Uh, the story of the European startup landscape started last year at the Hannover Messe where I had the honor uh, to be on the same panel together with uh, Andreas Hartl and Andreas Liebel. And uh, basically after discussing the bilateral Swedish-German uh, AI partnership agreement, we really decided that we have to do something uh, for the startups and something for the whole Europe. But that's history now. And of course, 18 months dedicated work for a lot of other people. And I'm so excited to have so many distinguished guests and participants from uh, France, from Germany, and uh, from Sweden. So without further delay, let's start uh, the program. And first, we are going to have a fireside chat with representatives from the different governments, from uh, Sweden, Germany, and France. 
Let me introduce Andreas Hartel, head of the division strategy, artificial intelligence, data, econ data economy and blockchain, Federal Ministry of Economic Affairs and Energy of Germany. Mary Wall, startup expert, Minister of Enterprise and Innovation of Sweden. And uh, Christel Fiorina, senior project leader, artificial intelligence, video game and e-sport, Ministry of Economy and Finance of France. So, as we understand, as we live in it, the current revolution, the current industrial revolution is driven by ICT, and among lots of other technology areas, is, uh, is driven by artificial intelligence. So my question to you then, how does the government foster the adoption of AI, and how the government supports the AI startups in your country? Andreas, uh, if you could have uh, your view, and then uh, come uh, the, German, uh, the German view. Thank you and uh, good Allah uh, into the audience. Uh, thank you for having me. Now, um, the basis for the German um, support of the AI adoption is the national AI strategy that was adopted almost two years ago. And um, well, we decided to allocate another 3 billion euros uh, investment. And uh, this year we also decided to uh, spent another 2 billion euros uh, coming from the economic stimulus and future package. So 5 billion euros uh, dedicated only to AI until 2025. In a nutshell, the narrative of the German strategy is we know how to make AI, but we are not doing it. So therefore, the transfer is really key to us. And just to highlight a couple of initiatives we started. One, of course, is Gaia X. Um, a secure and trustworthy data infrastructure. And I'm sure, or I hope at least, that most of you already know that. And Gaia-X is not only about storage, it's, it's also about services that can be um, uh, provided in a, in a whole data ecosystem for the whole economy. What we also do is we support breakthrough innovations. We set up and established um, uh, an agency only for breakthrough innovations, uh, the Agentur für Sprung Innovation, which means like uh, yeah, breakthrough innovations. And we're also supporting sandboxes, not only for technologies or business models, but also to try and test regulatory approaches. And I think that's also very important for AI. Now, with a special view on SME, uh, one of the flagship uh, initiatives we started is that we establish a system of AI coaches, uh, more than 50 at the moment in uh, the 26 regional SME centers of excellence spread throughout the nation. And they're teaching, training, coaching uh, SME companies. And we also conduct special innovation competitions. We currently have a third call on the crisis resilience of the whole economy with a special view, of course, to the corona pandemic. And to, um, um, to wrap up with startups, we doubled our funding for EXIST, um, which is a program uh, supporting people from universities to start their own business. We extended our German Accelerator program with um, uh, bringing startups to the US and to very interesting markets in Asia. We have our DE Hub initiative, bringing together corporates, academia, and startups in several hubs in Germany. And we are working on a more innovative procurement system, which is a very hard task. Thank you, Andreas. Uh, thank you for your thorough answer. So now I move over to Christel. So how do you see what's happening in France? How do you foster uh, AI adoption and how you support uh, the AI startups? Good evening, every, everybody from Paris. Um, we have in France our nas national strategy since uh, March 2018. And uh, since uh, 18, uh, 2018, we had a huge public investment in favor of AA and especially in favor of, on, of uh, startups. Um, in that program, we lead uh, call for projects, for instance, in uh, sharing data. We help uh, um, groupments of enterprises to, to share data in order to uh, develop uh, AA technologies. And we also uh, help uh, the startups to make challenges with uh, big companies or big public organization, organizations uh, so that they can have use cases in AA to develop um, uh, new technologies uh, in, that, uh, in the sector of health, uh, environment, mobility, for, for example, and uh, the future of industry. Uh, on the second hand, we have also a program which name is French Tech, 
and the French tech program is led by the French government in order to help startups to invest in France, to grow in France, and also to uh, develop technologies with uh, uh, an accurate uh, leg legislation and also uh, with strong links with the, the ecosystem of research. Because in France, we also invest on the, um, the, the research center. We have uh, an ecosystem of AA institutes, which is the, the ecosystem of excellence for research in France. And uh, the, the AA institutes are leading programs uh, in transfer from research to industry. Thank you. And uh, on French tech also, just to finish, we have also an opportunity to uh, promote abroad the French technology on that. But I would like to conclude on that point that um, for us in France, the, the good level to uh, lead the battle in AA between uh, USA and China is the Euro European level. That's why we strongly want to cooperate with the, the European Commission and the member states, and we, we strongly support the coordinated plan in AA. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Christa. So back from Paris back to Stockholm, Mary, please uh, share uh, the view from, uh, from the Swedish government. Unmute. So I think that our most important initiatives is probably AI Sweden. Uh, that is this collaboration platform between uh, different parts of Sweden. And that platform also supports both collaboration with startups, collaboration within larger companies, test beds, etc., and research. Uh, apart from that, I, I would say that much of the things that we do with AI is part of all the generic uh, initiatives that we have, both when it comes to research, uh, when it comes to policy, we have COMI that is working with policy issues that have a lot of things to do with, with um, AI, and we have collaboration programs with the industry, within digitalization, and within, within education that also involves a lot of discussions, a lot of initiatives that is based where we try to implement AI to solve those and come solve those challenges. But apart from that, I would say that currently what we Sweden have, we have a strong focus on data as well, because we need to also to secure that we have the data sets and we have open data that can really be used as a basis for smart AI solutions. OECD submitted a report uh, to the Swedish government yeah. on the digitalization policy. Uh, and in this report, one of the strong recommendations was really to work hard on, on artificial, uh, artificial intelligence. And as a consequence of this, SCB, the Statistical Central Bureau, uh, got a, a, a task to map how companies and how the public sector and how the academia in Sweden is really handling and using the large amount of data and how they are working with artificial intelligence to uh, use this data for smart uh, decisions, etc. And this assignment will actually be uh, reported at the end of this month. So I really look forward to read what they have uh, come up with, uh, read what they have seen. Uh, the, we also have it tends to develop a strategy fo for the focus of uh, strategic data during 2021. And further, further, the National Innovation Council, that is the Innovation Council headed by the state, by our state minister, Stefan Levien, uh, have decided and ha have initiated an evaluation assignment promoting data as a strategic resource for artificial intelligence and other digital innovation. And uh, our innovation agency, Vinova, is also financing a lot of data labs with different themes as a space data, real estate data, medical data, and railway data. And there's a lot of different data. And the main goal of those data labs is really to be the foundation for smart innovation with AI. Thank you. So it, it's a combined strategy, I would say. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Andreas, uh, Christian, and Marie. We have to move on uh, due to the time uh, constraint. Thank you very much that uh, you attended. And then please um, stay with us uh, for the rest. Because now we are moving on. 
I would like to really that you meet also some of the people and the organizations who are behind uh, this common uh, European uh, AI startup landscape. So let me introduce uh, Stina Lanz, a program manager from Ignite Sweden. She is with us in the studio. Also Agneta Jakobsson, head of strategy partnership AI Sweden in the studio. And online we have Dr. Andreas Liebel, managing director applied AI by Unternehmertum Germany and uh, uh, Gail Pinson, uh, Director General of uh, France AI. So I have a question first. So very, very basic question. Why is it important to have a joint AI startup landscape in Europe, Stina? Well, there is, of course, a number of answers to that question. But I think uh, from a Swedish perspective uh, and from a European perspective, in Sweden, we're only 10 million people. OK, so in order to actually compete on the AI stage, startup-wise, we need to be together on a European level. That's basically the most important answer, great, I think. Great, yeah. great, thank you. Andreas, what is, uh, what is your view on this uh, from uh, Germany? Andreas Liebe. Um, I think from our perspective, it's um, we, we uh, as Applied AI, we invited a couple of startups um, from, from different countries, also from Sweden. And then we thought, why, why don't we have this kind of European view on startups? Why is it always kind of the, the national ones as we're all Europeans? And therefore, I think it's also very important to have the spirit as kind of feeling also Europeans building this joint ecosystem. And I think that is the, the one of the biggest values that it's kind of beyond the single individual context and exchanges, but it's like really seeing what we are doing in Europe. Thank you, Andreas. Uh, Gael, from, uh, from uh, the French perspective and uh, from how be, uh, France AI, how do you see why is it important to have this common landscape? Gail? Well, uh, the access to AI capacities is really decisive for companies to achieve digitalization and stay competitive. So, in fact, the landscape is creating a clear view of these AI capacities and giving access to them. And it has to be a European landscape because no European country can alone produce those capacities, considering the speed of technological development and the fierce international competition. So that's why we fully support this initiative. Thank you very much. And Agneta, last but not least, for sure, AI Sweden's view and your view. It opens up so many possibilities for collaboration, cross borders. And even though AI startups or startups may be very small, they are, play a very significant role in creating innovation and growth. So this initiative will help build a stronger and competitive Europe. Thank you very much. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the moment has arrived. So we are going to launch the, the first European AI startup landscape. One, two, three. Andreas, Andreas Liebe, please introduce the first European AI startup landscape and talk a little bit about, about the possible next steps. Yes, so what you can see here, it's aistartupseurope.eu. Um, you see the, the landscape, you have the main view of the European landscape, and then you can see actually all the different startups from all the different categories there in a kind of nice landscape view, and then all the, the startups additionally um, in a list view. And um, then at the very bottom, um, you can also find um, what the contributing um, organizations are lots of startups. It's about 550 startups. And in the end, as said, you can find us as, as the contributors, um, like a get in touch form, um, as well as a couple of descriptions of, of what we do. But the nice thing now is that you can um, switch to a national landscape, the German one, the French one, the Swedish one, and you can filter the landscape. It's a pretty uh, dynamic view. Uh, then if I go back up here, so you can filter, for example, by industry. So if you look for a different industry or a specific industry, you can just click on that and you see the startups that fit to the industry. Um, you have um, the direct link to the startup um, and you, um, you have a direct um, uh, connection where you can then actually simply well, approach the different startups in, in, in each um, category. Um, you can find and search for, for specific companies. You can also filter for a um, specific uh, startup landscape. Well, this is now in education. Um, I need to go back up um, to um, 
let's um, start the, the, the European landscape here. You can um, click on um, um, from all industries, uh, then um, let's see the, the French startups. And then you have here all the French startups from all the different categories as well. So that's a nice, um, easy to use overview. If you're a startup and you want to be part of that, each of the national um, landscapes has a direct connect to the organizations um, that manage the landscapes. If you are a country, within Europe and want to be part as a country on that landscape, in the European landscape, there is a link where you can actually also ask um, to be part of this landscape um, as a whole new country in there. Because we, what we want is ultimately a European landscape. It shouldn't be just the one for the three countries, but it should be really a European one. So we're happy to extend it to many more countries. What is important that the uh, startups on this list are quality check. They are the good ones. Um, not all the startups that say that they're using AI, but really the ones we see and consider as the best European startups in AI. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Andreas. And then it's very important, as Andreas said, that it is official that uh, we will have uh, next steps and we would like to onboard more and more startups, of course, but not just more and more startups, but more and more countries. So to be continued for sure. Uh, and then we will drive that further. Thank you very much. So before we leave uh, the organizers, I have a, a very specific questions a little bit towards you. So why does your organization support this? And then what is it, how does it relate to your strategy really? So, so what is in it for, uh, for the different organizations who are part of this? Gail, um, what is it in for uh, Hub France AI? Well, Hub France AI has as a mission to support the best use of AI among its members and also to contribute to a European AI because we believe AI is so important that Europe really has to develop its own solutions and infrastructures not rely on non-European solutions, even if we have good partnerships. We need to have our own capacities. And this European landscape is one of the milestones to develop our own European capacities. Thank you very much. fully aligned with the mission of UB. This is very good to hear. Stina, uh, Ignite Sweden. Yes, I can, of course, totally agree with Gail. And I think uh, furthermore important from Ignite Sweden's perspective, we're an organization helping startups actually find customers. That's what we do on a daily basis, also non-profit and national. And uh, to have this being a part of the map for our Swedish startups also opens up the market of European large potential customers. So that's... Basically, that's why we think this is super important. But this is very more good. business to the startups, Absolutely, basically, which in is Europe. Very important. Yes. Agneta, AI Sweden's perspective. Yes. If we go back to our goal, our, our primary goal, it is to help accelerate AI, the use of AI in Sweden. And the startups play a most significant role in this, in this and, and we are committed to making them successful. Uh, so we believe strongly that giving startup this visibility will really help promote collaboration and, and their possibility to, to be successful. And uh, in addition, the joint, this joint map uh, are really making sure that we also, our corporates and our public sector that we work with, and that are also important partners in order to make the whole ecosystem use and apply AI. Uh, they, they can find and learn and, and need to work with startups and they can find now also European, other European startups. So that's very important to us. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you. And then Andreas, of course, I mean, you have done uh, the first one, I guess, in Germany. At least uh, we got inspired by you and then adapted. So, yeah, so, so from an applied AI perspective. Please. So Applied AI is part of Unternehmertum. Unternehmertum is the largest innovation center in, in Germany. Uh, it's a nonprofit and it's really, Applied AI also is really about the acceleration of the adoption of AI. Um, that's why we built Applied AI. And obviously most of this adoption topics come from startups. They are the ones that help the organizations, the industries. And that's why we started with the landscape in 2018. Um, so it's the third year for us to have an AI landscape and it, 
actually helped startups. So we've got some some good feedback from the teams that are on the on the list. So that's why we then said, well, we need to have this on a European level, and very happy that also um, from a German perspective, the German accelerator and German entrepreneurship joined, and now we have this on a European level. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks a lot. It's a great work. Uh, you should be really proud of yourself and the organizations and then to be continued. But most importantly, the next session is about the startups themselves. So we have three startups with us, uh, one from Germany, one from uh, France and, uh, and one from Sweden who are on the, uh, on the map, obviously. So congratulations to you. So. Uh, <clears throat> They are uh, Greater Dan from Sweden, and then we have Liselotte Johansson, uh, the CEO, with us. Greater Dan is basically um, uh, a company who, is, who has a solution for private per individual car in real time, helping insurance carriers and automotive OEMs to take better decisions, so insure tech company. We have David Sun Macaire from 22 from France. They are using, they're specialized in computer vision, including AI and virtual and augmented reality. They, de they develop tools of tomorrow to augment humans. Very, very interesting. And we have uh, Josef uh, Suss, for, uh, founder of uh, Blinkin from Germany. And then they provide a frictionless visual remote support to help anyone, anywhere, with anything using their computer vision, AI, and augmented, re uh, uh, real, uh, augmented reality technologies. So I have a question, uh, the first question to you then startups, representative of startups is that, what are the benefits for you to be on the AI startup landscape? Lizalot, what would you say? Yeah, so hi everybody. Um, I would say um, as we are today selling a unique AI risk to auto insurance carrier and car manufacturers, European is like an ideal market to start with, as many of the world leading insurance carrier and car manufacturers are based here. And they like to be on the front edge and that is a good base for us to start to work with them. And I mean, Europe is a good base you know, to accelerate up and to Asia and US as, as we have a good market to start with here. Thank you very much. David from 22, what, do, what would you say? What is, uh, what is the benefit for you to be on the map? Yes, hi, everyone. Um, I would say that uh, the landscape is very huge and uh, I wanted to thank everyone that uh, has been involved in, in this project because uh, the result is pretty amazing. And it's, um, it's an honor to be a member of this community. Um, for us, it means that today we have recognized company with strong values um, in artificial intelligence. And it's important that we share these uh, values to have a strong community because we, uh, we need to face a global market that uh, is increasingly competitive. Uh, we also think that um, it, it could be a good way to build long-term uh, relationship with future partners, for example, if we want to apply uh, together on European projects. Thank you, David. Uh, Josef from Blinken in Germany, what would you say, uh, what is the benefit or value for you? To be on see what the benefit will be at the end right <laughs> um, but i want to maybe double down what david said um, it's about uh, innovation and innovation mostly can't be done alone so uh, in creating happy accidents maybe right so uh, i know now that david also is into computer vision wants to move some things wants to do some innovative things so why not writing him right now an email and partner up team up and share what we can learn from each other right? this is fascinating this is very good to hear very good to hear. So now the other side of the coin. So of course, I mean, you are on the map, but what are, what are your expectations on the landscape? I mean, this is very important that it's, uh, um, it's, it's also, as you said, uh, a benefit is for you. So David, what would you see? What would be your expectations on the landscape? So um, uh, I would say what we escape, uh, it's um, to, uh, to be able uh, to, um, um, to exchange directly with, uh, with startups and share information on research and development aspects, uh, and also to, to be able to, uh, to generate um, opportunities together. Um, this uh, landscape is also a good opportunity to build up strong ethical ecosystem between um, European companies and startups, uh, because we strongly believe that ethics and AI uh, can be complementary. Uh, we can all create ethical uh, solutions that fit with appropriate legislation, and thanks to that, uh, we will ensure that artificial intelligence uh, solutions will be easily adapted by company and, uh, and citizens. Thank you. Josef, now you can yeah, probably finish the sentence about your benefits in the future. 
uh, benefits what we expect, right? Yes. Um, so um, expectations are probably, to be honest, right now, not there. So first, it's about what could, can we contribute to that kind of ecosystem, and then maybe we can have some expectations. Um, for us, it's about basically meeting other startups, corporates, researchers, um, yeah, and getting together with them. Because I think the only chance what we have as a European ecosystem is to team up. We are a diverse um, continent and probably uh, diversity is one of the few strengths we have in Europe. So I think the only chance is that we use that, right? Thank you. Thank you. And uh, of course, uh, Lisa Lott, uh, from your perspective, um, what, are, what, are your, what are your expectations? <laughs> yeah, my expectations is really high. I mean, I think the market will explode of the use of AI as, as in the area we are working. Um, the use of AI is like a win-win. I mean, they have the customer here, they have the insurance carrier and uh, car manufacturers, and, and they will gain a lot. They will get lower claims costs. And I mean, they have huge amount of consumers here in Europe and uh, the end user, they get lower insurance premiums. And I mean, if you also look to the total, what an AI can, I mean, the, how the society can benefit from it, it's, like when we use the AI, we drive safer, we get less accidents on the roads, we get less CO2 emissions while we drive, drive safe. So I think the AI can give so much value for both our customers, the end users and the society. And I mean, the Europe is a really good base to start with. And I mean, from Sweden, we have a huge uh, focus on the technology and scale. So yeah, I think it's a really nice market to work from. Thank you very much, Lisa Lott. So, D-Roll, uh, this week, the event is, is basically finished, nearly very close to be finished. Thank you very much for all your participations, and then uh, I really hope that uh, this uh, common uh, uh, European AI startup landscape will be something we'll be live, will help you, we have all the ecosystem uh, partners um, um, to get united and, and to show the strengths and opportunities what we have in Europe uh, when it comes to AI. Before we wrap up 100%, we really would like to give some appreciation to some others because it's not just us uh, who are here in the studio or who are in the other organizations, but there's others who worked a lot um, in the last um, 18 months or so. So Samantha Warren and Alexander Waldman from Applied AI for sure uh, from uh, uh, Germany. A big applause for them because they really helped us to get here. And, and then, of course, uh, from my team, we had uh, Michelle Anderson, Maite Bayon, and Jenna Parson, who's done really a fantastic job with uh, gathering all this data. Big applause. Big applause and for them as well. Absolutely. And then, of course, from AI Sweden. Yes, from AI Sweden, we have Katarina Fersson and uh, Peter Cotrelli that have both been doing a fantastic job to support this journey. Thank you very much for them as well, of course. And then, of course, I mean, you, because EIS, EIS Sweden has lots of startups who are supporting them, you had some support from some startups as well during this journey. Of course, we took great help of uh, Martin Rugfeldt and Malena Klaus from Sentian, who actually helped us together with Untenemetum to build the web page and uh, being very, very active in the selection process. And I'm also realizing that we need to say a big thank you also to Vinova. Absolutely. That has been a crucial part for actually allowing it, us to do this. Exactly, and supporting us as well. And then uh, from uh, the Research Institute of Sweden, uh, Osa Rudström and Marie Iversson, who was uh, crucial to this journey as well. So big applause for them. And then the evaluation committees all yeah, over. Last, last but not least, the evaluation committees has been absolutely fantastic, of course, to support this. How many did we review? In big Sweden, numbers. Yeah. We actually reviewed 330 startups mm. in the evaluation committee. Mm. And that consisted of 15 people. Mm. So that's quite fantastic. Quite fantastic and job. I think it was something about the numbers uh, <laughs> that uh, we actually heard, but it was kind of, you know, how many startups are there actually on the map now? It's, um, I think Andreas mentioned that it's more than 550 or something. It's more than 550 and that's fantastic. That's fantastic and, and that's, that's just only, a start. Exactly, it's only a start because it's only Sweden, France and Germany and we know for sure that there are more startups qualifying in all of our three countries. And then more countries will come. Absolutely. So by that I would like to wrap up uh, this launch event. And say 
welcome very much tomorrow again. Because exactly. we're starting off from this studio at, uh, we're going to have a lot of breakout sessions in the morning. Uh, so please keep a lookout on, in uh, the portal, hop in for that. It will be super interesting for all of you startups. It will be a B2B super masterclass on B2B sales. Uh, that is a no miss. Take that one. Uh, and then we have a session about ecosystem where we're actually going to talk about and discuss the differences between Germany and Sweden. And then we have a public workshop on how to work with AI if you're public sector. I think that's really interesting and lots of best practices in that. But two o'clock, what happens then? Then we start off the Ignite Sweden Day, where we're going to have a full day of startup pitching and a lot of best practice case with AI startups working together with both public sector and private organizations. So that will be a three hour, extremely intense and inspiring session. Absolutely. And then, of course, this is like a hands on training. You could say that. Say that. Thank you very much for today. Thank you very much for tonight. Thank you for all your joining us for the, um, uh, for the lounge. And uh, enjoy the new website. Start to dig in and then try to understand that who would you like to relate to. Use it, don't abuse it, and uh, to be continued. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, bye-bye.